Lightfall is right around the corner, which will be the ninth annual release in the Destiny franchise. I can't believe it's been nine years. But with that being said, I figured it was time to take a look back at the complete history of Destiny since it initially debuted back in 2014. And this video is a compilation of the complete history series I've been working on since August, so if you go on to enjoy this extensive history video, be sure to leave a like on it and share it around. But without further ado guys, let's begin. Before Bungie Studios went on to develop Destiny, they of course were known for creating the FPS franchise Halo for Microsoft. Halo 1, 2, and 3 broke sales records in the entertainment industry and catapulted Bungie Studios into the spotlight and were considered to be one of the best development teams in gaming. Shortly after the release of Halo 3, Bungie and Microsoft announced that Bungie would be splitting off from Microsoft and instead becoming an independent studio to work on other projects, but still agreed to develop two more games in the Halo franchise, Halo 3 ODST and Halo Reach. While developing ODST, the early stages of development for Destiny would begin. Concepts were being created, world building and story material were being written, and very early alpha builds were in the works. And by the looks of things, based on an easter egg found in ODST, they already had settled on a name for their next project, Destiny. During this time, Bungie Studios continued to grow in size, nearly doubling the number of employees, and would seek a partnership to support their new ambitious project. And after entering a 10-year publishing agreement with Activision, the hard work began on Destiny. It all began with the development of a new engine, the Tiger engine, which Bungie had been working on since 2008. Bungie would design the engine to allow for global illumination, real-time dynamic lighting, and natively render graphics at 1080p on both Xbox One and PlayStation 4. While visually and mechanically very impressive, many developers at Bungie have been critical of the Tiger engine, expressing how tedious and grueling it can be to create new content, and described it as being ill-suited for the online nature of the game. One employee was cited saying that its resource-intensive nature makes even small changes to the map require an overnight rendering and compiling process. Yet despite the challenges developers were facing with the engine, the team pushed forward working very hard on Destiny, and we would get our first tease about what Destiny was during 2010 in Bungie's Vidoc titled A Brave New World, where Bungie discussed the history of the company and what they've learned from their previous Halo titles. From the onset, it was made pretty apparent that Destiny was going to be very ambitious, doing things that hadn't been done before and really going all in on it. We'd get our first real look at Destiny in 2012 with some leaked concept art provided by IGN, and shortly after the release of these leaked images, Bungie made a statement discussing how they weren't quite ready to show the game off just yet, but went ahead and gave us a bit more of an official release of some concept art. This resulted in the release of probably the most recognizable concept art image for Destiny. Bungie would remain tight-lipped on news about Destiny until February of 2013, when we learned that the official name of the game would be, of course, Destiny, with Bungie releasing their first Destiny Vidoc, Pathways Out of Darkness, showing numerous concept images, short clips of gameplay, and interviews with the Bungie developers. Progress for the game appeared to be coming along nicely, and by mid-2013, most of the groundwork for the game had been finished. The story, lore, world building were basically completed, the game engine was finished and usable to the fullest extent, and many of the environment missions and levels were completely done right on track for a September 2013 release. But something happened that would result in a year-long delay. In February 2013, Bungie's lead writing team crafted a supercut of the game to show off to the management at Bungie on all the progress that had been made on Destiny. It consisted of the game's story mission structure and overall progression of the game. After showing this supercut to Bungie upper management, the writing team would receive feedback that was unexpected. The management team felt that the story was too dense and linear and wanted a more open-ended story experience. So the decision was made to completely reboot the story, the mission structure, and the progression of the game just mere months before the game was supposed to release. Because of this unexpected decision, Joseph Staten, Bungie's lead writer, would leave the company shortly after this, as well as a few members of his writing staff. Things were starting to fall apart for Destiny's development and after three years of hard work, Bungie was in big trouble during the 11th hour. Up next was the 2013 E3 gameplay demo being shown off, and it was a hit. The demo was simple and straight to the point on what to expect from the game, and while the final game didn't perfectly live up to players' expectations, the demo really did do a good job of showing off kind of what we would be experiencing in the full game on the regular. 
And it's pretty rare to see an E3 demo actually represent the final product pretty accurately, but I gotta say, looking back and watching this video now, Destiny really does look, play, and feel like the E3 demo. But after the E3 demo, of course, what came next was a delay. After losing their lead riders and need to redesign so much of the game's story and mission structure, it was nearly impossible to launch the game in just a few months. March 2014 would be the new target window for release. Bungie management essentially created a super team with some of Bungie's best developers to work on recreating the story, splicing and reworking old missions and cinematics into something more cohesive to try and make that March 2014 launch. Areas like the Dreadnought and the European Dead Zone were cut from the game. Characters like Rasputin, Osiris, and the Crow were either cut from the game or changed drastically to fit this new cobbled together storyline. And with March 2014 coming ever closer, Bungie management knew they wouldn't be able to deliver, so they negotiated a bit more with Activision to secure a release date of September 2014. But that was it. No more delays, no more extra time, the game had to ship that year. The goal now was to polish up the gameplay, create the director, and add deeper customization to the character, classes, and weapon types. The hype around Destiny continued to build with thousands of fans speculating and theorizing about what was in store for us in the full release. The alpha was playable on PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 3 shortly after E3 2014 ended. Those who wished to try out the alpha were able to register at greatnessawaits.com and they would receive those codes on June 12th. And those lucky enough to get into the alpha were able to create a character, level up to level 8, play story missions on the Cosmodrome, and play a small section of the Crucible multiplayer. Bungie released a whole bunch of statistics related to the alpha test period, including 6.4 million games since it launched. The Destiny beta released in July, just two months before the official release of the game. The beta released with most of the content released in the alpha, but added just a little bit more. The entirety of the Cosmodrome patrol space, along with all of the Cosmodrome missions, the Devil's Lair Strike, and a few more Crucible maps and modes. At the time of the beta, most players thought this was just a small slice of the game to come in September. Little did players know that this would roughly be a fourth of the entire Destiny vanilla game. But that being said, players still stayed pretty optimistic while heading into Destiny's launch, despite the concerns around things like the loot and what the endgame would be like, and obviously the biggest concern being Rahul's engram decryption being broken or bugged or maybe intentionally kind of rigged that somehow made it past both the alpha and beta testing and somehow still launched busted on release day. And while some players could see potential issues, the hype still remained pretty high for Destiny. Destiny 1 has officially launched. September 9th finally came and the game shipped. Everyone who was anticipating the launch of Destiny now officially had their hands on the full game and began their adventure into the world of Destiny. Four locations were explorable. Earth, the Moon, Venus, and Mars. Because Destiny was so highly anticipated by the masses, and it was Bungie's first game after their massive success with Halo games, I feel like most people expected Destiny to be a lot like Halo, meaning how the campaign is structured. But the campaign actually played a lot differently than a Halo game and very much like a diluted version of the Halo missions. As if they were Halo missions reworked for the MMO style of Destiny. And this proved pretty unpopular and for good reason. I don't think anybody can deny that the actual story being told throughout the game's campaign was pretty weak, which was most likely due to the last minute rework of the story and Joseph Staten, the lead writer, leaving the studio after the reboot. But where the campaign story was weak, the world building was amazing. Through the game's environmental design on each of the destinations like the Black Garden, the Hellmouth on the Moon, the Steps of Venus, the visuals always impressed and made you curious. The backstory to the characters and enemy types were also beyond intriguing to say the least, spawning plenty of lore channels to discuss the mysteries and piece together the story similar to the Dark Souls franchise. Item descriptions on armor and weapons also gave hints towards backstories. The sense of mystery and feeling a part of something bigger than what we were seeing on the surface is what I think helped keep the interest in the game in regards to the Destiny universe. Of course, the amazing gunplay and fluidity of the supers for your guardian definitely helped keep people around. You've heard it a million times before that Destiny just feels good to play, and it always has. From the weightiness of your guns that felt impactful with each trigger pull, to the power fantasy of blade dancing your way through a group of enemies, 
It always felt good. Strike missions also proved to be pretty popular with the community, fighting through dungeon-like experiences to defeat a menacing boss at the end, all while improving your gear, your power level, and your skills, lent to a lot of replayability. PvP was arguably really good during this time as well. It felt very much like Halo in some regards, but it also felt like it mixed some other elements from other FPS games as well, like Call of Duty meets Halo with Ultimates. I know for sure Destiny was able to bring over a ton of Call of Duty fans because as a Call of Duty player who had a lot of friends on COD and watched COD-related YouTube channels at the time, Almost all of them switched over to Destiny as their main game to play for at least a little while, if not permanently. The PvP being a big reason for that. Balance was of course pretty whack, but it was admittedly a ton of fun, especially in the early stages before crazy metas were formed and became a bit more competitive. And PvP would go on to receive a lot of content updates over the next year, including maps and modes because of its popularity, and I think necessity to keep a large portion of the player base around. And now for probably the most important thing to happen in Vanilla Destiny, the Vault of Glass Raid. Before Destiny was released, Bungie went on the record to say that the Vault of Glass Raid was to be the most challenging experience that they'd ever created, and that it was an experience that would take hours to complete, but would provide the ultimate rewards. And you know what? They weren't wrong. The legendary weapons were unmatched with things like Fatebringer and Vision of Confluence, and the exotic exclusive to the raid was top tier and unique. The challenge to complete this raid was very high early on, back when most of the community just weren't prepared for something like it. Complex, for the time, mechanics in a six-man cooperative setting while in first person was essentially a brand new thing. Raiding, something once exclusive to MMOs up to this point had never really been introduced into an FPS game before, and more importantly, on console. Destiny was a lot of gamers first time getting a taste of the MMO experiences once exclusive to PC, and I think it's fair to say that the Vault of Glass helped skyrocket Destiny's popularity to a much higher level. It's what I believe helped keep the game alive long term by giving hope for the future of the game to build off of the foundation set by the Vault of Glass. Destiny's launch was not perfect. Endgame progression was rough, and people resorted to things like the infamous loot cave in order to farm loot effectively. The story was a bit lacking and ambiguous, the mission design was more than weak compared to Bungie's previous work in Halo games, yet there was something special there and many of us saw it. Destiny was and still is a game that is brimming with potential and still quite hasn't fully reached it, but Destiny has improved over the years for the most part and built upon its foundation in major ways. The Dark Below and House of Wolves DLCs gave us all hope for the future of Destiny. From the moment players knew about them, speculation about what these DLCs would include would run wild amongst the Destiny player base, but not all was hopeful. Others who were very unimpressed with the launch of the game would be more than skeptical of the DLCs. Players would find outside of the map glitches also to access areas that would be exclusive to the Dark Below and House of Wolves, furthering the idea that the Dark Below and House of Wolves content were cut from the original game and sold separately as DLCs. But before we talk about the first DLC, The Dark Below, we need to briefly discuss the game during the three month gap between Vanilla's launch and The Dark Below. The state of the game in Vanilla was rough to say the least. The grind was definitely real. Getting above the XP level cap of 20 would require gear with the light level attribute, and the maximum light level gear would grant you level 30, but this could only be acquired through the raid, iron banner, or an exotic piece of armor. Vendor gear or gear earned anywhere else in the system would cap you at level 28, so doing this end game PvE and PvP content was the only real way to reach maximum level. This would spawn the Forever 29 meme that so many players were victim to if you couldn't just get one more piece of armor that would bump you up to level 30. There's kind of a similar struggle now with the Pinnacle Grind in Destiny 2, but again this gear had to be obtained in endgame content only, and being level 29 was a much larger problem for you to compete than it is in Destiny 2 with the Pinnacle Grind. At a level 29, you did 50% less damage and took 50% more damage just by being one level under 30. The increase to survivability and damage output by being a level 30 was so high that the stuck at 29 problem was a much bigger one than we face today with the Pinnacle Grind. On top of this grind, weapons and armor both needed to be leveled up by simply gaining XP with them while equipped and required so many materials to upgrade. 
weapon parts, armor materials, planetary materials, ascendant shards. The grind was too much. Now, would the Dark Below address any of these quality of life issues? No, and I don't think many people expected it to. Being only three months after launch, the dev team likely didn't have time or a solution to solve these problems that players had with the game before the Dark Below would launch. But a solution would still come a little bit later in the House of Wolves. The only change for now that would alleviate some of the grind was the ability to buy planetary materials from a vendor in the tower rather than having to run material farms on the planets, which was, of course, a much welcome addition. In the meantime though, Dark Below content and gear would be bumped up to the new light level of 32, and in so doing would sunset all of the hard-earned and grinded gear from vanilla. All of your Vault of Glass gear? Sunset. All of your old legendary weapons? Capped at 300 damage. And exotics required an upgrade from Xur, which would reset its stats, requiring players to restart their grind on those weapons, or armor pieces. So pretty much the same vanilla grind continued into the Dark Below. Now as for the content in the Dark Below, we received a short 5 mission campaign focused on the moon, a few post campaign quest lines centered around the Knights of Crota and helping the new vendor, Eris Morn, stave off the hive from the solar system, we got two new strikes, the Will of Crota and the Undying Mind, four new exotic weapons, nine new exotic armor pieces, three new PvP maps, a vendor refresh, and a new six-player raid, Crota's End. Now, Dark Below gets a lot of flack for being one of the worst DLCs in Destiny history, and there's a lot of reasons why, but looking back at the amount of content we received is actually not that bad. Lots of new exotics, plenty of new PvP maps, two of the best strikes in the game, and the raid. Love it or hate it, Dark Below brought a decent amount of new things to do, especially when it came to the core activities. The Crota's End raid launched on the same day as the expansion, so many players were eager to get in there after their great experience with the Vault of Glass. And Crota's End wasn't always easy. In fact, Crota's End kicked all of our asses early on. Just the intro to the raid with the Lamp Encounter was enough to prevent many of us from continuing on. Survivability was probably the toughest part of Crota's End. Things like the Ogres on Totems would prove to be majorly difficult, the Death Singer was unbelievably tough due to the health of the knights that would surround her, and Crota was a real bitch to get done, especially thanks to his many glitches. Despite the raid not aging well as time went on, and this next point not aging well either, initial impressions were that Crota's End was harder than Vault of Glass, but of course, the level grind and the chance at new loot was too strong to stay away. And it wasn't long before many different cheeses were found in pretty much every single encounter, Lamps could be cheesed by being launched ahead, Totems could be cheesed by despawning adds by getting out of the map, and Crota would go through many different cheese methods, most notably the Ethernet cable glitch which caused him to stay kneeled down indefinitely. Only a couple of these cheeses were actually patched, while the bridge encounter stayed the same. Crota's End became one of the easiest raids once we learned there wasn't a whole lot of depth to the mechanics and you could just take a lot of shortcuts. The Dark Below was essentially just an addition of content to the foundation of the vanilla Destiny game, and while the content did quench our thirst for a little while, it was clear that the game would need a bit more of a shakeup to the quality of life and core systems. Thankfully, the House of Wolves would do just that. Prior to the House of Wolves launch, news would come that it would not include a raid, and instead would receive a three-man endgame piece of content. This was a major disappointment to fans who had expected nothing less than a raid based on previous leaks and worried that the endgame would be shallow during the House of Wolves. But thankfully, the House of Wolves did just enough things right that it would be received much more positively than the Dark Below. The marketing campaign was turned up a notch for House of Wolves between some great trailers and some reveal streams showing off things like the Prison of Elders and the Trials of Osiris. And a week before House of Wolves launched, Bungie brought a new public event to the game known to us as the Wolves Are Prowling event. This would basically just be massive waves of fallen on different planets that when cleared would provide a hidden chest in the area that contained a new consumable, a treasure key. Treasure keys would be used later in the DLC to open chests after the end of a Prison of Elders completion, so during this pre-launch week, everyone, and I mean everyone, was farming treasure keys. Also, there was a cheese for that. Hopping on your sparrow and going out of the area and coming back, opening the chest once again was a way to endlessly farm until the time ran out. And this week pre-launch of House of Wolves was a glorious time. When House of Wolves did finally launch in May of 2015, we were greeted with some welcome quality of life changes, most notably Etheric Light. 
Etheric Light allowed us to infuse all of our previous gear from Vanilla and Dark Below to the current maximum light of level 34. This was obviously great as all our previously earned gear was relevant again, and of course new endgame gear would drop at the same level. The only problem with this was making the new gear a little bit obsolete as our previous gear was just a lot better than the House of Wolves gear, for the most part. I mean, why would you take a 6 dreg pride when you could just use a Fatebringer? But again, on the flip side, all of the content was relevant in the game. Vault of Glass, Crota's End, and of course the new House of Wolves content could all be farmed. Speaking of which, what did House of Wolves bring to the table content-wise? Well, it brought another relatively short campaign with much better writing than Vanilla or Dark Below, featuring great characters like Petrovenge and Varix, two favorite characters who continue to be favorites in the game today. It brought only one new strike, the Shadow Thief featuring Tanix, and this was his first introduction before he was reused four times after this. It brought a new social space, the Reef, three new exotic weapons, nine new exotic armor pieces, four PvP maps, a vendor refresh, a much lessened grind for weapons and armor pieces, Trials of Osiris, and the Prison of Elders endgame activity that featured six unique bosses with mechanics. Most notably and importantly though, Skolas, who was essentially the three-man raid boss of the DLC. House of Wolves definitely was not light on the content, and I think more than made up for not including a raid. Now if House of Wolves did ship with a raid, I think we'd be talking S-tier expansion. Better than some fall expansions. But even without the raid, House of Wolves added plenty to keep us busy, and made just enough changes to quality of life, even if they were temporary, that it kept us all pretty happy. Now Prison of Elders was great, in my opinion at least, but did start to get a little bit boring as the weeks went by. The only real reason to keep playing was for a chance at one of the three new exotics, all of which have become fan favorites I might add. Shortly after launch, Skolas would receive a nerf to his health pool, which was a more than welcome change because initially that fight was damn near impossible to do. But one of the biggest and probably most important additions during the House of Wolves was the Trials of Osiris. Trials of Osiris was the competitive mode the game was missing for so long. 3v3, one life, deathmatch. Some argue that Trials was a bad thing from the start, and was not needed, but I'd say that even with the flaws it brought to the game, I think it skyrocketed Destiny's popularity in many ways. It was not only addicting and fun for most players to try out, but viewership on Twitch related to Trials was huge and growing quickly. The loot related to Trials of Osiris was also top tier. The weapons were great, the armor was by far the best looking armor in the game at the time, emblems, shaders, a trip to the coveted lighthouse, all of it was desirable. Now like I said, there were some drawbacks to Trials being added. What used to be a much more casual experience, PvP began to be a lot more sweaty in general thanks to Trials, and the focus on the meta. Last Word, Thorn, Firebolt Grenades, Felwinter's Lie, Final Round Sniper, all these things became the norm, and in some ways the enjoyment of PvP suffered. Despite minor grievances though, House of Wolves is what I consider to be one of the best times in Destiny's history. All of the content in the game was relevant thanks to Etheric Light, PvP was at its peak interest amongst everybody, Prison of Elders was mostly a success, and the core activity content was plentiful. House of Wolves was by far the best content we had to date. Well, until this came along. The Taken King changed Destiny forever. Before we even got our first glimpse of the Taken King during E3 2015, players of course were excited to see what this soon to come large fall expansion was all about. Bungie had hinted at a 2.0 update that would change the game in major ways, and after the success of the House of Wolves DLC, speculation amongst fans, as usual, ran wild with possibilities. But I don't think players were prepared for that E3 Taken King reveal. His name is Oryx. Oryx! Oh my god, really? And he's coming for you, Guardian. So like I said, during the PlayStation Showcase in E3 2015, we would get our first real look at the Taken King expansion, and man did it look good. Oryx was the center of the marketing, the big baddie of the expansion. Someone who we've heard so much about, especially during the Dark Below revolving around Crota, Oryx's son, 
new supers, new destination, new campaign, so many new strikes and crucible maps, it was shaping up to be more of a sequel rather than an expansion. The content coming in the Taken King looked great and anticipation was at an all-time high for Destiny fans. The three-month wait after the reveal almost killed us, but a week before Taken King's launch, we got the 2.0 update. So many systems were overhauled. XP leveling and light leveling was the biggest change. Where in year one, gear would need to have light attached to its values in order to go up levels. Instead, with the Taken King, we would have XP levels separate from our light level. XP level rose from level 20 to level 40, and our light level was now associated by the value on our gear rather than light level on our gear. And this was for any gear, not just raid gear. Infusing gear was similar to how we did it with Etheric Light in the House of Wolves, only this time instead of Etheric Light, it was whichever piece of gear was higher that would now act as infusion material. Things like ghost shells also now contributed to your light level. Class items too and a new item called Artifacts that basically served as just a stat boosting piece of fodder. Initially with the 2.0 update, Infusion wouldn't quite bump up the level to what the Infusion material had, meaning it wasn't a one-to-one -one Infusion. For example, a 310 helmet being infused into a 300 helmet would bring it up to something like 305. It kind of just split the difference a bit. There were calculators made online by players in the community that would do the specific math for you if you were curious about how exactly it worked, and it was kind of frustrating that it wasn't just one-to-one -one infusion. And that was an almost immediate complaint about the new light level system. However, the groundwork was laid for this leveling mechanic that would basically remain the same for the next seven years of the franchise, and despite the one-to-one -one issue, players would receive the change to leveling very positively. Weapon stats were changed in pretty major ways, damage falloff was now more of a thing, in year one weapons range stat was almost meaningless, and there was very little damage falloff if any, and now with the 2.0 update, things like hand cannons and auto rifles would be hit pretty hard in that regard. A plethora of perks would be changed in their lethality like final round, shot package, rangefinder, field scout, hammer forged, pretty much all of the top tier perks from year one were nerfed a little bit. Exotic weapons and armor pieces would receive a bunch of changes as well across the board, some were buffed, some were nerfed, but most of the changes were well received. Year one activities were questified to be a lot more new player friendly and streamlined in their delivery. Our ghost's voice actor was replaced by Nolan North for every line in the game, bounty slot size increased to 16, the vault was converted into a much larger and better organized version of itself, kiosks were added for things like shaders, emblems, sparrows, ships, and exotics, and this was kind of a precursor to the collection system of Destiny 2. Banshee in the Tower would receive a lot more use with his new Arms Day quests where you could work towards a new shipment of weapons that could potentially be god rolls. Factions would now be something you would pledge to in order to rank up through passive progression, receiving their own exotic class item quest after reaching rank 25 with them. Currencies were simplified between armor materials now being one universal material rather than three separate ones per class, and legendary marks would replace the old Crucible and Vanguard mark system. PvP would receive new additions like the new Mercy Rule to end blowout games, new post-game drops exclusive to PvP, balance changes made to various existing game modes as well as adding three new game modes, Mayhem, Rift, and Zone Control, as well as eight PvP maps, and a whole bunch of other quality of life changes. The 2.0 update was huge, and we hadn't even got the expansion yet. But it was only one week away, and during the 2.0 update week ahead of launch was some of the most fun I've ever had in Destiny PvP. Eight new maps with the massive sandbox changes just felt like a new game, in the best way possible. It felt familiar, obviously, because it was still Destiny 1, but so much experimenting was going on. There was no meta during that week, and everyone was just having fun playing the new maps, trying so many different things, and feeling very positive going into Taken King's launch. And after seven days of experiencing this new and improved Destiny, we would finally get the Taken King expansion. And let's take a look at what we got. We received eight beefy campaign missions focused on Oryx and his Taken army, eight major post-campaign quest lines like the Taken war quests that had us fighting off Taken champions all around the solar system, the Wolves of Mars questline, the Paradox Vault of Glass questline that was focused on some of the deep lore related to the Vault of Glass and its characters, various exotic quests, both obvious and hidden, 
more secret quest lines aboard the Dreadnought with great lore and rewards, four fantastic strikes, the Fallen Saber, Shield Brothers, Echo Chamber, and the Sunless Cell, all with brand new strike-specific loot to chase, and even old strikes would receive updated loot pools with specific weapons or armor pieces, 17 new exotic weapons, 12 new exotic armor pieces, a massive vendor refresh, new Iron Banner weapons and armor sets, new Trials of Osiris weapons and armor sets, the Dreadnought destination full of so many secrets and things to do, including the first world boss style event, the Court of Oryx, which was widely popular. And again, eight PvP maps, seven right at launch, and one more released after the raid was completed. And which raid was that? It was the King's Fall raid, of course, something that blew all of our minds when it released. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Yeah, he's beating. Oh, 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 Nothing up to that point could even compare to King's Fall. The Taken King truly felt like a whole new game thanks to not just the overhauls to core systems, but the sheer amount of content that it brought. It was truly massive. Now backing up a little bit to the campaign, the mission design and writing was at its best up to that point. If the positive improvements during the House of Wolves campaign made you happy, then the improvements in the Taken King campaign would have you ecstatic. Much deeper narrative fleshed out with cutscenes and real character development, unique locations all around the Dreadnought and even new parts of old locations, a build-up and finale that was very satisfying, and then, of course, the send-off with Taken King's best piece of content, the King's Fall Raid. And like I mentioned, nothing had even come close to the level of complexity, difficulty, and length of the King's Fall Raid prior to its release. Vault of Glass was great. But King's Fall was an experience. Yes! 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 It truly earned the title of a raid. The sheer amount of distance traveled, champions defeated, failures along the way, followed by the grand finale of sending Oryx hurling into space. Defeating Oryx was not only one of the best moments in Destiny, but one of the best moments in gaming. The Taken King's amount of content kept everyone busy for quite a while, not just because of so many new things to do, but again because it felt like a new game. Bungie would even surprise everyone with a new exotic quest or new secret to find almost every week. Like the famous Black Spindle mission which was released a week after the Taken King launched. Or even a month after release in October we got the Sleeper Simulant questline that was just as difficult and complex as the original Outbreak Prime quest in The Rise of Iron. Trials and Iron Banner were still very active and popular due to their major draw with new armor sets and top tier weapons. And we even got a surprise holiday themed event, Festival of the Lost. Now we had a few holiday things in year one like jack-o'-lantern helmet consumables and at Christmas time Rahul gave us all a present, but this right here was our actual first real holiday event. Releasing a week before Halloween, Festival of the Lost was a total surprise and nothing was announced ahead of time, so when you booted up the game that Tuesday, nobody knew we'd be greeted by Halloween decorations or trick-or-treat quest lines. Eververse had just been added to the game about a week before Festival of the Lost and, of course, our quest began with her in the tower. The quest related to the event had you collecting candy that you would turn into Eva Levante once it was filled and she would, of course, reward you with a mask. There were 17 possible masks, and in order to keep your mask after the event ended, you would need to upgrade it to Legendary, which you could do with glue. You could get a few of these for free by dismantling your free Legendary mask per character that you would receive at the beginning of the event, but mostly this was just an incentive to buy some loot boxes from Eververse that would contain glue or a new mask. Now, some of you will remember that the most sought after mask at the time was the Blue Skull Mask, which everyone spent way too much money trying to get, as well as buying the Thriller emote, and plenty of other emotes. From their inception, holiday events were of course designed around spending money at Eververse, but we didn't quite know it at the time because it was also new to us and we were too busy reveling in the event. This was brand new after all. And it was at this point that many players were very impressed with the post Taken King content and consistent updates, but of course, speculation began again about the next DLC in December. I mean, there was going to be a DLC in December, right? 
Well, that's what we all thought, but in early December, it was confirmed by Bungie that there would be no DLC coming in December or even in the spring, and instead would shift to event-based content for the year. Senior designer at Bungie, Derek Carroll, would announce that, with the Taken King, we are moving to a more event-based model, things like the Festival of the Lost, and then smaller events such as Iron Banner and Trials of Osiris every weekend, rather than doing these giant monolithic DLC packs. This way, everybody who owns the Taken King can enjoy these things. This was of course very disappointing news as fans almost always just wanted more Destiny, and the Taken King had the game in a really good place, and to see DLC not coming for the year was pretty tough. With this announcement though, would come the announcement of another major event, Sparrow Racing League. Sparrow Racing League would be a very popular event that went on for three weeks. Six man racing on two different tracks made specifically for the event. It came with a whole host of new sparrows to earn with new models, some of the game's best shaders and emblems, sparrow horns, as well as sparrow racing gear, which of course granted you bonuses to your sparrow racing capabilities. You had the option to purchase from Eververse an event booklet that was basically the equivalent to earning a title in Destiny 2. The booklet provided you with rewards for completing various challenges and kept record of your fastest times on the tracks. SRL was very popular, but players were still massively disappointed that there were no plans for DLC expansions throughout the whole year. Around the same time as SRL, we would get some other new things. First was some updates to 15 old exotics from year 1 that would bring a lot of changes to how they worked in comparison to their year 1 counterparts, as well as a few new exotics like the Twilight Garrison for Titans and the ATS-8 Tarantella for the Hunters. Challenge modes would also come in the update for the King's Fall Raid that would reward players with 320 light level artifacts guaranteed, and challenge mode would kind of wind up being a bit underwhelming from a gameplay perspective since most of the challenges were either so easy they could be ignored or were already the default strategy in the case of Oryx. And things were pretty quiet for the next two months of Destiny, at least from a new content perspective. But we would get another event in February called Crimson Days. This event was of course the Valentine's Day event and featured a new 2v2 elimination game mode where you could earn the new rewards from the event. An emblem, a couple shaders, a new ghost shell, and you could just enjoy the fun that the new game mode brought. The catch of the 2v2 event was that if your teammate died, you would receive the Broken Heart buff, which would max out all your stats across everything. Armor, recovery, reload speed, literally everything. Eververse, of course, was packed with new emotes, but the event went on for just a week, and this event in particular was pretty minor. But after that week, it was pretty slow going for another two months. Then we actually got some pretty good news. We would be receiving a brand new update akin to what would be considered a season in Destiny 2, and this update was known as the April Update, as it released in April 2016. It would bring a whole heap of new weapons, some new armor sets, most popular being the Taken armor set, of course, but the Chroma armor was really good as well. It would bring a brand new questline with a strike on the moon, the Blighted Chalice that had us hunting down Malak, the Winter's Run Strike would get a revamped Taken version with a new boss and some new loot, Prison of Elders would get a revamp known as the Challenge of the Elders, which was a shorter three-round version of the Prison of Elders with some new Taken champions to take down. This also brought along a new scoring system that would track your high score and require certain amounts of points to complete specific bounties. And of course, in the new Challenge of Elders, you could get the old Prison of Elders exotics, brought up to year two. There were new paths made to earn maximum light level, which was now 335. Instead of just the Raid or Trials of Osiris, now players could earn max level gear in many different activities. Challenge of the Elders, Nightfalls, Court of Oryx, Raids, Iron Banner, Trials. And to top it all off, 1 to 1 infusion rates were added to the game, which was probably the best quality of life change that has never gone away since it was introduced because it was just so good. Major sandbox changes were made for the sake of crucible balance primarily, however they did change the sniper rifle ammo economy to be much lower, and in PvE this was a bit of a controversial change, as it made the King's Fall raid a bit tougher to do since snipers were kind of the most useful weapon throughout all of the encounters, and by extension some strikes became a little bit tougher as well. Overall though, the April update was a major win for Bungie and the player base at that time. It wasn't a lot of content, but it was enough to bring players back for a little while and satiate our thirst for new content. All in all, the year of the Taken King was known as the content drought year, and while I can definitely agree that it was tough in some regards, I wouldn't say it was a year with no content. There were still updates and additions to the game, holiday events were brand new at the time and were pretty good during this year I'd say. The April update was solid, and yes, it was a bit of a drier year. 
But the Taken King itself was a phenomenal expansion, and during the off months of the year, it gave players a chance to breathe a little bit, try out some other games like The Division or Overwatch, and it allowed us to be excited for what would come next in Destiny. The Rise of Iron after the year of the Taken King, thirst for new content had reached its peak. Players were enjoying the April update, but still didn't know if we would be getting Destiny 2 in 2016, or if it would be delayed. Well, two months later, during the PlayStation E3 conference, we would get our answer. Our first look at Rise of Iron told us so much about what to expect. New patrol space, new social space, new enemy type, new raid, and so much more. And on September 20th, 2016, we'd finally get to play the Rise of Iron. And the game itself didn't really change a whole lot with Rise of Iron's update, which was fine because the Taken King and its following updates had the game in a really good state. The majority of changes were to the sandbox, most notably with the weapons. Class abilities, armor, things like that were barely touched. But we got exactly what we wanted, a new full-sized expansion. We received a pretty decent sized campaign with five missions, several post-campaign quest lines focused around SIVA as well as the few great new exotic quest missions like the Kvostov quest. We only got one brand new strike which was a bit disappointing but it was a pretty good one and we also had two older strikes come back and SIVA-fied, Sepix Prime being the best revamped strike we've ever got. Updated mechanics, updated soundtrack, it was spectacular. And the Fogoth strike was Sivified as the Abomination Heist. Each strike also brought along some new strike specific loot as well. Five new exotic weapons, five new exotic armor pieces, a vendor refresh, new iron banner, and new Trials of Osiris weapons and armor sets. World loot pool refresh with some of the best looking armor and weapons in the game. A triumph book which also contains some incredible armor and weapons, along with a lot of ornaments. The Plaguelands destination that included part of the old Cosmodrome and grew out into a massive quarantine zone full of spliced enemies, lava-filled hellscapes, and SIVA chambers. And some new public events that allowed us to wield Iron Lord axes. And similar to the Taken King's Court of Oryx, we had its equivalent in Rise of Iron with Archon's Forge. Another world boss public event zone that had its own unique armor set. Four PvP maps, a new PvP game mode, Supremacy, and of course, a brand new raid, Wrath of the Machine, which had one of the most complex and lengthy exotic quest lines associated with it that required you to learn binary code, all to get the Pulse Rifle Outbreak Prime. Rise of Iron was a treat. The expansion content, while not as large as Taken Kings, was substantial, and the state of the game was the best it's ever been. The tone and atmosphere of Rise of Iron was incredible. The Iron Lords and the story around Siva and Saladin and all that backstory thrown at us was really interesting and just badass. And players were back to being busy trying out all the new things the content had to offer, like the new artifacts. In Taken King, artifacts were just throwaway stat bumps, but in Rise of Iron they were actual game changers. They would grant you extra grenade and melee charges for the cost of losing your super, or one would turn your enemies into allies when you melee them, and one of them would remove the sprint cooldown on your guardian, and you know damn well that I had that one equipped 24-7. Small secrets and easter eggs were plentiful this time around. The new social space had things like climbing Fellwinter Peak or ringing bells in a certain order for an achievement, and plenty of new hidden discoveries all around the Plaguelands with unique rewards. Crucible was in a pretty good state thanks to four new maps and the mode Supremacy which was basically kill confirmed from Call of Duty. And on top of that, the sandbox shakeup helped keep things a little fresh. The strike playlist was more rewarding than ever and included skeleton keys now that could open up chests for better chances at strike specific loot. The weekly story mission playlist provided some improved rewards as well. And the Wrath of the Machine raid was just pure fun. Not as big or complex as King's Fall, but by far the most enjoyable raid to replay in D1. The Zamboni atop the wall was a standout encounter, and Axis was just fun, a lot of movement, and it looked totally badass slamming down on Axis. And the loot found inside of Wrath of the Machine was genuinely top tier. Rise of Iron was a big success, and this year we kind of knew what to expect going forward. We knew there wouldn't be smaller DLCs, just like last year during the Taken King, and that we'd be getting smaller updates and events for the year. 
first of which was the return of Festival of the Lost. And this year was essentially the same as last year, only this time with some new masks and some fun new cosmetic items to chase down, as well as some more fun interactions this time between the NPCs. One mini questline involved you trading your box of raisins from last year's event, and making trades between a few of the NPCs would eventually get you one of the best shaders in the game, Super Black. Another questline had you tracking down one of the sweeper bot's brooms and searching around the tower until you could find it, and when you did, it actually became a sparrow, which was awesome, but unfortunately, it did expire once the event ended. And this year, there was a whole lot more focus on Eververse, which was disappointing, but expected. Just when you thought Eververse couldn't get any worse, Bungie of course kept pushing the envelope. This year, weapon ornaments were added to the game, and two of them were found in Treasure of the Lost loot boxes, as well as some neat ghost shells, a new sparrow, and of course, another very sought after mask. If you paired this mask with the Wolf Howl emote, it would glow blue for a short amount of time. The event was arguably better than last year's, with some fun new easter egg style mini quests, but Eververse was more prominent, so it kind of left a bad taste in players' mouths for the year. But the next bit of content in December was very, very well received, not only because Sparrow Racing made a return, but a new event called The Dawning arrived alongside it. The Destiny 1 Dawning is regarded as Destiny's best ever holiday event that we'd ever received. The event brought a brand new Triumph booklet and that contained Sparrow Racing and Dawning themed items and this year, the booklet was free. It also contained items required to open up presents at the tower. Three of these presents could contain some really great rewards like Treasure of Dawning loot boxes, exotic engrams, and the beginning of a new quest to get the Nova Mortis and the Abaddon exotic machine gun. Treasures of the Dawning, aka the loot boxes this time, were much easier to get without purchasing anything. There were two new armor sets inside of them, a whole bunch of new ornaments, new sparrows, new consumables, sparrow horns, and like I said, it was easy to actually earn these loot boxes that would contain these items rather than having to purchase them with silver. It was clear Bungie listened to the feedback from Festival of the Lost. Sparrow Racing received two more maps to the rotation, totaling to four maps, and received some new quest lines with Amanda Holiday as well. Strike scoring was added to the game, which was huge at the time. New medals and challenges were added with it as well. And Zavala would have new Vanguard Elite bounties like the Sunrise Bounty that could grant you an exotic. Two more strikes were updated and changed. The Tannic Strike became Sivified, and the Nexus Strike basically became a mini Templar fight from the Vault of Glass and required the use of the Relic. These versions of the strikes were fantastic. Icebreaker was updated and brought forward with the update as well. Destiny 1's first and only dawning event would be so successful that many people claimed it was better than the April update, and I'd say they might be right. It did so many things well. It was rewarding, it was cool, and it gave us a lot of fun memories. The game was continually getting the right amount of quality of life improvements, especially to the core game with things like strike scoring. PvP also was in generally a good spot. Events like Trials and Iron Banner were flourishing. Iron Banner especially though, because the changes made to it would make it as close to perfect as you can get. With the inclusion of a better bounty and progression system and some of the seriously fantastic weapons and armor, as well as being hosted at the Iron Temple by Lady Ephrodite, it definitely reached its peak during this year. Now players were expecting Crimson Days to make a return again, however this year Bungie had other plans. Deej would make a statement about having other things cooked up for us that would be taking up the development time instead. Players were a little bit disappointed, but speculation began about what this meant. Was it a smaller DLC like House of Wolves, something like the April update, or something else entirely? Well what we got was the Age of Triumph, which is by far the best update Destiny 1 would ever receive outside of an expansion, of course. Releasing in March 2017, Age of Triumph was the cherry on top of what was already Destiny at its peak. Age of Triumph brought forward the Vault of Glass and Crotazan raids to current levels. It made changes to various encounters, especially in the Crotazan raid. It provided new challenge modes to those raids as well, and things like emblems and ghost shells that didn't exist in them before. Each raid received brand new ornaments to go along with their armor sets, which were by far the best looking armor sets in Destiny history. And each raid would now be part of a weekly featured rotation where all the challenge modes would grant you brand new exotic level primaries that had elements, just like they did in year one. It would also grant you with a brand new armor ornament. But it wasn't just raids that got great changes, it was also things like strikes. Nightfall strikes got the addition of what were called Daybreak Nightfalls, which was basically Mayhem Nightfalls increased recharge rates across the board for your character, and all three elements would be the active burn. And these were just a ton of fun. Also, weekly Nightfall XP buffs were re-included from year one, which would increase XP gains for the entire week. 
and would make your head have a blue flame around it. The weekly story mission and strike playlist received increased loot drop chances and Treasure of Ages rewards which were the loot boxes this time around, and they would drop by doing core playlist activities. The Age of Triumph record book was the best record book we'd ever received and brought along so many new rewards for veteran players and collectors. And only one negative thing came from the Age of Triumph update, and that was a change to the special ammo economy in PvP. When you respawned, you would have no special ammo and would need to be picked up exclusively through ammo boxes around the map. This wouldn't have been such a bad thing because on paper I think it's a fine idea. However, sidearms could bypass this change because of their intrinsic perk allowing them to respawn with a magazine of ammo, and weapons like Icebreaker and Invective existed which regenerated ammo. If they never made that one change to PvP, I think Destiny 1 would be in a damn near perfect state. And actually despite that change, I think it is in a damn near perfect state. The Age of Triumph was a net positive for the game and is considered the best update for D1. And it was around this time also that Destiny 2 would get announced, and a reveal stream would be happening in two months, May 2017. And man were the hype levels high. How could Bungie screw this up? Destiny 1 is in such a great state. I'm sure Destiny 2 is going to be a masterpiece. Right? Destiny 2, the sequel, is finally announced, and the reveal stream is right around the corner. Players are more than eager to just get a look at this game. Will it feature the same classes? Will it feature a bunch of new subclasses? New planets? What will the story focus on? What should we expect from this highly anticipated sequel? So many questions and theories were tossed around until finally, the day of the reveal stream came. The wait is over. This is Destiny 2, and this is Homecoming. First, let's get a quick overview of what we saw in the reveal. It kicked off with a Zavala backstory cutscene, which is a personal favorite of mine. This trailer alone had so many players hyped. Even the live audience was getting into it. Shaped by the fires of each new battle, we are forged and sharpened into what we must become for the fight ahead. It really set the tone for most of the stream. Just pure hype. Luke Smith would give a brief breakdown of what Destiny 2 meant to them and why they decided to go with a sequel instead of just continuing with Destiny 1. Finally, after his ramblings, Luke Smith presented us with the first mission of the Destiny 2 campaign, Homecoming. Now the Homecoming mission is absolutely top notch and seeing this massive step up in the campaign's presentation had us all expecting this level of quality to remain throughout the entire campaign. Spoiler, that wouldn't be the case. Fighting through the old tower, having so many interactions with characters and NPCs, the game looked totally badass. Next, we'd get a Vidoc presented to us about Destiny 2 becoming a game about loss and recovery. A big baddie named Gaul who wanted to steal our light for himself, and most importantly, we got key details on some of the big changes coming to the game. For starters, the weapon slot change. Kinetic, energy, and power weapons. We also got a look at the game's new supers, Dawnblade, Sentinel, and Arcstrider. Things that easily impressed everyone, but I think we expected a little bit more. Maybe a new element type or a few more subclasses, but it did look good. A brief overview of the new campaign, the return of strike missions, and then we get to the Crucible. 4v4 across all game modes. The HUD display would now show players supers, power ammo pickups, and a more focus on competitive gameplay. We'd get a look at some of the new worlds to explore and what activities awaited us on them. Additions like adventures, lost sectors, new public events, and new NPCs associated with each planet. Then we got a look at some changes to how clan systems would be more integrated into the game. And we also got a look at Guided Games, the somewhat failed raid matchmaking system. The reveal stream had so many people hyped, myself included, but I think I can speak for everyone when I say there were some red flags that players were a bit worried about. Two major things being the weapon slot changes and 4v4 competitive focused PvP. PvP players were more positive about the weapon slot changes being two primaries and one heavy or special weapon, but most PvE players really worried about how boring the PvE sandbox could potentially become. 
a worry that was very valid. Now as for 4v4 competitive focused PvP, well the PvP sweats were a bit more optimistic about the new competitive focus, but it brought a lot of worry to the more casual Crucible players. And I don't mean like really casual players, but those who just enjoyed the laid back Crucible experience in D1. I would say I was probably a bit more casual in PvP overall, however, I did spend probably 50% of my time in PvP and went flawless over 50 times in D1 trials, but I'm more casual in how I enjoyed the PvP in Destiny 1. Things like going into PvP after my fire team just completed a raid, just having some laid back fun. And now with it being 4v4 across all game modes, that wouldn't be possible for one, and so much of the conversation around it was that it was designed to be more competitive. And it had me worried and many others that it would no longer have that fun factor. Destiny PvP was never designed to be competitive from the start, and it's what made it so much fun in D1. And yes, a competitive scene kind of sprouted out of that, but that's how a lot of competitive games start out. A great, fun foundation not focused on competitive, and things sprout from that. But sometimes when they design things to be competitive, there's not the fun factor that brought us to love the game in the first place. About a month later, it would be announced by Luke Smith in an interview with Mashable that there aren't random rolls on weapons anymore. Better Devils is a crucible hand cannon, and what it has on it is what it has on it. Period. How can my second, third, and tenth Better Devils hand cannon be interesting? That's a question we should be asking and answering as quickly as we can. We have ideas. This announcement in particular brought a bit of a divide in the community as there were those who were happy about the change and thought it was probably going to be okay, likely a much more casual side of the audience, and then a much larger portion of the community, probably the majority, would immediately see the problem with this change. Random rolls on weapons and armor were a major part of the endgame in D1. Looter shooters lose a lot of excitement in general when the loot you get is static and stats never change no matter how many times you get them. And this was a major concern going into the game. But a month later we would get the Destiny 2 beta in July and players would finally get their hands on the game and see if some of their worries were overblown or if the game was actually able to pull off some of the core changes. The beta brought the homecoming story mission, the inverted spire strike, the farm social space, and two crucible maps. Impressions were pretty mixed. Going back and listening to a lot of players' first impressions of the beta, it's clear that players were trying to stay optimistic, but there was a lot of hesitancy in saying much positive or negative things. It felt like people were holding back and trying just to believe that it was going to be okay. And I think Datto explained it best for how many of us were feeling during the D2 beta. The strike was, you know, the strike. However, I've noticed that I'm getting team shot way more often in Destiny 2. The amount of 1v1s that happen have been very, very few, at least compared to Destiny 1. Destiny 2 appears to be all about team shotting. With regards to PvE, I'll reiterate that these changes make PvE a snooze fest compared to Destiny 1. And again, we don't know if gear and weapons will make our cooldowns resolve faster, but if there aren't items that do such a thing, then I think that would be a shame for the PvE scene. Having to wait over a minute for my grenade to come back is really, really boring gameplay-wise. A lot of our worries were confirmed. Much slower recharge rate made PvP slightly more balanced, but less enjoyable, getting maybe one super in a match right towards the end. PvE was an absolute bore waiting over a minute for your grenade to recharge. Less fun supering enemies and the double primary weapon change just did not feel good. It wasn't fun. PvP, the double primary system felt a bit more alright, but team shotting became the meta almost immediately. Players just peeking one lane, ADSing down a hallway, waiting for someone to pop out of it. It was just so much less exciting than D1 PvP, even if it were more balanced. The strike took place on Nessus and was cool the first time around, but really didn't wow anybody. It felt pretty much the same as any D1 strike, and players had hoped that we'd see more significant improvements and changes to strikes. But this one just felt the same, and wasn't all that special. I think the biggest highlight was probably the homecoming mission, which we were able to fully play through this time, and it was really good, and gave players a lot of hope that the rest of the campaign would be at this same standard. But that was it for the beta. Mostly underwhelming and brought more concerns to light, rather than easing them. But like I said, a lot of people wanted to be wrong about their worries. Wanted Bungie to have some tricks up their sleeves and blow us away. Wanted Destiny 2 to live up to the expectations set by Destiny 1 by the end of Year 3. 
and it wasn't long before September 6, 2017 arrived. Launch day. Players were playing through all the new content, looking forward to the end game, and to our surprise, it happened a bit too quickly. But first, let's talk about the Red War campaign. How was it? Initially, impressions were that it was better than Destiny 1's vanilla campaign, which it was. But it didn't quite stack up to even the Taken King campaign for a few reasons. First was that the rest of the campaign after the first homecoming mission just did not maintain a similar high quality. There were a few exceptions, like the one where you disable the Almighty's weapon, but for the most part, they were very much just like vanilla D1 story missions. Pull out your ghost, clear ads, door opens, do it again in the next room. The new characters like Hawthorne weren't really received too well either. Hawthorne wasn't really a likable character despite Bungie's best efforts to make us like her. Failsafe, Asher Mir, and Sloan were mostly disliked as well. I know there's a few people who liked them, and that's fine. But for the most part, they were just more annoying than anything. Devrim K was the only new NPC people really didn't have a problem with. The Vanguard had a lot more appearances and went off to each of the new planets to cope with their loss of the light. And despite that interesting premise, there wasn't a whole lot to do with them on their respective planets. Most of their story arcs were wrapped up in a couple missions and just felt rushed. It also was kind of hilarious that these guys went off and fled Earth to cope with losing the light when our Guardian was able to get our light back in the first 20 minutes of the campaign. It's just kind of comical writing that kind of kneecaps the whole idea of Destiny 2 being a game about loss and recovery when both the loss and recovery happens in 20 minutes. We got a new social space to rebuild our strength, the farm, a place that would have been cool to slowly turn into something bigger and more fleshed out as time went by, yet only after a couple hours, the farm would be replaced by just another tower. So much for losing our old one because we have a new backup one that'll do just fine. Not utilizing the farm was such a missed opportunity. Gaul was a somewhat interesting villain. He didn't simply just want to take our light, but he wanted to be chosen by the Traveler to have the light. He needed his plan to work out in specific ways to fulfill his desired outcome. Whether it be for greed or to fulfill some kind of prophecy he believed he was a part of, overall Gaul was fine as a villain. Killing him in the final mission of the campaign did feel a little bit silly though. I mean he was so hyped up and talked about being the destroyer of worlds and he died to one lowly guardian, me, who beat the campaign solo. It was just a bit deflating. And when you do kill him, he transforms into this light monster and I thought maybe this could be him in his raid form, hell yes. But nope, the Traveler explodes and kills him. It was just such a goofy ending. The various new planets we visited were cool to explore. Nessus being a fan favorite, as well as the EDZ. Titan and Io were pretty good as well, just a bit small and less interesting to most people. Although I think Io really got more interesting over time, and Titan had some really cool hive lore implications. The new activities on these destinations were pretty middling across the board though. Adventures were small post-campaign missions that dove into the backstory of various characters like Failsafe, Asher, and the other NPCs. Lost Sectors were mini underground boss dungeons that were cool the first few times but weren't particularly rewarding or fun to rerun. And public events were mostly the same. A couple new ones, but a lot of returning ones as well. Strikes were pretty bog standard as far as strikes go. Taken King strikes were far better designed than the ones here. A few of these strikes were even hated right off the bat, like the Exodus Crash and the Lake of Shadows. And besides Savathun's song, they all just kind of felt samey, uninspired, a bit disconnected. The new raid, the Leviathan, was a bit of a brighter spot though. The location design was unique, the expansive area and underbelly was awesome to explore, and Kallus was a good final boss. The rest of the raid had some interesting, more puzzle-oriented encounters, but were a bit boring and kind of underwhelming. And only one boss fight for the whole raid, Callus. I mean, coming off of something like King's Fall and Wrath of the Machine, Leviathan just wasn't even close to comparing. And while the Leviathan's not a bad raid, it's not really a good one either. The loot, however, was probably its highlight. Midnight Coup, Inaugural Address, Legend of Acrius, all pretty cool weapons. The armor looked all right, and the shader was nice, so there were some bright spots. But the sandbox of the game in both PvE and PvP was just unbelievably boring. We felt so much less powerful than we did in D1. Movement was slower across all the classes, especially Titans who had their shoulder charge nerfed significantly. It hardly propelled you forward at all so it couldn't be used for traversal. Recharge rates from things like your super, grenade, and melee were so dreadfully long that mostly all you were doing was shooting every single enemy with your primary. 
and this is when enemies were just much more bullet spongy. You and your teammates would be shooting one Cabal Centurion for 10 seconds to kill him, and that's just one ad. Supers were mostly nerfed having a very short duration, Golden Gun especially which ran out in like 4 seconds. And despite the new additions like Titan Barricade, Warlock Rift, and Hunter Dodges which were all very cool, we still overall felt weak, and double primaries just made it that much worse. Endgame was lacking. Raids, Iron Banner, Trials of the Nine were all neutered in both their gameplay and rewards. Endgame became just public event farming, and with bounties being completely removed, public events would provide the best loot and XP. The state of the endgame was just bad. There was almost nothing to chase. Armor was changed in the worst way possible. Whereas in Destiny 1 we had all sorts of stats to focus in order to make proper builds, intellect, discipline, strength, all stats that could have you focus your armor around in order to reduce cooldowns, and Destiny 2 allowed for no such thing. Armor could only provide resilience, mobility, and recovery. And the worst part is, armor was statically rolled just like weapons. Armor from each vendor or planet was always the same roll. If you wanted specific stats, you had to wear that exact armor. And there were no chances of getting the better looking armor you wanted to wear with stats that you liked, because it was simply impossible. Vanguard and Crucible Rep was replaced with a token system, a system that streamlined the RPG aspect of increasing vendor's reputation. In D1, you would earn things for leveling up the tower's NPC's ranks. Things like quests would open up, special ships, shaders, weapons, armor. And all of this was now replaced with tokens that would give you weapons and armor. Yes. But, because they were static rolls, what was the point of getting them again? They couldn't be used to farm for a god roll because that horizontal progression was removed from the game. So now you just had stacks and stacks of tokens that would just give you the same weapons you've got 15 times already that don't have random rolls, so they're useless. Iron Banner and Trials of the Nine suffered the same consequences to this design, not only both being much watered down versions of their D1 counterparts in terms of gameplay, but having armor and weapons with static rolls, most of which were not good, it was awful. Token systems everywhere, even on our world vendors. Factions were stripped of their great passive progression in D1, and were now part of a monthly event called Faction Rallies, which had an interesting premise, but fell flat on its face because now there was no reason to pledge to a faction or be loyal to one. Only now you could pledge based on what reward there was that week. And because one faction would always have an option better than the others, 80% of the player base would just pledge to that one in order to get the reward. There was no kind of loyalty or, hey, I rep new monarchy type of players anymore. Hawthorne in the tower oversaw the clan system, and she would give you free loot so long as you had clan mates who did specific activities. So you could get free trials and raid gear by never stepping foot in either activity. Just handing out endgame loot for nothing. The shader system was one of the worst changes, where in D1 you unlocked a shader and owned it forever, in D2 you had finite amounts of uses for them. Sure they could be applied to individual items now, but let's say you wanted a new look and you wanted to try out some new shaders, but still wanted the shader you had on in case you wanted to switch back to it. Well, too bad. Hope you get lucky with some Eververse loot boxes. And Eververse! Oh my god, Eververse was at its worst here. Not only were the best looking cosmetic items in there, but so were all the good ships, shaders, sparrows, and ghost shells. Bright Engram loot boxes could be purchased that would give you mods as well, furthering the pay to win narrative building at the time. And while you could earn Bright Engrams every few XP levels, Bungie was caught throttling players' XP gains in order to encourage more bright engram purchases. It was all so bad. Destiny 2 just didn't feel like a sequel. It felt like an expansion for Destiny 1, yet had its foundation completely replaced and stripped from all its depth. It was a hollow experience by comparison. Players were not happy, and within a month, players were leaving the game in droves and making various rants on Reddit, YouTube, and other places, and it wasn't long before Bungie knew they dropped the ball with D2, and in late October would make a statement regarding changes they would be focusing on making for the game moving forward. Better incentives for dedicated players to actually replay things like strikes, adventures, and lost sectors, crucible tweaks to both rewards and balance, as well as announcing private matches for early 2018, something Destiny 1 already had and was missing here for some reason, buffs to various exotics as they were all feeling pretty weak in the sandbox, and quite a few changes coming to the mod system. Now most of these changes wouldn't be coming anytime soon, like spring 2018 at the earliest, and the game was in absolute shambles, and all players could do was wait. And if content in the first DLC was good, then maybe we wouldn't notice the long wait. 
Get the expansion pass December 5th. Two epic adventures, one great value. Destiny 2 launch was a failure. Maybe not a financial failure, but in the eyes of many diehard Destiny 1 fans, it absolutely failed. In the first three weeks of its life, Destiny 2 has lost 78% of its player base. Right? Vanilla had an end game, but no story and, and like mm. and like campaign. Yep. They basically swapped that around with Destiny 2. Mm. The Destiny 2 now has a campaign, but absolutely no end game whatsoever. Yep. And that's why people are just dropping off. I'm sorry, <laughs> Destiny 1, at the end of it, after three years, was a f***ing awesome game, right? And I fully backed that mm, game. Mm. Destiny 2, I've been really clear, is but a lot of not people, a good game. A lot of it took players just three weeks to fall out of the honeymoon phase with Destiny 2. Once they realized there just really wasn't much here. The game was shallow and boring. Nothing like what we were promised or what we'd come to expect. Bungie had dropped the ball hard and it would take a lot of work to come back from this disaster of a launch. As previously mentioned, Bungie addressed some of the issues in a blog post saying they're working hard to figure out how to solve the problem of no endgame and a lack of reason to play. But this was just such a bad sign. Why after launch are you now asking these questions? Why throw away all that progress and improvements made to Destiny 1 over the course of three years? Why not take what you learned and build off of that instead of just giving us this garbage? About a week after this 78% drop off in player base, Curse of Osiris would be officially announced coming in December. Understandably, not too many people were excited for this one based on the horrible state of the game and the lack of trust players had in Bungie. Would Curse of Osiris be able to address some of our concerns, if any, regarding the state of the game? We'd just have to wait and see. And after three very long months, Curse of Osiris launched. Curse of Osiris is a tough one. Where do we begin with this? Being released just three months after launch, it wasn't very reasonable to expect Bungie to address all of the problems with the game, but man, they really didn't even address any of them. Actually, that's wrong. They addressed a few of them like grinding towards meaningful gear, adding heroic strikes, a Destiny 1 feature back to the game. Only two problems, how they addressed these things. When Bungie heard us say we wanted meaningful things to grind for, Bungie only heard, we just want to grind, not realizing that those two things are not the same. We grinded in Destiny 1 because it was worth it, and in Curse of Osiris we had the same terrible loot issues as vanilla, but now they took five times longer. All that changed was now we had to farm 15 public events, 10 strikes, and kill 500 enemies on wherever for random quest lines to give us pretty bad loot. Just busy work, uninteresting grinds that only existed to give the illusion of a grind. Heroic strikes were added back, something we'd requested. But not only were they paywalled behind the expansion cost, all they did was bump up a few of the health bar numbers for enemies and the bosses and call it a day. No modifiers were added like we had in Destiny 1, no strike scoring, no strike specific loot, nothing. Just increased health to the enemies. It was a joke. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. Let's take a look at what came with this $20 price tag. We received a new very short campaign consisting of six story missions, but only three were actual missions. One of them was a rerun of the Pyramidian Strike, but just with different dialogue to fit the new narrative. And the other two were just infinite forest repeats from the first time we went in there. There were technically two more missions that seemed a bit random, and that's because they were just strikes that would be reused and dumbed down for the campaign, before we actually played their real version in the strike playlist. The Infinite Forest, where most of our campaign time was spent, was a unique idea, executed in the worst way possible. Not only could you just run past all the enemies in most cases to open the next forest link, but it took so long. There was nothing interesting about it beyond its first impression of a somewhat procedurally generated area. The story focused on Osiris, who returns after many years of exile. Osiris discovers that the Vex from both past and future timelines are amassing on Mercury. We are sent by Ikora to find Osiris and determine if he can be a trusted ally in the fight against the Vex. And nearing the end of the campaign, after slogging through the missions, we encounter Panoptes, the Vex mind who oversaw the Infinite Forest and managed its simulations. And we took him out in no time. Osiris gives us a congratulations and his thanks and then he just disappears into the forest. Almost nothing is explained. 
nothing made any sense, and players just felt confused by the whole experience. And once the campaign was done, what else did we get? Well, two strikes were added, that were technically story missions, or vice versa, who knows. Chicken or the egg. Now the Garden World was by far one of the better strikes in the game, but the Tree of Probabilities was just another long run through the infinite forest until the final boss. We had a couple new adventures and lost sectors of course, added on the new Mercury destination which was absolutely tiny, three new crucible maps, a raid layer, Eater of Worlds, 12 exotic armor pieces, 5 exotic weapons, half of which weren't even new. Two of the weapons were just Destiny 1 weapons, and one more of them was just Red Death but in hand cannon form, so only really two new ones. And six of the 12 armor exotics were Destiny 1 exotics, and these exotics were locked behind the Curse of Osiris paywall. It was such a slap in the face after touting before launch that Destiny 1 weapons and armor needed to go away, and Destiny 2 would be a fresh start with all brand new gear to earn. But that really wasn't the case, the plan was just to resell us our old exotics from D1. Post campaign content was almost the exact same as vanilla. Like I said, Bungie didn't address any of our problems with the game in meaningful ways. And again, to give credit where it's due, it is unreasonable to expect them to in only 3 months with such a tight release schedule. But man did it feel awful. Now there were new things to chase post campaign, prophecy weapons that required you to grind X amount of strikes, public events adventures and so on to unlock, and man these things were definitely not a fun grind. Unlocking all the weapons would also unlock the Sagira shell. Brother Vance was the new vendor on Mercury who oversaw things like the prophecy weapon grind, and boy did they ruin his character here. In D1, Brother Vance was a mysterious disciple of Osiris, hinting at deep lore. His dialogue was shrouded in mystery. In Destiny 2, he became an utterly annoying Osiris fanboy. I mean, just take a look at these clips and compare. Ask yourself, what would you do if the speaker was proven a charlatan? If you seek Osiris, you must begin with the trials. What a strange place to find myself. What a strange time. Ah, here. If we're not ready when the moment comes, if we miss by seconds, darkness. I began as a guardian. I left to follow a different path. Perhaps you will too one day. He says the Nine are vulnerable every moment that they touch our world. I still can't believe you let Osiris return to the Infinite Forest without introducing me. I've studied all of Osiris's writings and written five works exploring his wisdom. Remind me again. How many Osiris books you've written? Bungie took their first steps to improve the value of repeat weapon drops in the game with Weapon Masterworks. This allowed weapons to get plus 10 stat increases to things like reload speed or stability, but because these Weapon Masterworks could be re-rolled, there still wasn't a reason to farm for one with your preferred masterwork, so they ended up kind of being a flop. The only real positive that came from this was orbs generating on multi-kills when you masterwork a weapon. Bungie also gave us their first raid layer, a mini raid set within a different part of the Leviathan. Now the final boss, Argos, was a really great fight. Much better than Kallus from Leviathan. It required a lot of teamwork, the arena was sick, and the soundtrack wasn't too bad. But as a raid experience as a whole, it was absolutely awful. Prior to Argos, you would play hopscotch for 5 minutes, clear a group of ads, and then BAM! You're at Argos. The loot was even more disappointing. The armor was the exact same as the prestige Leviathan armor, only now it has increased light level. And only two new weapons could be obtained, a grenade launcher and a shotgun, both of which were mediocre at best. And as good as the Argos fight was, this raid layer was a bit of a flop and did not impress. Loot and endgame was still a massive problem for the game. Just like with vanilla D2, after beating the Leviathan there just wasn't anything to do, and in Curse of Osiris after beating Argos, it was the same. But Eververse brought the goods, lots of new loot there, nearly 100 new items in fact. New shaders, sparrows, ghost shells, armor sets, ornaments, emotes, it's clear where all the effort went for this DLC. Now it would have been nice to have some of these ornaments, ghost shells, ship sparrows, or whatever be rewards for things like the raid layer, or part of some new strike specific loot. Destiny 1 did that, but of course, in Destiny 2, Eververse gets all of it. 
In a world where the brand new raid layer didn't even get a new armor set and was a reskin of the first raid, Eververse got three brand new armor sets. And if that doesn't tell you how much of a horrible impact Eververse has on loot in this game, then I don't know what to tell you. Curse of Osiris was an absolute flop, and after having 78% of players drop off after D2 Vanilla, Curse of Osiris helped sink those numbers even further down. Look, Destiny 1 Vanilla was far from perfect, but at least it had an endgame, and PvP was chaotic fun. And its first DLC, Dark Below, didn't make swift changes to the game either, but even it had an endgame. D2 had no endgame. Curse of Osiris had no endgame. PvP was locked to only two playlists, a quick play mosh pit, and competitive, which didn't even have a ranked system. With the release of Curse of Osiris, we had entered the dark age of the franchise. Where D2 launched touted 8.4 million players, that number was down to just over 600,000 just a couple weeks after Curse of Osiris launched. Many players who returned for Curse of Osiris dropped the game just as fast as they returned after playing it. And for those who stuck with the game through vanilla into Curse of Osiris, it was getting harder and harder to stick with it. Around this time we would get the Dawning Event, one of the most beloved events in Destiny 1. How did it convert to Destiny 2? Well, not great. The event was similar to Destiny 1 in that you did many quests that would give you items to gift to an NPC, and in return they'd give you a gift. Dawning Engrams were similar to these gifts, but of course could be purchased at Eververse, where most of the cool items were. New armor sets, new sparrows, ships, shaders, all that jazz. Mayhem Crucible was brought to the game for the event, which was a nice change of pace compared to the very slow, regular PvP playlist, and snowballs were added throughout the game in things like strikes, and were a fun little bonus. But with the current feeling players had with the state of the game, it kind of sucked a lot of the enjoyment out of the experience, especially with the core focus of the event just being more Eververse. Bungie would continue to nerf anything that resembled fun throughout the next month to much backlash from the community an even further nerf to shoulder charge comes to mind when I think of that. At every turn, Bungie was just making mistake after mistake until finally I think it dawned on them that something needs to change. Big changes, in fact, need to happen. And in January 2018, Bungie would address some of these issues in a blog post. They talked about adding improvements to raid armor stats, strike scoring, gameplay improvements, competitive PvP actually having incentives, bringing a 6v6 PvP playlist, rumble and mayhem game modes would be returning, and buffs to various exotics. Now this all sounded great, but man was this cycle just getting exhausting. Oh, I just, I don't know how to feel anymore. I really don't. Part of me just wants to be like, hooray, things are happening, yay, this is nice. But then part of me is like, well, we need to wait until DLC 2, probably even longer for any very substantial changes to happen, or how much credit can I give Bungie for re-implementing things that we already had that people liked. Putting in this stuff builds us back up to a good baseline, which is good, but then part of me is like, why are we rebuilding again? How many more times must we rebuild and go through game-altering fixes and changes? I do want to emphasize that the things we're getting are good. It's not like they're bad changes or fixes. They all improve the game. Bungie is listening, as they love to say. But it's just the feeling of, why did it have to come to this, that I think annoys a lot of people. The community is just tired of the waiting. And I think we're pretty tired of seeing so many things from Destiny 1 come back that shouldn't have gotten removed in the first place only to see them added back. It's exhausting. It is exhausting as a fan to continue to have to go through another set of big fixes to get the game back up to a good spot like we're just going through Destiny 1 again. Time went by slowly. We got strike scoring in Nightfalls in February with the release of Crimson Days, and was received to very little applause. But it was appreciated that the nightfall was no longer timed, and instead the timer counted up, and rewarded you for going quicker. As for the rest of Crimson Days, it went about how you'd expect. The 2v2 game mode from Destiny 1 made a return, and rewards were ghost shells and shaders. This wasn't all that different from Destiny 1's Crimson Days. There was a nice bonus of receiving double bride engrams during the event, but that was about it. Crimson Days came and went without much fanfare. But then one of the more important updates to the game would release in March, something called the Go Fast update. 
we have heard the feedback of my guns don't feel powerful enough. I don't feel powerful enough. And so we we looked at everything. We looked at the way you move, the way your supers come back, and especially the way the weapons play, right? We looked at hand cannons and, and sniper rifles and shotguns. We looked at the big montage weapons that you would see in Destiny 1, the crazy snipes and shotgun plays and even hand cannon plays, right? Uh, and so we, we went back to the board and went a, looked at everything and just said like, hey, here are a couple weapons that we feel like are in a really good spot. And by really good spot, they're they're kind of hot, right? Like they're, they're probably too hot for D2. In D1, people would have said, probably correctly, that means we would nerf those things. We would, they're nails that are sticking up out of the board and we would have hammered them back in to be even with the board. Uh, for this update, we did the opposite. We said, these things are hot. Let's bring everything else to them. And so we started raising each thing up, whether it be in PvE or PvP. We've also learned the lesson of don't sand the coolness down, right? Like leave the leave the jagged spikes of personality in there. So many buffs to all weapons in PvE. 50% buffs even to various weapons. Supers became faster and more lethal. Movement speed in general was buffed for all the jumps. Titans even had their shoulder charge back to being used for movement, like it was in Destiny 1. Abilities and super recharge rates were buffed to come back roughly 25% faster also. The game felt so much better thanks to this change. PvP was a bit more hectic. Rumble was added back to the game which was probably not as good as it could have been. Terrible spawns really soured its return. Trials of the Nine and Competitive had the radar disabled. One of the more controversial changes for sure. And it wasn't received too well if we're being totally honest. Iron Banner would be 6v6 control and was better received than the change to Trials. Sure, 6v6 was a bit more chaotic and less balanced, but despite a few people disliking it, it was more of a positive change than a negative one. Nightfall loot got some new additions. Strike-specific loot was back. Weapons like DFA, Silicone Neroma, and Duty Bound were added to the game. A few ships, sparrows, and ghost shells were added as well, but they left a lot to be desired. But any steps towards strike-specific loot was a positive one. Was the game better after this update? Yes but far from perfect. Many of the loot and endgame issues still remained, but that wasn't necessarily the goal of this update. And this update accomplished what it set out to do, increase our strength, bring back some of the fun, and give us a taste for what the future of the game would look like. A month later we would get our first look at the next DLC, Warmind. The reveal stream started with a look at Escalation Protocol, the new Court of Oryx or Archon's Forge style activity. Taking place on the new destination Mars, Escalation Protocol appeared to be a much more challenging version of those activities. Much higher light levels, a few more mechanics thrown in, and some worthwhile rewards. Escalation Protocol would bring three armor sets, one for each class, and a host of new weapons, most notably the shotgun, which would go on to become a fan favorite because of its raw strength. The latter half of the stream focused on Crucible and the addition of Valor and Glory ranks. Valor was a basic rank up system that granted you rewards from shacks the more points you got. Ranking up to maximum Valor allowed you to reset your progress and do it again for more rewards. Glory was exclusive to the competitive mode and acted more like a traditional rank system. You rank up for getting wins and you lose rank for losses. Reaching the maximum Glory rank would net you a unique reward. Redrix's Claymore we'd get a confirmation that private matches would be coming in Warmind, and they discussed some of the specifics about buffs to exotics. Things like Graviton Lance, which would become absolutely crazy once it was released. The reveal stream was more or less a success. Based on what they discussed and showed off, it looked like some of our initial concerns during launch were finally being addressed. Difficult endgame content with worthwhile loot to chase in regards to Escalation Protocol and PvP finally getting some much needed incentives in both quick play and competitive. More buffs across the board was a nice cherry on top. Warmind was looking like it might actually have something to bring players back. Maybe, but we'd have to wait till release to see if our hopes would be a reality. And two weeks later, on May 8th, it released. We got a brand new campaign focused around well, one too many things. Rasputin, Nocris, Zol, Anna Bray, and the Braytech backstory. The story was all over the place and it was only told in three story missions, as well as two strikes repurposed for story missions. It was awful, to put it lightly. The story and lore in the game at this point was in the gutter. 
there was absolutely no interest in the world of Destiny as far as the story goes. Lore channels on YouTube definitely felt the side effects of that at this time. The game was full of retcons and wasted story potential for characters like Zol and Nocris, who were relegated to strike bosses, and Rasputin was now on Mars for some reason. Anna Bray's character was written in such a way that kind of ruined the cool lore surrounding her from Destiny 1. And, yeah, the story was not great at all. The strikes as far as gameplay goes were much improved compared to the rest of the game. The Knocker Strike is one of my personal favorites in that regard, and the Zol Strike was quite a spectacle. But again, these characters deserve to be part of the same raid or something because what we got instead was just disappointing. PlayStation players got an extra strike, the Insight Terminus, which was on par for the rest of Destiny 2 strikes, meaning it wasn't all that special. Two Crucible maps were added to the game, the Mars Destination along with Escalation Protocol, and another raid layer set in the Leviathan, Spire of Stars. Warmind continued the trend of bringing back Destiny 1 exotics. Six of the 11 exotic armor pieces were from Destiny 1, and three of the six exotic weapons were Destiny 1 weapons. Bungie took some more steps in creating a better balance between grind and meaningful loot chases. Power levels were increased to 385 with the introduction of a more strict soft cap being 340. Getting up to level 370 would be the next hurdle, and then a much more end game focused grind in order to get 385. Clan engrams were nerfed to only provide rewards up to 340, meaning players would actually have to play the game for some of the better loot drops. Reaching maximum power level actually meant something now especially with the addition of Escalation Protocol. The enemies in that activity were very high level, so getting as high as possible was almost required if you wanted to snag some of the best loot. Things like exotic weapon catalysts were added that would provide bonuses to weapons after doing a bit of grinding, and were a great addition that brought more meaning to those exotics. And speaking a bit more on Escalation Protocol, it was fantastic. Finally, a post-campaign grind actually worth leveling and working towards. The armor and weapons were top tier in the game, and the activity was always challenging, even when you were matching the level. Escalation Protocol gave players a lot of hope that the game was heading in the right direction. Bungie would also add some more difficult exotic quests. One for a new scout rifle called Polaris Lance, which was similar to Necrochasm from Destiny 1. It required being leveled from a legendary version of the weapon into an exotic through some grinding. Worldline Zero required some collectible farming, and Sleeper Simulant had quite the lengthy, almost too grindy questline to obtain. The raid layer Spire of Stars was an improvement over Eater of Worlds, having a bit tougher mechanics and an actual jumping puzzle, as well as the hardest raid boss in the game, maybe even the franchise up to that point. Valkaur was a real bitch and required the most perfect execution. It was well designed for sure, but not necessarily fun at least in most of the community's eyes. Spire of Stars had a much lower completion rate than Leviathan or Eater of Worlds, which was probably due to its difficulty, but also due to it not really being that fun or worth running. And that'd be because of the loot, which was underwhelming on all accounts. The sidearm was pretty bad. The fusion rifle was alright, but the armor was basically the same as Eater of Worlds. Another raid where there's no real new armor. A few months after Warmind's release, we'd get quite the unexpected surprise. The Whisper of the Worm exotic mission. A mission that is basically akin to a dungeon these days, that was timed. It was filled with jumping puzzles, secrets, and a very tough challenge. But the reward was ever so sweet. Whisper of the Worm, which was basically the pre-nerfed version of the Black Spindle, aka Black Hammer from Destiny 1. The Whisper of the Worm mission would be a massive win for both Bungie and the players and it set another standard for more things to come like it in the future of Destiny 2. As a whole, Warmind was a success. Was it perfect? Absolutely not. The story was awful, Faction Rallies, Trials, and Iron Banner were all still very lacking, Strikes were in a bad spot, Eververse was still invasive, and various other aspects of the game were still very frustrating. Overall though, Warmind was received positively, especially to those who were avid players that enjoyed Destiny as a hobby. It delivered where it needed to most. Gameplay, PvP, and loot. We'd get one final surprise event before the fall expansion. Solstice of Heroes. This event would be focused around the Red War campaign missions, but on higher difficulty. Pretty much legendary campaign difficulty like we have now with the Witch Queen. You work through various challenges to achieve a legendary gear set 
and Moments of Triumph style objectives would let you unlock other vanity items like ghost shells and sparrows. Solstice of Heroes was an event that left Year 1 of Destiny 2 in a much better place than it was throughout the first half of the year. The game was taking the right steps, but there was more work to be done, and players now had reason to be excited for the fall expansion. Backing up a little bit prior to the release of the Whisper of the Worm mission in July, we'd get our first look at the fall expansion for Destiny 2, Forsaken. It was revealed to us yet again with another Bungie livestream, beginning with a brand new Vidoc. If we take everything we learned from Destiny 1, including the expansions like Taken King, take everything we learned from Destiny 2 on top of what we've learned from the fans and the players, put that all together in one package, uh, we think that's what Forsaken's gonna be, and we're super excited about it. The Vidoc began showing off one of the new destinations, the Tangled Shore, a Wild West-inspired extension of the reef, and filled inside the area, a new enemy type, the Scorn, who bared resemblance to the Fallen, but actually a lot more unique than anything we'd seen before. Siva and Taken were absolutely great additions in Destiny 1. But the Scorn appeared to be much more unique. They would be led by seven barons, the leaders of the Scorn. We'd get a brief tease about the setup for the story, a prison break in the Prison of Elders, and Cade 6 would be involved. Next, we'd get a look at some of the sandbox and core system changes. The weapon system was being reverted back to the Destiny 1 weapon system, but expanded on, allowing three shotguns if you wanted. Players could already imagine the combination options. And on top of that, Random rules on weapons made a return from Destiny 1, and new additions to masterwork options which would bring more investment back to the weapons. Supers were up next. Nine new ones were added. They looked so good, and it's clear fun was in mind when designing them. A new weapon type was added, combat bows. Which who can be mad at that? Everybody loves bows in video games. Then we saw Gambit. The hype levels were very high for this. PvPvE is something we've always wanted in Destiny, and players thought if we ever saw it, it would be something like the Dark Zone from The Division. But Bungie surprised us with Gambit, and it looked even better than we imagined a PvPvE mode looking. Slaying as fast as possible in the PvE, and defeating opponents when invading for PvP. Next we got a look at the new raid, which Joe Blackburn cited having the most bosses they'd ever had in a raid before, and it was set on the new Destination. The Dreaming City, an area that would also be an endgame patrol space filled with secrets and lore to discover, similar to the Dreadnought. They also explained that the Dreaming City would be a dynamic destination, affected by players' actions in the raid over time. We'd get a look at Collections, the next major quality of life improvement to the game that showed all your previously obtained weapons, armor, and vanity items, as well as acting as the exotic kiosks from Destiny 1. Triumphs were added which were like permanent record books from the past, and extended to each destination and activity in the game. Titles for those triumphs were added to the game to show off your achievements under your gamer tag. And most importantly, the Vidoc ended with Bungie saying that Forsaken is being made for the players who love Destiny, those who play it the most, and that pursuits for those players would be the focus. The rest of the reveal stream expanded on those sentiments. The developers were taking the feedback they'd received during year one and addressing all of it in major ways. Endgame challenge and pursuit would be a big focus for the Forsaken expansion. And towards the end of the stream we'd even get a hint at what would come after Forsaken. Cue the annual pass. Three separate releases throughout the year. Less story focused like Curse of Osiris and Warmind, and instead would be endgame focused. Building more long term replayability into the game as the year goes by. We'd get very few details besides that, and their names would be changed for the full releases to be called Season of the Whichever, rather than these DLC style names. The stream would end with a look at the 2.0 update which was filled with quality of life changes. Fast back forward a few months, past the Whisper mission and Solstice of Heroes, and September 4th would arrive. The Forsaken launch was here. Forsaken brought us a brand new, very large campaign. It had five unique missions, which is roughly the same as previous DLCs, however the campaign also included six more missions in the form of Baron Hunts, where we would be hunting down various Scorn leaders and these missions took us to unique locations and could actually be pretty tough thanks to their higher power level. 
and a few of these barren hunts were filled with some awesome storytelling contained within each mission. Like the Mindbender, learning how to create his own throne world. Each mission of the Forsaken campaign was well varied, taking us all across the Tangled Shore, and wrapping up with a few final missions on the Dreaming City. The story in Forsaken was a massive step up from Vanilla, Curse, and Warmind. The E3 2018 trailer spoiled a big part of the storyline by showing us that Cage 6 would be killed, but I can't deny that that trailer definitely sparked a lot of interest in Player's Return, I know it did for me. And as the story began, the prison break in the Prison of Elders ensued. Cade 6 or Hunter Vanguard would be killed by Aldrin Sav, and we were hell-bent on revenge. A very simple revenge story plotline that would evolve into something much bigger. In our quest for revenge, we learned of the Scorn, the undead fallen race, how and why the Scorn chose to follow Aldrin, and deeper lore surrounding the Awoken race, and the curse being brought upon the Dreaming City by an Ahamkara Wish Dragon. All of this story had much more connections to the Taken King story from Destiny 1 in major ways. And honestly, you could exclude Red War, Curse, and Warmind from your memory, and the Forsaken campaign would fit perfectly as a sequel to the Taken King. Forsaken in general finally felt like the sequel to Destiny 1 we should have got from the beginning. Aldrin being possessed by Riven, Marasov's absence until the post-campaign questlines, and new characters like Spider, a fallen gluttonous crime lord who was a total badass, and more interactions with a fan favorite character, Petra Venge, who just like she did in House of Wolves, steals the show once again with another great performance. Losing Cade 6 was tough, but his death set the tone for the expansion. Forsaken was not just a revenge story, it was a return to the tone of Destiny 1. The grittier, high stakes narrative was back in Destiny, and after Destiny 2's very adolescent storytelling in its first year, the return to this style was a welcome one. Forsaken brought four brand new strikes. The Hollowed Lair, where you slay the fanatic Thikrul, Aldrin Sov's right-hand scorn leader. Warden of Nothing, which had us returning to the Prison of Elders from Destiny 1, only this time much more expanded upon and fleshed out. Warden of Nothing was the ultimate homage to the area we loved from Destiny 1, and because the campaign all began with the prison break inside this Prison of Elders, it tied in perfectly. The Corrupted, which was a Dreaming City strike that unlocked after the world's first completion of the Last Wish raid, where we would free another tech witch, Sedia, from her Taken Corruption. And lastly, the Broodhold strike, which was a PS4 exclusive. In this strike, we'd venture deep into a crashed Hive warship, destroy the nest inside of it, and defeat the Brood Queen. All of these strikes were top tier, a major improvement over anything in Destiny 2 at the time. They were full of so much story, intense gameplay, and were massive in scale. Two brand new destinations which even to this day are some of the best we've ever gotten. The Tangled Shore was the extension to the reef we've always wanted. Ever since Destiny 1 we wanted to explore the shores of the reef, see what's out there. And with Forsaken, we got to do just that. Asteroids tethered together, enemy hideouts, mysteries around every corner, and truly just a beautiful location. We also got the Dreaming City, the endgame patrol zone that was filled with secrets. And to quote Bungie, it's as if the Dreadnought in the Vault of Glass had a baby, left it on the doorstep of Peter Jackson, and raised it on his own. The Dreaming City was an awoken homeworld, having awe-inspiring architecture, magical crystal caves, and towering mountain ranges. The Dreaming City would also be where most of the post-campaign content would lie. Things like the Petrovenge missions that would send you to discover more secrets in the Dreaming City, and would end with us communicating with Mara Sav through the Oracle and some more secret missions that had us entering the Taken Throne world. And like Bungie promised, the Dreaming City was dynamically changing. Each week, the Taken Corruption would get worse after the curse cycle began, after Riven was killed in the raid. And not only would the Dreaming City look different, but new quests, public events, and secrets would open up each week of the cycle. Also on the Dreaming City, we would get another public event style horde mode similar to Escalation Protocol, Blindwell. It was fun, but not near as good as Escalation Protocol. It might have had a better reception if there were some more incentives to run the activity. It didn't have its own unique armor set or weapons like Escalation Protocol, which was a bit of a shame. You still got loot, but it was just the Dreaming City weapons and armor, which were great on their own, but you could get that loot from any activity on the destination. Forsaken also brought us the first ever dungeon to the game, the Shattered Throne. A three-man mini raid-like experience filled with bosses, puzzles, and secrets. The reception to the Shattered Throne was overwhelmingly positive. 
the dungeon experience was a perfect middle ground between strikes and raids, and would prove to be a very important piece of content for the future of the franchise following its success. The only shame about Shattered Throne was like Blindwell, it also didn't have its own weapons and armor sets, with the exception of the Wish Ender exotic bow. And finally, Last Wish, the most expansive raid in Destiny history. Now Bungie did a lot of hyping this raid up prior to release, and they absolutely did not underdeliver at all with this one. The Last Wish raid succeeded for a number of reasons. Number one being its direct tie into the narrative of the expansion. This is something Tiggin King and Rise of Iron did really well with their raids, but with D2 Vanilla, Leviathan was still Cabal themed, but there was no mention of Kallus in the game prior to hopping aboard the Leviathan. He was hinted at in a collector's edition book, and that was it, so it felt a bit disconnected, until we finally pieced things together a bit later in the lore. And the raid layers for both Curse of Osiris and Warmind continued the Kallus story and were not themed around their expansion content at all. Last Wish would correct this issue by being a massive quest to save the Dreaming City. Saving the corrupted tech witches, defeating champions, unlocking the vault to Riven, and finally defeating Riven and destroying her heart. She was the one who possessed Aldrin to begin with and set off the events of the entire expansion. Riven was a badass villain, and Last Wish was a badass raid. The encounters were the most complex we'd ever seen, and the challenge to complete it was the highest it's ever been. Worlds First took over 18 hours to complete, and only two teams have the 24 hour emblem. I mean, whatever they did, we didn't off. do it in the first day. Feels bad. Literally too much. But you guys, you guys Last Wish would go down as probably the best raid in Destiny history. Riven legit especially was the best boss fight we'd ever had. Forsaken also brought some content for the Crucible. Four new Crucible maps, three of which have been vaulted since Beyond Light, which is a shame because they were pretty good maps. Breakthrough, a brand new game mode was added where you fought to hack each other's vaults. Sort of a tug of war style mode that bared some resemblance to Salvage from Destiny 1. It was a bit imbalanced and wasn't too popular. Bungie would remove the mode from the competitive playlist within just a few weeks and it kind of died off after that. Similar to Redrix's Claymore and Warmind Season 3, Forsaken Season of the Outlaw brought some new pinnacle weapons to chase. Luna's Howl and Not Forgotten. Luna's Howl and Not Forgotten were S tier PvP hand cannons that required quite the grind to obtain of course inside the competitive playlist, but these weapons made the grind worth it. Iron Banner would get some updates and changes, power level now matters in the game mode like they did in Destiny 1, and it would receive a brand new armor set and some weapons, as well as having bounties. Oh yes, Forsaken added bounties back to the game from Destiny 1, and they were everywhere. Trials of the Nine was shelved for now, removed from the game until Bungie could figure out what to do with it. Kinda strange, but not too many people cared since Trials was in a pretty bad spot prior to Forsaken. I would have liked to see it stick around to be honest. Give us a chance to play around with it in the new sandbox, but Bungie would go a different route as we'll discuss in a future episode. Gambit would be added into the game and would quickly become a favorite amongst players. I know, I know, we all hate Gambit now, but there was a time where everyone was loving this mode. Gambit brought four maps on release, two of which have been vaulted, rest in peace Cathedral of Stars you were my favorite, and there was so much to work towards in Gambit. It had its own armor set, nine exclusive weapons, the dredgen title to earn, and the malfeasance exotic weapon which required you to kill a rare version of a primeval, the meatball, as he was known. He had an incredibly rare spawn rate so the pressure was on if you were lucky enough to fight him. I grinded the hell out of Gambit, I'm talking five or six hours almost every night. A fully complete game mode that was a great addition to Destiny, and another pillar for the core activities. Forsaken brought a bunch of exotics, 12 exotic weapons, 4 of which were Destiny 1 weapons, and 12 exotic armor pieces, all of which were brand new. Forsaken exotics were another upgrade compared to the previous Destiny 2 exotics. Most of them were overpowered, which was imbalanced, but was fun. And that's really what's important here. The game was fun again. Exotics were actually exotic again. Loot was in a much better spot now. Forsaken brought a massive world loot pool refresh, accompanied by random rolls to weapons and armor. And I think it goes without saying how much good this does for replayability for the game. 
Leveling became a bit grindier. Infusing your armor was expensive. Enhancement cores, legendary shards, planetary materials, all of it was required to infuse. So you had to pay a bit more attention to what you wanted to infuse and thereby made leveling matter a bit more, which was a good thing. Core activities and endgame quests would now provide you with powerful gear drops that would give you those higher power level drops. A core system change that would stand the test of time as it's still what we have in the game today, save a few tweaks and changes. The weapon slot change gave players ultimate freedom over how they wanted to play, and most players chose to play like the Destiny 1 system. One primary, one secondary, and one heavy. But the options were there to mix and match how you wanted. There was much less focus on Eververse, it was still there, but much less intrusive. The Prismatic Matrix allowed you to get most of the new items, so at Forsaken launch, Eververse was tolerable. Forsaken was not just a success, but an absolute slam dunk. It was make or break for Bungie in a similar way that Taken King was for Destiny 1. But Forsaken even more so, because we'd already gone through the overhauls and changes for Destiny 1, and people didn't want to do it again unless Forsaken absolutely exceeded expectations. And thankfully, it did. Again, Forsaken was a proper sequel to Destiny 1. Destiny 2, because of the quality of life changes, basically reverted back to Destiny 1, but expanded on them with things like the weapon system, collections, triumphs, titles, and more. The sheer amount of content that came in Forsaken is still the most amount of content we've ever received in an expansion. Two destinations, four strikes, four crucible maps, 12 exotic weapons, 12 exotic armor pieces, the largest and best raid, a massive loot pool refresh, and a brand new core activity with Gambit. Forsaken was amazing and absolutely saved Destiny 2. Players were returning to the game in mass and would be looking forward. The game's foundation was better than it had ever been, and players were excited to see what would come next. Forsaken was Bungie's magnum opus. It delivered on all fronts. Content, system changes, loot, sandbox, exotics, and the story. And the expansion would keep us busy and occupied as a community for quite a while. In October 2018, we'd get our first live event following the expansion. Festival of the Lost. Now, Festival of the Lost didn't come in year one of Destiny 2, so this would be its first debut in Destiny 2. So, what'd we get? The activity that came along with this event was the Haunted Forest, finally something useful for the Infinite Forest concept in Curse of Osiris. The Haunted Forest feels like the type of content that the Infinite Forest was designed for. This activity had you clearing out waves of enemies before defeating a boss, and the forest would reset, getting harder and harder with each boss killed by giving you negative modifiers. The reward for playing this activity was of course festival masks like we'd seen in Destiny 1, but these masks gave you perks that would help you in the Haunted Forest. Also, you could earn the Horror Story Auto Rifle, which had Rampage and Zen Moment, so a pretty decent auto rifle. The festival also brought a host of new triumphs to work towards for the event, and of course, quite a few new cosmetics for the cash shop. And thankfully, this time it wasn't hard to acquire most items with just Bright Dust, and double engrams would be earned during the event. This first Festival of the Lost in Destiny 2 would be received pretty well as one of the better live events we've seen. On par, if not better than the Festival of the Lost in Destiny 1. Thunderlord would also make a return during the festival in a quest that had us returning to the Cosmodrome from Destiny 1. It was part of a long, time-gated questline that revolved around finding who killed Master Ives, the Cryptarch from the Reef, in Destiny 1. Players definitely didn't like the time-gated questline, as most players just dislike time-gating as a whole, and I think if it were wrapped up during the Festival of the Lost instead of dragging on for the next few weeks, it would have likely been received a bit better. Still, it was nice to have Thunderlord back in the game, and it signaled that, hey, machine guns are back in Destiny. But in December, we'd be getting our first piece of content from the Annual Pass, Black Armory. This was Bungie's first attempt at the drip feed style content that would become the norm for the next four years of the franchise following the fall expansion. And initially, players really didn't like it. In fact, Black Armory on day one didn't allow you to even hop in and play the new content because we were so underleveled. It took a few days of grinding powerful drops and old content before we could try out the Valunder Forge. We would only have access to the Valunder Forge for the first few days of Black Armory, and despite having a roadmap that showed off we'd be getting the rest of them in the future, players just felt a little bit underwhelmed initially. 
A few days after release, we'd get access to the Gofanon Forge, and almost two weeks later we'd get access to the third forge, the Izanami Forge. Now the forges were fun pieces of content to grind, but only for a little while. The new loot from the forges is really what made players want to keep running them. The legendary weapons were some of the best we've ever seen. Hammerhead, Blast Furnace, Tartara Gaze, and four more could be obtained through the forges, and were all really good weapons. Hammerhead was the first machine gun we'd seen in Destiny 2 except for Thunderlord, and it was so nice to have this weapon type back in the game. The exotic weapons were random drops tied to each forge, and they were good. Layman Arc, Jotun, both staple exotics that still see a lot of use in the game today. A few more weeks would go by and we'd get the Niobe Labs Secret Quest. Initially players speculated that Niobe Labs would be a dungeon or something, and Bungie was pretty tight-lipped about what Niobe Labs was prior to its release. But what we got instead was something even crazier. One of the most challenging puzzles ever created that would unite the Destiny community for 81 hours in trying to solve it. It involved surviving waves of ads while trying to decipher symbols that could only be seen with specific weapons. Unfortunately, this puzzle took longer than intended by Bungie because of a glitch that prevented players from finding a missing piece of the puzzle once they reached level 7. After Bungie noticed this bug, they would provide players with a clue on their Twitter page. 81 hours later, and Niobe Labs was solved and in turn would unlock the final forge, the Bergugia Forge, where we would fight and defeat Spider's brother, Civix. However, because the puzzle was taking so long to unlock, Bungie would end up decoupling access to the Bergugia Forge from the puzzle and gave players access to it prior to its completion. Various other post secrets would open up after Niobe Labs was completed, like the very grindy mysterious box quest that would wrap up Ada 1's storyline and grant you with a new emblem and the Izanagi's Burden exotic sniper rifle. And finally, let's talk about the raid, Scourge of the Past. This was released alongside the Gofanon Forge, and it was much larger than the raid layers, but much smaller than Last Wish. Scourge of the Past was set within the last city, which was so cool. And the story was pretty interesting too. Traversing through the last city, defeating fallen combatants led by civics who were trying to break into an old black armory vault within the quarantine section of the city. We had to go in and stop that from happening as requested by Ada-1. And Scourge of the Past as a whole was a very fun raid. It was fast paced and action focused. Bungie said they took inspiration from the Wrath of the Machine raid in Destiny 1 when creating Scourge, and I think it shows. The opening, the Sparrow race, destroying Insurrection Prime with a tank, and riding your Sparrow around the whole arena. It was definitely one of the more unique boss fights we've ever had. The loot from Scourge of the Past was also really good. The shotgun threat level in particular was sought after because it could roll with Trench Barrel, and it was basically a kinetic version of the Ikelos shotgun from Warmind. Anarchy the Raid Exotic would prove to be one of the best exotics in the game, as well as being used in almost every raid or nightfall going forward. As for the core activities, Iron Banner got a new armor set, and we received three new pinnacle weapons to grind for. In Forsaken, we had three PvP pinnacle weapons with Luna's Howl, Not Forgotten, and Redrix's Broadsword. But in Black Armory, each core activity would get their own pinnacle weapon. The Loaded Question Fusion Rifle for the Vanguard, Breakneck for Gambit, and Mountaintop for Crucible. All three of these weapons were just incredible. If you were around before sunsetting in Beyond Light, then you know just how powerful these guns were. Breakneck paired with the Loaded Question was a staple for my loadout for quite a while. And of course, Mountaintop absolutely ran PvP and PvE content and would continue that way for many months ahead. These weapons were basically exotics, as their perks were completely unique to these weapons and were insanely powerful. These pinnacle weapons were likely part of the reason Sunsetting was introduced because their power exceeded every other legendary in the game. After the bulk of the Black Armory content, we'd also get a quest for the last word hand cannon. The Draw, which was a very tedious questline requiring a lot of drawn out grinding, but the final mission was pretty cool lore wise and required you to have duels against the Hive. The Dawning made a return again this year and would be much improved over the 2017 version of the event. It brought us Evil Levante's Baking Oven, which you could use to bake treats and deliver to various NPCs who would grant you with rewards. Like the new Avalanche Machine Gun and the Glimmer Slay Sparrow. And this was just fun, man. Snowballs made a return to the activities and Eververse got some new cosmetics. And for the first time ever, we'd get multiplayer emotes. In February, we'd see Crimson Day's return, which remained almost the same as last year. But this time you could earn a new bow, which came with Rapid Hit a perk that isn't found on any other bow. 
Black Armory and the live event content by the end of the season would be some of the best content we'd ever gotten in the context of a seasonal content drop. Despite getting off to a slow start and the annoyance of the new drip feed style release, Black Armory was a great time to be playing Destiny. Now something else would happen during this season. Something that would change the future of Destiny forever. Something big has happened. Bungie has split from Activision. <laughs> Activision had recently stated that Forsaken didn't meet sales expectations shortly after it had released, so I'm sure this might have had something to do with the split, and I'm also sure Bungie themselves wanted to part ways with Activision and retain the rights to the Destiny franchise, which they did. Now would this be good for the future? Would this be bad for the future? Only time would tell. Another month would go by before we get the next piece of annual pass content. Season of the Drifter releasing in March. A season focused all around the Drifter and a bit more about his backstory and character, meaning that this season was all about Gambit. At release, we'd get Gambit Prime, a more challenging version of the Gambit game mode that would have only one round instead of three rounds in a regular Gambit match, along with two new Gambit maps. New mechanics were added to every aspect of the mode. Draining moats from the enemy team by sending multiple blockers over, envoys would now be required to defeat in order to get rid of an immunity shield on the boss, and a damage well you'd have to step in in order to get a buff that would grant you the ability to damage the primeval. There would be more of an emphasis on the roles of players that were introduced with some new armor sets. The Collector, Reaper, Sentry, and Invader armor sets that provided unique bonuses that would make players in those roles much stronger. Among other things, collectors had the ability to collect 20 motes and send over a giant blocker. Reapers could debuff and mark high value targets for your allies. Sentries did bonus damage to take in and standing near the bank would heal them. And finally the invader which regenerated primary and special ammo when invading and locked the bank when you invaded, as well as drain motes if you stood near the bank. These were incredibly powerful armor sets that really changed the lethality of each player. And if you were like me who had a set gambit team that knew their roles, you could be unstoppable with your efficiency. And how could you earn this gear? In the next new piece of content, The Reckoning. This was a PvE horde mode style activity that you could bring your entire gambit team with, so just four players. And it was pretty challenging, but only on tier 2 and 3 which were released a bit later in the season. And because of the time gated drip feed content, it also time gated all of your progression as well, as you couldn't get a full gear set for Gambit Prime until all the tiers were out. This, of course, again, wouldn't be received too well because players hate time gated content, and even more so, time gated progression. Especially at the time. This drip feed style was new to the game with the annual pass, and players were not quite taking a liking to it. It was just frustrating more than anything. There were a lot of new weapons between Gambit Prime and the Reckoning, which weren't too bad. And farming tier 3 Reckoning was tough, especially thanks to the design of the area which allowed you to be knocked off the edge super easy. But Reckoning wasn't a bad game mode, just maybe a little bit tiresome since the gameplay loop of the season was play some Gambit Prime matches, then go do a Reckoning. Play Gambit Prime, then do a Reckoning. If Reckoning wasn't required to level up your new Gambit gear and instead was a separate activity you could grind for different reasons, it probably wouldn't have been disliked as much because yes, it didn't take long for players to share their frustrations with the activity. And Gambit Prime as a whole was also not loved, but it really depended on the type of player that you were. Me, I liked it, but probably not as much as the original Gambit because 1. I disliked health gated boss fights and the need for a damage well to damage the boss, and 2. It was just so much sweatier. It was like a match of Trials of Osiris every time you played. A bit later in the season we'd get Invitations of the Nine, which was how the seasonal story would be told. Each week, Xur would bring an Invitation of the Nine for purchase and would send you around the solar system to grind out various checklists. The story bits were pretty cool and interesting, but from a gameplay perspective they were basically just go kill some enemies type of quests, so they were pretty much like a big weekly bounty. We'd get the Thorn Exotic quest, and very similar to Black Armory's last word quest line, it was another tedious grind fest, until at the end which would have you running a much more difficult version of the Sabathun Song Strike. Enemies would have triple burn applied for their damage types, and it was 10 power levels higher than the max power at the time. You would need to defeat three named knight enemies, a bit of a callback to the Destiny 1 exotic sword quest lines that had something very similar. Season of the Drifter would bring some new exotics to the game as well. One armor piece for each class, Liar's Handshake for Hunters, Stronghold Gauntlets for the Titan, and Getaway Artist for the Warlocks. 
We'd also get some new pinnacle weapons. The Oxygen SR3 for the Vanguard, 21% Delirium for Gambit, and the Recluse for Crucible. Now the Vanguard and Gambit weapons weren't bad at all, but Recluse stole the show for this season. An SMG that became yet another staple for all loadouts in PvE content. It came with an insanely buffed version of Rampage that increased damage with any weapon kills. And yeah, <laughs> this was a crazy weapon. And like last season, Iron Banner would also see a new armor set. Season of the Drifter was not universally loved by the community, in fact a lot of people disliked it a lot. I didn't necessarily love it, I much preferred Black Armory and its content offering. Plus Black Armory brought a brand new raid. And if you weren't a fan of Gambit, then you probably didn't like Season of the Drifter at all. And I wouldn't blame you because Power Emma was such an annoyance in the game mode. But Season of the Drifter did do some things right, and it did address some of our issues with Black Armory. At release, it gave players Power Surge bounties that allowed us to increase our level enough to access the seasonal content day one, which was an improvement over Black Armory. Also, private matches were added for Gambit. Before we'd get the next annual pass content drop, we'd see two more events in the game. One of them was Arc Week, a week focused around using Arc damage for everything. Bounties would be Arc focused, modifiers increased Arc damage, and the Thunderlord exotic quest made a return for this week. All for the purpose of trying out our Arc subclasses after they recently received a buff, as well as adding some new Arc specific emotes. It was a bit of a weird little event, but uh, yeah. Moving on. In mid-April we'd get the spring event, the Revelry. This event had us heading back into the Infinite Forest to complete basically the same activity as the Haunted Forest, but of course with this new flowery springtime theme. It brought along a quest for a new exotic weapon, the Arbalist, that would require completing challenges in the Verdant Forest. The new armor from the event, paired with an item called Reveler's Tonic, gave us increased recharge rate buffs to abilities, and man was it crazy. Grenade spam went hard across all activities, PvP was effectively unplayable for the event, but the revelry was a fun event, and its only failure was not allowing players to keep the armor glows permanently, as this kind of defeated the whole purpose of grinding for them. And this would be the only time the event took place in Destiny 2, probably because it was unbelievably unbalanced for the game. In May, we'd get a pretty nice surprise. The Zero Hour mission, which was very much akin to the Whisper of the Worm mission we got back in Warmind. The quest began with Mithrax, who we meet in the basement of the farm, and he sends us on a quest to stop the fallen House of Devil's loyalists from stealing Siva Tech from the Cryptarch Vault inside our old Destiny 1 tower. This mission, like the Whisper mission, was great. Another timed, dungeon-like experience filled with some fun jumping puzzles, shortcuts, and memorable moments. Nobody can forget Trevor and the horror that filled inside you when he rounded the corner. That's rough. Fuck. Please don't turn down this way. Please don't turn down this way. Don't turn. Get away from me! Get away! Get away! Get away! Get away! Get away! Holy f! Holy f! Shit. Oh my god. <laughs> no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Outbreak Perfected would become one of the best exotic weapons in the game, and for the upcoming Season of Opulence, we'll see why. And Season of Opulence would be the final content drop for the annual pass and would arrive in June. First up, we'd get the Menagerie, a six player match made activity that would have a few unique mechanics for each encounter, but much less toned down from raid mechanics to accompany the match made nature of the activity. This was Bungie's first ever six player match made activity, and would become a wild success, mainly because of the loot it brought, and how you could obtain that loot. The Menagerie brought an item called the Chalice of Opulence, which allowed you to unlock runes and put them in the chalice. Once you completed a Menagerie run, you'd get whichever item you were specking out for in your chalice, meaning you could farm god rolls for things like Ostringer or Beloved endlessly until you got what you wanted. The Menagerie was a more engaging activity than the Reckoning or Forges of the previous two seasons. It had a bit more objective style play that rewarded you for going faster, and the best part was, the bulk of Season of Opulence content was pretty much all playable right from the get go. The Crown of Sorrow raid launched the same day as the season release, and was initially met with much applause. And besides the overly long first encounter, the two final boss fights were great. Also, it would be the first raid ever released with the contest mode modifier for day one raids. It was challenging in all the right ways, and prevented players from stacking bounties and just boosting power levels as fast as possible to get an edge for the world's first race. Contest mode brought all players to the same level, making the race an equal fight. 
The armor in Crown of Sorrow is some of the best looking armor in the game, and a few of the weapons were noteworthy, but definitely not as good as the Scourge of the Past weapons. The exotic Taraba left a lot to be desired, especially compared to Anarchy. The next few weeks would bring the rest of the seasonal content. Mid-June, another Menagerie boss would arrive, as well as a new Iron Banner questline that would reward you with a complete set of Season 7 Iron Banner armor that would be powerful drops. A week later, Menagerie would get a Heroic mode which brought weekly modifiers rotating per boss, as well as booting your fire team to orbit if all team members died. Heroic Menagerie also granted you a fully masterworked item upon your first completion of the week. And if it was a bad roll or something, then you just got 7 free enhancement cores, which were a fairly scarce resource at the time. As well as the Izanagi's Burden Catalyst that increased damage by 20%, so there was quite an incentive to play the heroic mode. Season of Opulence brought some new exotics as well. Kepri Sting for the Hunters, Astrocyte Verse for the Warlocks, and Peregrine Greaves for the Titan. Three new pinnacle weapons would be added as well, just like the last two seasons. Wendigo for the Vanguard, Hush for Gambit, and Revoker for the Crucible. Once again, the Crucible weapon was the best of the three. Next would be the Lumina Exotic Questline in July, which, if you've noticed, would be the third hand cannon released in this year. Each season so far had an exotic hand cannon quest, and Lumina's would be pretty much the exact same. Tedious checklist style grinding, then a unique version of the Will of the Thousand Strike that required you to have the Rose hand cannon equipped in order to shoot crystals in the strike. Lumina was a decent hand cannon, but at the time wasn't hailed as a must-have. Its perks were unique, granting healing and damage buffs to teammates was nice, but most PvE content was already so easy that it wasn't really necessary. The Tribute Hall would be added in July, which was a damage tester's dream come true. It allowed you to unlock certain enemy types and use them as test dummies in this firing range. Certainly something the game desperately needs back, and something we'd all love to see return. The Bad Juju would make a return as well and had a quest related to the Tribute Hall and a mission in the Taken Realm in order to unlock. Moments of Triumph came the same day as well with some new cosmetics and a title to earn. And to wrap up the season at the end of July, Solstice of Heroes would return, bringing an all new activity, the European Aerial Zone. The activity was cool and it was nice to see a whole new arena designed for the event. The armor was incredible this year but it was a bit grindy. It definitely crossed the line of no longer being fun to grind after the first week of the event. There was a bit more controversy during this event relating to Eververse as well. Eververse was changed in Season 7 to be much more like how it is now in the current game, selling most items outright rather than Bright Engrams or the Prismatic Matrix. And this was a double-edged sword. Now you could buy the items you want without loot box gambling garbage, but prices were expensive to get what you wanted and most of the best items weren't available for Bright Dust. As well as the armor glows for Solstice being 5,000 Bright Dust for each glow, meaning you would need to spend 15,000 Bright Dust, or you could just buy them with silver. It was getting a bit ridiculous and Eververse again would be heading into a bit more muddier territory once again. Now Season of Opulence is regarded as one of the best seasons Destiny 2 has ever seen. Menagerie and its gameplay loop for loot was probably the best version of one of these match made horde mode style activities. It brought a brand new raid, tribute hall, exotic quests, and solstice of heroes. It really wasn't a bad 3 months for players. Now the question is, did the seasonal style content releases work out for Bungie and Destiny players? It really depended on who you ask. If you were the type of player who liked getting new destinations, story missions, strikes, or crucible maps, basically core activity content, then the annual pass probably was a bit of a letdown. And even if you did like the annual pass content, it definitely felt bad that we didn't get at least one new strike or one crucible map for the entire year. But if you valued drip feed content and very grindy quests to pad out your playtime, then the annual pass during this year was fantastic. Most players were somewhere in the middle, wanting a bit less drip feed in our content drops, and would have liked to see maybe a bit more for the core activities besides Gambit. However, it did bring two raids which made the Year of Forsaken have the most amount of raids we've ever seen in this time frame. So Raiders definitely had a great year with the annual pass. All in all, most players can agree that the Year of Forsaken was probably the best year we've ever seen in Destiny. Forsaken was an amazing expansion with so much content and system changes, and the Annual Pass content had a lot more staying power than the seasons we have nowadays, especially thanks to the raids. Seriously, three raids during this year was so awesome. But what was coming next? Destiny 3? Or would the plans change since the split from Activision? I guess we'll find out soon.
On June 4th, 2019, the same day Season of Opulence launched, the next expansion for Destiny 2 would leak online, Shadowkeep. This one image was data mined from the PC game files and had many players in deep discussions online after its release. And this leak was a bit hilarious considering in two days time Bungie had planned to reveal Shadowkeep properly on June 6th in a live stream, but the data miners beat them to it. After two days of theory crafting and speculation online, we'd finally get to see it for ourselves. The stream started off with an Eris Morn focused trailer that would set up the story of Shadowkeep. Eris had discovered nightmares from our past haunting the moon. We weren't really quite sure what nightmares from our past meant yet. Old enemies being resurrected, relatives of enemies like Crota, what exactly were nightmares? Luke Smith and Mark Noseworthy would take it from here. The question on everyone's mind since Bungie's gone truly independent and is in you know, complete control of Destiny's future, we're publishing the game now, we're an independent company, is now what? What's the plan? Where are we headed? And so the vision for Destiny going forward, the Destiny franchise, is contained in like three parts. The first part is being an awesome action MMO. And yeah, we, we like, like, we've been worried about that term for a long time. You know, we've, we've shied away from using MMO. that. Yeah, because it, it comes with a lot of baggage. It's like, does that mean it's a subscription game or you yeah. gotta play with a mouse and keyboard or whatever, but like, man, you know, this is one of those things. We're on our own now and it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Like we, we can accept the fact that this is what the game is like. Bungie finally came out and said it. Bungie is an independent company and are committing to the game being considered an MMO. Now like they said, they have shied away from this term in the past and instead used terms like shared world shooter and living breathing world, but now it's official. They want the game to be known as an MMO. And Destiny has always had MMO elements, raids, weapon and armor grinding, crafting to some degree, social interactions in the world. And Destiny 1 was always considered an MMO light experience because it wasn't quite massive for one thing, and it was instanced a lot throughout its gameplay. You had to do things like select missions and activities through orbit, so it wasn't fully seamless in an open world either. Classes were unique, but not quite as distinct as traditional MMO classes. But with Bungie now committing to this MMO title, what did this mean for the game? When we say MMO, we don't mean like subscriptions. We're not, we don't mean, we don't mean subscriptions. We do mean uh, two things. The first part where we're lacking right now, and we've like been getting better, Forsaken certainly adds to it, is improving the RPG. Yeah, we really you know, want deeper build customization for, for our players and, and for your characters. You know, you're creating these monster killing machines and you want to make them your own, and we can do a lot more there. And so a bunch of what we're doing this fall is going to be about adding the stats back into the game, RPGing the game more than it was. And D2 launched, launched away, Forsaken improved it, and we think Shadowkeep's going to take that kind of to the, to the next level. Deeper RPG build crafting would be returning to the game. More stats and customization of those stats would be the focus, and more than we'd ever seen before. This is such a stark contrast from the vision Bungie initially portrayed to us for Destiny 2 Vanilla, where things would be more streamlined, and they were saying things like, we don't want players to feel like they made a mistake somewhere in customizing their armor or subclass. The next major highlights announced by Luke and Mark were 1. A single evolving world, meaning plans for more Dreaming City style curse events for the future of the game. Number 2 was cross save was coming to the game. Number 3, Destiny 2 is going free to play with all year 1 content being available for those free to play players. Number 4, seasonal content can be purchased a la carte. Number 5, Destiny 2 is switching to Steam for PC. And number 6, no more PlayStation exclusive content. These announcements were pretty big for the game. Cross save has been a long requested feature as well as no exclusive content and seasons and expansions being a la carte. But the biggest and most important announcement here might be that Destiny 2 is going free to play. More players getting a chance to hop in, but free to play monetization would be a concern of course. Next up was a Vidoc going over the nightmare storyline and returning to the moon. But most importantly we got a look at how the RPG aspect of the game would evolve. Armor 2.0 including a bunch of new mod changes and more stats to mess with than ever before. The seasonal artifact that unlocks more mods and would serve as an endless way to obtain power level. Finishers would be added to the game that allowed you to kill enemies with a unique animation when their health is low. And we got to look at some new exotics including the famous divinity which would be coming in Shadowkeep. Then we get a look at something that didn't age too well. Alright it's time. Oh, it's about to get loud here. 1v1. 1v1 on the board. 
One of the things we really want to focus on, especially with Season 8 and the start of Shadowkeep, is a renewed focus on PvP. Why are you lying to me? You're lying. There's plenty to tell. You just won't tell it. You're lying. Am I going to have to stand here all day until you tell me the truth? The New Light experience was explained a bit more detailing just what content players could play for free. All of the Destiny 2 Year 1 campaigns, Red War, Curse of Osiris, and Warmind, as well as their respective raids. All PvP maps and modes, all strikes, you can visit each destination, and full access to Gambit. This was Bungie's first expansion since the split from Activision, and this was their chance to show us the new Bungie-controlled vision for Destiny 2. We can completely build Destiny in the vision that we want it to be in. A vision that isn't dictated by a commercial model or a business plan, but our creative vision and what we want to do for our players and what they want us to do with Destiny. Are you sure about that? The reveal stream would be concluded with Datto doing a Q&A session with a few of the developers. Trials? Question mark? Because PvP for the last year has been, here's a new comp weapon. Some additions we want to make to the house, but first we've got to like look at the house and repair the foundation and we've got like work to do and maintenance to do. You know, I know people love trials. I certainly love trials. We want to like, we want it to be the ultimate version of the game over time. Okay, but when is it coming out? We've got work to do. Originally supposed to launch on September 17th, 2019, Shadowkeep would receive a delay due to quality concerns, as Bungie put it, and would instead arrive on October 1st. Some speculated that the delay might have been related to Borderlands 3 releasing just four days before the 17th of September, but there's no way to know for sure. On October 1st, Shadowkeep would bring a new campaign with six story missions. And this time the campaign took a little bit longer, but only because of in between missions there were some drawn out grindy bounty style quests, which were kind of annoying and just interrupted the flow of the campaign. A few of the story missions themselves weren't too bad. It had a really great intro mission that had us fighting alongside NPCs to reclaim the moon from the hive. The Destiny 1 First Light Crucible map made a cameo as well, which was a nice little touch. And towards the end of the mission, we'd get the big reveal. A pyramid ship is deep inside the moon. This was the first time we'd ever seen the pyramid ships actually in-game, as we've only seen it once before in a cutscene from Destiny 2 Vanilla. A few of the other story missions had us hunting down nightmares, meaning old enemies from Destiny 1 like Fogoth, Tanix, and Omnigol, and these missions would be later used as nightmare hunts for the post-campaign content. Another mission would be a story version of the Scarlet Keep Strike, where we defeat Hash Ladoon. The final mission, we'd approach the pyramid and be sucked inside where our ghost would be possessed by the darkness and we'd fight through some of our more major nightmares, including Crota, Gaul, and the Fanatic. This was our first time in a pyramid ship ever in Destiny 2 and for the only thing inside to be nightmares was a little bit disappointing. There were no new enemies or even a new hive boss or something like that. But after defeating the nightmares, however, we'd get a pretty interesting cutscene where we'd be teleported or hallucinate the Black Garden. And who would be speaking to us there? We are not your friend. We are not your enemy. We are your salvation. When the cutscene ends, we're teleported back to the moon next to Eris with no explanation to how we escaped or what happened after our conversation with the darkness. Eris just tells us that they are not our salvation and gives us a few quests to do on the moon and defeat some nightmares. The campaign had a really great first mission and setup, a few lackluster missions in between, and then a finale that had us speaking to the darkness in a pyramid ship which was really cool, but fell kind of flat due to the gameplay of the mission and what happened after, which was basically nothing as far as the story goes. After the campaign we had a few new things to explore on the moon. For one, the Destiny 1 location was now updated with lost sectors throughout which were actually pretty sweet. They did a great job expanding on the existing areas of the moon, and it was pretty fun to explore for the first time. A whole new section of the moon was added as well, Sorrow's Harbor, which had a new public event style activity called Altars of Sorrow. It was fairly challenging, especially at release, and was a decent distraction that came with a few unique weapons that could be earned from the activity. Eris Morn had her fair share of quests and such that could earn you some more new weapons and armor sets from the Lectern of Enchantment, which was a little bit like crafting, but more like a precursor to Umbral Engrams. Nightmare Hunt missions had us chasing down tons of old enemies. There were eight of them, and they were fine gameplay-wise, but comparing their boss fights to their original fights in Destiny 1, it's clear the originals were much better. 
Fogoth, for example, was insane in Destiny 1, not just because he was hard, but because he would shake your screen and give you real anxiety when fighting him. He was terrifying. Destiny 2, he didn't shake the screen or cause much fear, even though he was considered a nightmare here. He was hard in Destiny 2 if you played it on Master Difficulty or something like that, but he really wasn't much of a spectacle compared to what we saw with him in Destiny 1. D1 Fogoth was a real nightmare. The loot from Nightmare Hunts wasn't too bad though, especially if you played them on Master Difficulty. You could get some pretty cool new mods and stuff like that. They were kind of similar to Nightfall rewards and were tied to Lectern quests. Shadow Keep would bring us two new strikes. The Scarlet Keep where we defeat Crota's daughter Hashla Dune, and it's actually a pretty good strike. You cover quite a lot of ground and traversing through the keep is awesome, but as for replayability, it's not everyone's favorite because it runs a bit long. The second strike took place on Io, the Festering Core, which was one of the first places we would learn a bit more about Savathun and her plan to gather strength by using the Vex technology. Eris provides some interesting lore in the strike that was pretty telling for the future of the game. And in terms of gameplay, the Festering Core was one of the better strikes in the game, and it's unfortunate it would later get vaulted. Shadowkeep brought us the second dungeon in Destiny 2, the Pit of Heresy. Opinions on this one were a bit more mixed than Shattered Throne. The aesthetic was really nice and the final boss was a lot of fun, but a few of the encounters were pretty boring. Still, it was nice to have another dungeon in the game, and Pit of Heresy did bring something unique with it. A secret boss fight that was part of a questline for one of the new exotic weapons. Xenophage. This secret boss was really cool, had some pretty different mechanics, and I really hope to see more things like it in dungeons in the future because Pit of Heresy is the only dungeon that has a whole separate hidden boss or something like that. Garden of Salvation was the new raid taking place on the Black Garden, an area we've always wanted to explore, and aesthetically the Garden of Salvation did not disappoint. It's one of the most beautiful places in the game, and like Last Wish and Forsaken, it was tied into the narrative of both Shadowkeep and the Season of Undying, where we would use the orb from the end of the campaign to pick up a signal that leads us to the Black Garden and the Sanctified Mind, who once killed, turns to stone, and we discover a scale from a pyramid that was the source of the signal we'd been tracking from the mysterious orb. From the gameplay side of things, Garden of Salvation was a bit weaker than the previous raids. Not in all encounters, but it was a bit slower and more deliberate, full of some kind of weird and janky mechanics. The raid had a few good moments, but overall it was a bit underwhelming and would go on to age a bit poorly, at least to most players. The loot wasn't all that exciting either, except for the exotic weapon Divinity. To get Divinity required an Outbreak Prime style questline from the Wrath of the Machine, but not quite as complex. Shadowkeep would bring one new Crucible map, Fragment, and two old maps from Destiny 1. Crucible Labs would get 3v3 elimination and momentum control. But that was about it for PvP. So much for the supposed renewed focus on PvP with the launch of Shadowkeep. Iron Banner remained basically the same, but brought a new armor set, yet not any new weapons, and Trials of Osiris would still be on hiatus. We did see some new pinnacle weapons added. I mean, ritual weapons. After the Year of Forsaken and the pinnacle weapons being absolute powerhouses, Bungie decided to instead make ritual weapons which could be earned in the same way as pinnacle weapons, only they would be much less powerful and didn't have unique overpowered perks anymore. This season would bring Edgewise for the Vanguard, Exit Strategy for Gambit, and Randy's Throwing Knife for Crucible. Shadowkeep brought a few new exotics as well. Six exotic weapons, one of which was a Destiny 1 weapon, and only three new armor pieces. It was a bit light on exotics this time, but the weapons that came with Shadowkeep were pretty sick. Deathbringer, Ariana's Vow, Xenophage, Divinity. These were some great weapons that felt more unique than anything else that had come before. And although Xenophage wasn't great at launch, it would receive a 50% buff in damage a bit later that would make it much, much better. The Sandbox would receive quite a few changes, buffs and nerfs across the board, but one of the most impactful ones would be a nerf to Rally Barricade and Well of Radiance. These would auto-reload your weapons during the Year of Forsaken, which trivialized most PvE content, and this was a much needed nerf, and despite some complaints early on, I think most people realized it was probably good for the game. And now it's time to talk about Armor 2.0, which was the biggest change and addition to the core system of the game. For one thing, all armor now has six separate stats rather than the three before. In Destiny 1, we had Intellect, Discipline, and Strength. In Destiny 2, prior to Shadowkeep, had Mobility, Armor, and Recovery. With Shadowkeep, this would all now be combined. This would be one of the best changes made to armor. All armor could be farmed until you found those perfect armor pieces that could accommodate your preferred type of build on your character now. 
What wasn't quite perfect at this time was the mod system, which locked some pretty important ammo reserve mods behind specific elements for your armor piece. And at the time, you couldn't spend any currency to switch the element of your armor, meaning that if you got an absolute god rolled piece of armor, but it was the wrong elements for the mods you wanted, then you were just shit out of luck. This would be a major failure of the original 2.0 armor system that had way too many layers of RNG. And complaints were through the roof about the elemental affinity portion of the RNG, as the rest of it was received mostly positive. Now we get to the Season of Undying which launched 4 days after Shadowkeep. The Vex Offensive was the primary activity, and initially impressions were good. It was fairly rewarding and wasn't too long to run. However, after the first week, it became pretty apparent that it was going to get stale very quickly. The event played the exact same every single time. Only one boss for the entire activity, there would be no bosses that would rotate each week, and the parts leading up to the final boss were the same encounters in the same rooms, unlike Menagerie which mixed things up a bit. Vex Offensive was initially a pretty good idea that just didn't pan out. The Vanguard in the tower were building a Vex portal near Ikora, and progress was being made each week on it leading up to the finale of the season. And what did that finale bring? The Undying Mine Destiny 1 Strike boss would now be the final boss of the Vex Offensive, for some reason. A pretty lackluster ending to an already lackluster activity. There was nothing unique about the boss either in terms of gameplay or rewards. I mean, how cool would it have been to bring back a Mago Loop or something that you could grind for? It would have made it worth farming, but instead, it kind of sucked. After the completion of the Garden of Salvation raid, the moon would be opened up to invasions by the Vex. Apparently the Vex were spilling out onto the moon drawn by the pyramid's influence after we defeated the Sanctified Mind in the raid. And these little invasions were cool, I guess, you know, it's a bit similar to the curse cycle being enacted in Forsaken, but definitely nowhere near as interesting or exciting. One of the more important additions during Season of Undying was the Seasonal Artifact. The artifact acted as a way to unlock mods that would be exclusive to this 3 month time frame, as well as increase your power level beyond whatever the maximum gear score was. The mods were a pretty interesting system, and they were fun to try out with Armor 2.0, but the artifact power was just a way to give the game an endless feeling of progression. So in the past when you could reach maximum power level with your characters, and feel like you completed that part of the game and focus on farming weapons or armor, now with the Seasonal Artifact, your power level just never stopped going up, as you continued to level up XP. Now personally, I dislike this, not everyone will feel that way, but I think it's kind of a dumb way to pat out the grind and give the illusion of a never-ending sense of progression. Even after the maximum pinnacle gear level, you just didn't feel like you completed anything. And this was likely by design, to give players a never-ending number that goes up and resets every season. Another controversy relating to the Artifact were the Champion mods. Champions were a new enemy type in Shadowkeep which included Barrier, Overload, and Unstoppable. The only way to deal with these enemy types and their mechanics were to use Champion mods which would allow you to stun them. The problem was, these mods could only be applied to specific weapons, meaning it forced you to use those specific weapons for activities with Champions. Even the new raid had Champions. And rightfully, Champions were not received too well amongst players. Not necessarily because of the mechanics of the Champions, which I think are fine on their own, but just the fact that the game forced specific loadouts in order to deal with them. This was pretty annoying. It would take quite a while before players would come around to getting used to champions in the game. And again, I want to reiterate, champions aren't all that bad, but forced loadouts sucked and continues to suck in the game today. I get why Bungie did it. They wanted to make each season feel like they will have weapons that are more prominent for those three months in order to keep the game fresh, but that should be done with sandbox tuning not restricting loadout choices. A battle pass was added to Destiny 2 for the first time ever with Shadowkeep and included a new armor set and some new cosmetics, as well as upgrade materials and stuff like that. The battle pass itself wasn't all that exciting, but it was nice to get a few extra new rewards. But Eververse continued to thrive during this season, receiving probably the most amount of cosmetics we've ever seen before. Tons of great looking loot was exclusive to Eververse, including items that were very Shadowkeep themed that probably should have been rewards for things like the dungeon, or strike specific loot for the Scarlet Keep or something. And this is when Eververse really began to become a major problem for Destiny 2 and loot aspiration. This 3 month time frame was really held up by Shadowkeep and its content because Season of the Undying would go down as probably the weakest seasonal offering we'd received so far. Was it totally fair to compare the seasons we'd seen during the Forsaken year, which had help from other studios in the case of Season of Opulence at least, bringing raids and such to beef up their value? 
Maybe, maybe not, but still that doesn't matter to the paying customer who paid the same for the Season of Opulence as they did for Season of Undying. To wrap up Shadowkeep's launch month, we'd get Festival of the Lost, the Haunted Forest would make a return from last year, and we'd get some new masks, armor, and a weapon that had random rolls so it could be farmed for, and there weren't much complaints with the event this time as Festival of the Lost remains a fan favorite event. Shadowkeep and Season of the Undying as a whole was a pretty underwhelming experience. To those who didn't play Destiny 1 and experience the moon before, maybe this was a bit more exciting for you, but for veteran players especially, the novelty of the moon wore off a bit quicker. Both the raid and dungeon weren't nearly as good as Forsaken's, there was just a lot less content than Forsaken overall. Far less strikes, far less crucible maps, no additions to Gambit really, and it just kind of felt like a large season, rather than an expansion. And one of the more vocal complaints revolved around Shadowkeep being a reskin expansion, filled with some reskinned weapons and armor from previous seasons, the moon from Destiny 1, and much of the campaign and post-campaign content revolved around killing enemies we've already killed before, in places we've already fought them. Now Shadowkeep wasn't all bad, there were some cool ideas, but it just didn't feel worthy of comparison to previous fall expansions, and thus far would probably be the weakest one across Destiny 1 and Destiny 2. After Season of Undying, expectations for the next few seasons weren't really high either, but players hoped they'd be better than the Undying. Shadowkeep was a bit of a letdown expansion, but hopefully the seasons this year could make up for what lacked during the Shadowkeep launch and Season of Undying. And first up to bat would be Season of Dawn, a season focused around the legendary character Saint-14 from the lore. Osiris had resurrected him with the use of his sundial, time machine, and our job was to help both Osiris and Saint-14 stop the Red Legion from changing history by using Osiris's sundial. The activity for the event was called you guessed it, the sundial, and it continued to be another run-of-the-mill horde mode, throwing balls, clearing ads in various rooms, and fighting a boss. Something that still had yet to be nearly as fun as the menagerie. Although this season did include multiple bosses that would rotate weekly, as well as a legendary difficulty, so it was absolutely a step up from the Vex offensive in Season of Undying. And the final boss of the season in the Sundial was so much better than the Undying Mind, if only for the unique arena that you fought him in. Obelisks were how you ranked up most of the seasonal content and were the first real introduction of one of these kind of overly confusing and complex mechanisms in the game. I know most of us are used to how these things work nowadays as they're all pretty similar, but in Season of Dawn, everyone was just annoyed and kind of confused. But once players got the hang of it, it caught on a bit and players grew to enjoy it to a degree. And like I mentioned, similar iterations of this mechanism would become the norm for every season going forward. One of the frustrations with the obelisks came from the Dawn mods only being able to be applied to Season of Dawn armor, meaning you'd have to grind for new armor with better rolls in order to use them. This meant that a soft form of sunsetting would kind of be introduced, which was frustrating. After only three months of grinding all of our new Armor 2.0 stuff in the previous season, now none of it was useful, to the fullest at least, for this season. Like yes you could use it, but of course players want to try out the new seasonal Charged with Light mods, and you had to do that with Dawn only armor. This was definitely not a popular decision to introduce this soft sunsetting so soon, however partway through the season this would be changed to allow dawn mods on the last three seasons of armor. The seasonal story missions with Saint-14 were the real highlight though. Saint-14 became an instantly lovable character for fans, and his dialogue with Osiris and Shax were a real pleasure to listen to. The gameplay of his missions were definitely some of the best we've ever had in any season. Three exotic weapons were added during Season of Dawn, and three exotic armor pieces. The first was Symmetry, the Season Pass weapon, which was a unique and fun exotic scout rifle. The second weapon was the Devil's Ruin sidearm, which had players travel back to Twilight Gap, where we had some great lore and dialogue between Sait-14, Shax, and Osiris. But that was kind of it for the exotic quest, unfortunately. And the weapon itself was a bit situational, but unique for sure. Not great, not terrible. And the third weapon was Bastion, which is a slug fusion rifle that takes some inspiration from Pocket Infinity, I imagine, with its design. But the most important thing about this weapon was its exotic quest, the Corridors of Time puzzle, which was very similar to the Niobe Labs quest back in Black Armory. It was a bit of a community-driven event. It took six days to finally unravel this mystery after many clues and possible theories were posted online. And after finally completing the puzzle, that wouldn't be all for the quest. 
Unfortunately, players learned they would need to then grind out some very tedious quest lines from the spider, meaning things like public events, lost sectors, bounties, and then wrapping up with a unique version of the Hollowed Layer Strike, which would finally bag players the Bastion weapon. It was a really unique and difficult puzzle, but the busy work after the fact kind of led it to ending on a sour note. But players did hope to see more puzzle-like quests in the future. The armor pieces added were Prometheum Spur for the Warlocks, Bombardiers for the Hunter, and Severance Enclosure for the Titans. The ritual weapons for Season of Dawn were the Komodo Linear Fusion from Crucible, the Python Shotgun from Gambit, and the Buzzard Sidearm from the Vanguard. All of these weapons were pretty decent, above average in most cases, but still couldn't touch the power of the pinnacle weapons during Forsaken. And the send-off to Season of Dawn content was the Empyrean Foundation community event which required players to donate polarized fractaline, billions of it across all players, and doing so would unlock the Trials of Osiris game mode that would be coming next season. But let's be honest, Trials would be coming back regardless of whether or not we completed the event. One of the best ways to farm weapons would be a side effect of this event. When you turned in Fractaline, it would complete bounties that rewarded you with seasonal weapons that you could purchase multiples of in order to just cash them in over and over again. Thus, farming for god rolls in the least exciting way, endlessly cashing bounties. But that pretty much sums up this event. The Dawning would make a return during this season, bringing essentially the same content as it did during Forsaken's year. Baking cookies and all that. This time, however, you could earn a new SMG the Cold Front, which was a 750 RPM. It could be nice with a decent roll, but not amazing by any standards. Thankfully, you could still earn the new Avalanche machine gun from last year, which was one of the better machine guns in the game. A couple months later, we saw Crimson Days make its final return as the event would be discontinued after this year in 2020. The event lasted a week as usual and brought a couple new exotic sparrows, but that was about it. Now, Season of Dawn wasn't a bad season, but mainly because the story was so interesting and full of some great characters that helped add to the existing lore, and a few of the weapons during the season were actually pretty good, and the gameplay for the season was still lacking a bit, but definitely not the worst seasonal activity content. But coming in March was the next season of Destiny 2, Season of the Worthy. The hype levels were pretty high for this one, mainly because of one thing. Trials of Osiris would finally be returning after being left behind in Destiny 1, and after Trials of the Nine had been on hiatus for over a year and a half, it was very exciting to get a Trials mode back in the game. And Trials was definitely the main draw for the season. The seasonal story and seasonal activity content definitely wasn't turning any heads, however. Another Cabal Red Legion themed story which was getting tired at this point. The thing about these two seasons released during Shadowkeep's year were that they felt like a continuation of the original DLCs from year one. Season of Dawn was a continuation of Curse of Osiris' storyline to a degree, and a much improved one at that, and Season of the Worthy was shaping up to be a continuation of the Warmind DLC with Anna Bray at the helm of this storyline, along with Rasputin. Now on some level this is pretty cool, right? To see Bungie actually continuing narrative threads that had come before. It worked out pretty well in Season of Dawn, but could it work in Season of the Worthy? Well, when it launched, Season of the Worthy definitely felt disappointing in regards to the story, likely due to the fact that Warmind from a narrative perspective was awful, and the Red War storyline seemed pretty wrapped up to this point. Not the Cabal narrative as a whole, but the Gaul-led Red Legion stuff. And as such, Season of the Worthy did not bring much interest to the story, at least initially. As for the gameplay loop and seasonal content, it involved upgrading Rasputin bunkers around the different planets, in pretty much the same way you upgraded the Season of Dawn obelisks. And clearing out those bunkers is how you could upgrade those said bunkers. Along with a bunch of Rasputin bounties, which were pretty bog standard. Seraph Towers were the public event style horde mode that had us just clearing mobs and, you guessed it, throwing balls at something. A mechanic that at this point just felt like it needs to go away. The loot for doing said activities was also pretty unexciting. Except for maybe the 7th Seraph shotgun, there wasn't much that stood out. Although a few old faction weapons were re-added to the game with random rolls, and there were some new armor sets that were, I guess, completely subjective to your taste, but the most notable thing in regards to loot were the mods. Warmind cell mods which paired with the seasonal weapons to create these little explosive Warmind cells that were very strong for numerous reasons. Legendary Lost Sectors were added to the game and also contributed to ranking up Rasputin bunkers, and were much more difficult than regular Lost Sectors and added champions to them. Grandmaster Nightfalls were introduced to the game and released to very little fanfare initially, mainly because they did not incentivize replayability. They were treated as a one-and-done kind of activity, where you weren't rewarded extra based on your score 
or how many champions you killed. Loot was the same as Master Difficulty, just with a higher drop chance. Gameplay wise though, it wasn't too bad. It was much harder having to navigate things like revive tokens and dealing with the contest modifier which was there at the time. But besides the Conqueror title, there was almost no reason to run them in comparison to just running a Master Nightfall. Luke Smith had made a comment regarding core activities prior to Season of the Worthy, saying that they will be a focus moving forward. However, his comment fell a bit flat when Season of the Worthy would be the first season to remove one of the main reasons to play core activity content. Ritual Weapons Prior to Season of the Worthy, three separate legendary weapons could be obtained in each activity in all previous seasons. And for now, those were gone, except for one ritual weapon of sorts, I guess, for Iron Banner. This was done because, as DMG would claim in a Reddit post, that ritual weapons couldn't be added because their resources were stretched too thin and didn't have the manpower to create three weapons for core activities. Instead, those resources were spent on making old trials weapons. And the only thing that leads me to believe this not enough resources comment is a bit weak is Eververse saw one of the biggest refreshes to its loot than we'd ever seen before. Season of the Worthy had more cosmetics and vanity items than previous seasons, filled with tons of weapons and armor ornaments. So it's clear they had resources, but instead of allocating them to in-game rewards and activities, they instead opted to just focus on Eververse items. Worthy added two exotic weapons and three exotic armor pieces. Tommy's Matchbook, the Season Pass exotic, and the Fourth Horseman, which the quest boiled down to run public events for a few hours, basically. Very riveting quest. The exotic armor pieces were Saiten's Ramparts for the Titan, Raiju's Harness for the Hunter, and Felwinter's Helm for the Warlock. But now it's on to the biggest reason why this season was so hyped up. The return of Trials of Osiris. These comments did not age well. Trials is back, and it's pretty insane. When we knew that Trials was coming back, the most important thing from us was to do it right. Ha! We want to make sure that we really stick the landing with Trials. It's important that this doesn't go out half-baked. <laughs> it's just so cool to have like a pinnacle PvP activity return. We're hearing it from the players. We feel it ourselves. And I can't wait to bring back a version of Trials that matches what we remember from back in Destiny 1. <laughs> Would it live up to expectations? Would it live up to Destiny 1 Trials? Would it even be an activity worth spending your time in? The answer to those questions is no, no, and no. Trials of Osiris Return was something long awaited for the community and PvP fans, and despite saying they didn't want it to release half-baked, they released Trials without ever letting it touch the oven. This is something that people have been waiting over a year for. I can't tell you how many folks have been so hyped about Trials returning and for it to return this way. This shit sucks. I'm not gonna lie, fellas, it sucks. Say what you wanna say. Not saying the weapons aren't good, but there needs to be an incentive for going flawless. No adept weapons for flawless, a staple of the original Trials in D1, and the reason to work hard enough for the flawless. All loot was reskinned from Destiny 1. Yes, I know, Bungie has gone on record saying it's not as easy as copy and paste, but the designs were already there. They just had to rebuild them. I'm not saying that was easy, I'm just saying we didn't get anything new. All the armor and weapons from year one of Destiny 1, and not even all of the weapons made a return, leaving out things like the Jewel of Osiris. They messed up the scorecard system, so that it incentivized things like resetting your card after three wins in order to farm the weapon that week. Card win count based matchmaking on top of the skill based matchmaking made the experience sweatier than ever before and laggier than ever before. Many glitches and bugs like the one that caused a win to count as a loss and a lot of error codes kicking people from games and couldn't reconnect. And the anti-cheat system did almost nothing to counteract the numerous amounts of cheaters that plagued the entire experience for many players. And since this was just a return of pretty much Destiny 1 Trials content, weapons, armor, maps, all that stuff, and the game mode itself, they should have gone ahead and implemented the good things from Destiny 1. It's been a year and a half since Trials was in the game. I would have thought throughout that entire amount of time, this game mode would have went further than what it was back inside of Destiny 1, or just stayed the same, or just came back exactly how it was with the debt weapons. This system does not make sense to me. It does not incentivize players to invest in this playlist outside of just getting the armor sets and the weapons on rotation. Once you got them, that's it. Things like Adept Weapons should have returned to incentivize Flawless. 
The Passage Coin and D1 style card system should have been in place rather than this unneeded revamp that brought out loop breaking issues like resetting your cards. Trials of Osiris bounties that rewarded you for your time spent in the activity, which was so good in Destiny 1. And on top of that, even smaller things like bringing back some of the staple Trials shaders at the very least instead of making shaders for Eververse. And lastly, a functional anti-cheat system. They should have seen this coming. Players that would cheat in Trials. But alas, Bungie fumbled at the one yard line with D2 Trials, and even now hasn't fully recovered from the flop of its less than half-baked return. By the end of Season of the Worthy, the story had picked up a bit more, no longer being about the Red Legion and the Almighty, and more about using Rasputin to help us fight against the imminent threat of darkness. Fight off the pyramid ships if possible. And the season ended with a live event that had Guardians gather at the tower to watch Rasputin shoot down the Almighty ship, which was really cool, but was a bit soured by the fact that the event had us standing in the tower for over an hour and a half, watching the event unfold very, very slowly. As cool of a spectacle as this was, it just dragged on a little too long. What else was a bit disappointing about the finale was there was nothing after the Almighty crash landed into Earth. No teaser about what this meant for the future of the game. We couldn't travel to the Almighty and inspect or look around. It was a bit of a deflating end to the event. However, it was pretty fun to hang out in the tower and watch the event unfold with a bunch of guardians, like we were all gathered around for a fireworks show or something. Really cool idea, but not executed ideally. While that's all the main content contained in Season of the Worthy, the season was not over and we'd see two more events take place. First up was Guardian Games, a new event to the game which was very similar to faction rallies but instead of factions it was between Guardian classes. The event didn't really add anything new in terms of gameplay content, you needed to earn medals and laurels to turn into your class's podium at the tower, and how could you earn those medals? By doing bounties. An already very bounty heavy season with an event that focused on just doing bounties. I'm unsure why Guardian Games was added in lieu of the revelry from Forsaken's year, but my guess is that it's due to the revelry kind of being a pretty unbalanced and ability spam event, but Guardian Games was a very weak event during an already very weak season, and heir apparent the exotic machine gun was the only real draw to the event. The final event that took place in Season of the Worthy was the community event called The Lie. The quest took players to Vostok to investigate some things, get a bit of lore and dialogue, and then began the real event that progressed across all Guardians. Players would need to complete 9 million, yes, 9 million Seraph Tower events on each of the planets. 3 million per destination. Each person completing it would count as 1 out of the 9 million, so a fire team of 4 players completing the event would be 4 out of 9 million, for example. After the first day of the event, the EDZ was at 2%, the moon was at 1%, and IO was at 0%. And based on calculations done by the community on Reddit and Twitter, that meant that with progress rates at that level, the community would not finish this event until after Season of the Worthy ended. Season of the Worthy was not a popular season, and the community had already declared this season one of the worst the game had ever seen. So instead of participating in this extremely long and tedious quest, players just opted to protest the event, refusing to even participate in it. After hearing this negative feedback to the event, Bungie would address complaints by providing a 5 times bonus to completions, dropping the total number of required completions from 9 million down to roughly 1.8 million, and increased percentage points per wave completion. They would even increase the bonus to 10 times during weekends. As a result, the event would be completed after 3 days of grinding, rather than the original 3 weeks it was projected to take. Now you know you messed up big time with a community event when after one day players just refuse to interact with it, based on how tedious and boring it is. I mean it's not like the event had us doing anything new. It had us grinding the same exact public event we'd all been grinding for a few months at this point. Most players were over it and they definitely let Bungie know how they felt about the event. But after completing the community portion of the event, you still weren't done. Now it was time to grind a thousand shotgun kills. After that snooze fest, it was on to the next step. The Tyrant mission on the moon. Could this be another Whisper of the Worm or Outbreak Perfected style mission? Unfortunately, upon loading up the mission, players were just teleported back to Eris Morn on the moon. Now this was a bug that wouldn't be patched for a few days, and is pretty hilarious. Bungie really just could not get things together for this event. 
And when we finally did get to play the mission a few days later, it wasn't something like the Whisper or Outbreak mission. It was just another dialogue mission that had us going through an old bunker, listening to Anna Bray, and looking at holograms. And at the end, we'd collect Felwinter's Lie, a Destiny 1 shotgun. The Lie community event would go down as one of the all-time worst events in Destiny history and one of the biggest flounders on Bungie's end. A disappointing, bug-filled, and boring mess. The lore and story was neat, but completely soured by the state of the game at this point, and how the event played out in general. As a whole, Season of the Worthy was awful. The seasonal content was boring and lacked incentives. Trials of Osiris was butchered and delivered in an incomplete, buggy state. Loot was very lacking as well, with only one interesting thing in that regard being Warmind Cells, and the story still felt like it was kind of going nowhere. It rightfully earned its name given by the community, Season of the Worthless. But in June we'd be getting the final season that would be releasing before the next expansion. Season of Arrivals. The pyramid ships are here, Savathun has began her plan, and there would be mysteries to uncover with the help of Eris Morn. The story finally was picking up the thread that began with Shadowkeep, the pyramid's arrival to our solar system. Rasputin has gone dark since the first pyramid ship has arrived on Io, and were tasked to explore Io by Zavala, in order to find Eris Morn who has gone missing. This leads us into the cradle which has a tree of silver wings, a mysterious paracausal sponge-like entity that absorbs power from the darkness, and allows us to communicate with it which we would do later during the story missions that take place in a throne world in a place called the Court of Savathun, which allows us to communicate with some of our enemies like Nocris. The Tree of Silver Wings was badass, and the story in Season of Arrivals is one of the best seasonal storylines we've ever received. It had real consequences to the overarching plot in a major way. Sure, the last two seasons likely did as well, but to figure that out you had to read a lot of the lore. This season, however, we'd see it firsthand in the gameplay and the mission design. The seasonal activity this time wasn't all that exciting, however. It was essentially Gambit meets Escalation Protocol, and it was definitely a lot better than Seraph Tower's last season, but still nowhere near as good as Escalation Protocol. But what made it definitely worth running was the brand new Umbral Engram system, which allowed players to focus certain types of loot when turning them in at the new Umbral Decoder. Focusing engrams for loot that was actually really good too. The weapons for this season were great. Especially the swords which were modified legendary versions of the Destiny 1 exotic swords, Boltcaster and Dark Drinker, which quickly became staple weapons for the season. But the biggest highlight of this season was probably the brand new dungeon that would be released completely free whether you purchased the season or not. It was likely made free in response to the apathy players felt toward the state of the game and how poorly Season of the Worthy turned out. Bungie would even make the decision to remove this season's Eververse armor from the store and instead use it as reward loot from the new dungeon. A very good decision that added tons of replayability to the new dungeon as there was now two separate armor sets and weapons to chase within it. The Prophecy Dungeon would be one of the more unique areas in the game and dealt with lore relating to the Nine. It was by far the best dungeon we'd seen up to this point. Multiple challenging boss fights, an epic sparrow section, great art direction, and again some really good loot. Arrivals brought three new exotic weapons, but not any exotic armor pieces which would be a first as far as seasons go. The first weapon, Wither Horde, was the Season Pass exotic and it instantly became a favorite amongst players and completely broke the game with certain raid bosses. Oh! Uh, who oh. hit it? Oh! Somebody hit it. Somebody hit it. Please. 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 Ah. Let's go! Traveler's Chosen had another busy work quest line that also rewarded you with various nightfall weapons like DFA and Silicone Aroma, and the weapon was fine for niche builds, but nothing special. And lastly, the Ruinous Effigy Trace Rifle, which had a much better quest that required some fragment hunting, killing new secret named enemies in patrol. However, it did kind of end on some busy work just getting void kills. But the weapon itself was very unique and had some great utility. It wasn't making any S tier ranking lists, but it was one of the best trace rifles in the game at the time. Ritual weapons still did not make a return, disappointing but not totally unexpected. Skill based matchmaking would be removed from the casual Crucible playlists finally, and breathed a bit of life back into PvP. Not anything substantial at least, I mean there was no new content for PvP this season, 
But as many players can tell you, the removal of SBMM felt amazing and made players want to actually interact with the Crucible again. However, Trials of Osiris would still be broken during this season at launch, and even more so because players who would earn Flawless would be locked out of the lighthouse for some reason, until it was fixed a bit later. It was hilariously bad optics for a game mode that was pretty much already dead after its return. About a month after Arrivals launched, Moments of Triumph began, which was one of the game's best. At this point in Destiny 2, there was so much content to play. Raids, dungeons, strikes, destinations, and Moments of Triumph highlighted them in the best way. In the case of raids, we'd see uncapped raid rewards for the duration of the event, meaning that all five raids in the game could be farmed endlessly for unlimited rewards, including the chances at exotics. And on top of that, there were quite a few neat cosmetics added to the loot pool of those raids as well, like ghost shells, shaders, and emotes. Moments of Triumph felt a bit like the Age of Triumph during Destiny 1's third year, that was the final send-off to that game. And while this Moments of Triumph did not bring nearly as much as Age of Triumph in Destiny 1, it did have a very similar attitude and way it went about celebrating the old content as AOT. Another month later we'd get Solstice of Heroes which brought back the European Aerial Zone from last year with some new armor sets and vanity items, which could be purchased for Bright Dust. Despite much of the core issues still being present in the game and the lack of things like rituals, exotic armor, no real vendor refresh, bugs here and there, Season of Arrivals as a whole still managed to be going really well so far thanks to the new Umbral Engram system, the story missions, the loot, SBMM removed, and the dungeon and with the following two events that really highlighted the positive aspects of the game. I think Arrivals really shows how a good season with worthwhile content and loot to chase can make the whole game feel good. It encouraged players to engage with its content, both the content that was released during the season and all of the old content, because of how well done the systems were and how worthwhile the loot was to chase in all activities. Now originally the season was going to end in September as we were supposed to get a new fall expansion on the 22nd, but shortly after its reveal it would end up being delayed into November, meaning that we'd get one final event before its release. Festival of the Lost. This meant that this would be the second Festival of the Lost during the Shadowkeep year and would bring back the Haunted Forest for the final time. It made some odd changes to loot and progression that ended up being a bit broken, and kind of like the Trials card, resetting only after a few branches was the new method of farming loot rather than trying to achieve as many branches as possible. It was an unfortunate change to the event that kind of soured the final year with the Haunted Forest. But because of numerous quality of life changes, the game was in a pretty decent state with arrivals, needing only a few tweaks and changes to the core game. There was a lot to do in the game, and there were some good reasons to do most of the content, but we were only one month away from the next expansion, Beyond Light and massive changes were coming to Destiny 2. Would it be everything we hoped for? Bungie's first year since breaking off from Activision was a bit rough for Destiny 2. Shadowkeep was by far the weakest fall expansion the franchise had ever seen up to this point, and the four seasons that took place during the year were pretty hit or miss. But by the end of Season of Arrivals, the game was in a pretty decent spot thanks to numerous quality of life changes that took place over the course of a few seasons that fixed a lot of the issues that came with Shadowkeep at launch. And the amount of content in the game was finally substantial. And even though most of the seasonal content was inaccessible, the game was big and it felt pretty good. But very impactful changes would be coming very soon in November with Beyond Light. But let's back up to when Beyond Light was announced. June 9th, 2020, which was the same day that Season of Arrivals launched. The Beyond Light reveal stream began with a cinematic trailer showcasing the Drifter, the Stranger, and Eris gathering on Europa to investigate the massive pyramid. It's one of the best cinematics for Destiny 2 with a very Star Wars kind of vibe to it, and really gave off the impression that the Pyramid and Darkness storyline that began during Shadowkeep would be picking up a bit more. However, in the next scene of the reveal, Luke Smith and Mark Noseworthy would reveal that the story is focused around Aramis, a fallen leader who wants revenge on the Traveler for turning its back on the fallen race, and would be wielding a dark power from the Pyramid, Stasis. Now, the Pyramid and Darkness storyline was obviously connected to Beyond Light's story, but as we'll discuss in a moment, it didn't quite feel like a continuation of Shadowkeep in the way players likely expected. But before these guys explain too much of the story to us, we got our first look at Europa and some in-game action of Beyond Light. Europa looked like a pretty unique destination filled with 
varying type of locations, not just one big frozen wasteland like we saw in the cinematic. New enemy types, wyverns and brigs, stasis, a new power that we'd be able to wield, and a deeper look again at Aramis. But here are some of the major bullet points that Mark and Luke would make throughout the duration of the stream. Number one, stasis won't just be a subclass, but also a new element for weapons and enemies to use against us, making it the first new element since 2014. Number two, Beyond Light is the beginning of a new era. I mean, how many times have we heard that before? However, with three expansions being announced this time, Beyond Light, Witch Queen, and Lightfall, maybe this new era actually meant something this time. Number three, Bungie is all in on Destiny 2, reiterating that Destiny is going to be continually building on the MMO aspect of the game. And we'll see what they mean by that because in a lot of ways, the decisions made in Beyond Light actually help the case for why Destiny 2 is not an MMO. Number four, changes to the seasonal model to get some of the FOMO out of the game. Bullshit! Number five, transmog is coming to the game at some point during the year. Number six, 60 FPS and 4K for PS5 and Xbox Series consoles, along with free upgrades to those consoles from the previous gen and cross-play between previous and current gen consoles. And now probably the biggest change coming in Beyond Light that would also end up being the most divisive. And I'm just gonna let some of it play out here. Each year, just as a new expansion comes out, we're gonna cycle older, less actively played activity and destination content out of the live game and into what we're calling the Destiny Content Vault. <laughs> Moving content into this vault is gonna allow us to add support for D2 for years. This vault is also gonna allow us to take content from Destiny 1, do some work on it, get it ready to come back into the Destiny 2 ecosystem. But there's a lot of great content in our past and maybe this year we'll see a, a classic raid come back. I think it'd be pretty amazing this year to see the Vault of Glass kind of unvaulted and returned in front of players. Like I can imagine things like champion Praetorians instead of just regular Praetorians and kind of updating it slightly to the modern context. This fall when the expansion comes out, not only are we gonna be bringing back Cosmodrome and adding Europa, but we're gonna look at some of that content that's been in the game for a long time, that's been free, that isn't actively played, and that's, that's when some of that is gonna be vaulted. The Destiny Content Vault, as Bungie has named it. Removing heaps of old Destiny 2 content, to allow for better updating and patching of the game, this supposedly massively multiplayer online game just lost the massive part of MMO. Four destinations and the Leviathan were being removed, seven strikes, two gambit maps, 11 crucible maps, seven crucible game modes, and five raids. A massive amount of content that helped the game feel big and full of things to do was now all going away. And on top of that, 18 exotic quests were being removed, including two of the best ones, the Whisper and Outbreak missions. And with all this content being vaulted, it would also include the removal of a lot of the campaigns, including the Red War, Curse of Osiris, and Warmind. And fan favorite seasonal content from Forsaken's Year would be leaving as well, like the Forges and Menagerie. Beyond Light was set to remove half the game. Now, nobody expected Beyond Light to replace that much content one-to-one, -one, but could it make up for the loss of this much content in the fact that maybe we wouldn't notice that so much was being removed? Well, we just have to wait and see. In October, we get a Vidoc going a bit more in depth on what to expect from the expansion. Europa would have a dynamic weather system, snowstorms and things like that. We gotta look at some of the new exotic weapons and armor that look to be centered around build crafting for your guardian a bit better. New Light was getting a bigger update and additions made to it. More quests, a new NPC, more of the Cosmodrome from D1 would be added back to the game. And we saw a bit about the season that would be launching alongside Beyond Light. Season of the Hunt. Osiris was back, and so was Aldrin, now resurrected as a guardian named Crow, finally catching up to that cliffhanger two years ago in Forsaken. Zivu Arath was going to be the villain of the season, in a sense at least, corrupting various enemies in order to build an army, and gave us a little bit of a tease about Savathun. But we didn't have to wait too long before November 10th came, and Beyond Light launched. First up, let's kind of talk about the campaign. There were five story missions with a couple busy work filler missions in between, and the length of the campaign was padded out a bit by increasing the power level of the missions pretty drastically so that either the mission would be really difficult 
or you would need to stop your playthrough of the campaign for a minute and go grind some power level. This isn't really a problem for players who can handle a tougher challenge, and some would even say the challenge was just right, but for others it kind of interrupted the flow of the story and campaign by needing to grind power level at separate times throughout. The story missions weren't too bad from a gameplay perspective though, some fun boss fights and things to explore on Europa, there was some good dialogue from the stranger and Varix, although Drifter and Eris were oddly quiet during the campaign, which felt a bit odd considering how much both Eris and the Drifter, but especially Eris, had been involved in this Pyramid Darkness storyline up to this point. Aramis was an interesting villain, but like most Destiny expansions, we rarely get enough time with the villain, and Aramis' storyline was wrapped up pretty quick, at least for now. The cutscenes were nice to look at, and having Barracks back was pretty cool, but the campaign was kind of just there. There was much more interesting stuff relating to the lore and backstory of Europa and the Stranger in the post-campaign content. Empire hunts were similar to Shadowkeep's Nightmare hunts, however Empire hunts were more of just altered story missions, whereas Nightmare hunts had us visiting areas outside the campaign a bit more. Other quests that would have us explore more of Europa were some of Varric's missions that had us defeat Aramis' successor and other threats around the area, and the Stranger had some pretty tedious quests that were needed to be completed in order to unlock stasis, aspects, and fragments, and these were kinda awful, very grindy for the sake of grind, and took forever. But there really wasn't a whole lot for the post-campaign stuff. There wasn't some kind of Altars of Sorrow or World Event equivalent for Europa, so the area seemed a little bit dead while in patrol. It was a beautiful location, just with not much to do. Especially once you'd finished the post-campaign quests, which didn't take all that long. Beyond Light brought one new strike, the Glassway, which took place on Europa, and I think I can speak for everyone when I say that this strike just kinda sucks. Although they did bring back the Destiny 1 Omnigal Strike along with most of the Cosmodrome, and seeing additions like Lost Sectors to the original Cosmodrome is pretty cool, just like it was during Shadowkeep with the Moon. But there really wasn't much else to the Cosmodrome, with its only use so far being a place to serve the New Light experience. And only one new strike hurt quite a bit after losing seven of them. I mean, even Shadowkeep gave us two strikes. Beyond Light did not bring any new Crucible content, no maps, no modes, which again hurts after losing 11 maps, and Shadowkeep brought us 3 maps. And I think it goes without saying that Gambit didn't get anything new and became even more stale after losing 2 maps, and to top it all off there wouldn't be a dungeon like we'd had in both Forsaken and Shadowkeep at launch. So far in terms of core activity content, it was quite shocking to see that Shadowkeep outpaced Beyond Light so far. And it definitely felt pretty bad when most of the core gameplay loops stayed the same with Beyond Light, farming bounties and running core activities for pinnacle drops. And while we did have a new toy, Stasis, farming the same old strikes and crucible maps, it wouldn't be so bad if we didn't have to interact with them. But leveling was and still is tied to the core activities almost exclusively. So almost no new content for them and removing so much of it just felt bad and especially when Season of the Hunt was very core activity focused, but we'll get to that in a minute. But speaking a bit more on Stasis, Stasis was strong at launch for Beyond Light. Overly strong, which was fun for PvE. It's obvious some classes were stronger than others, but it did bring some different kinds of playstyles to the game, which was nice. The subclasses were customizable, similar to how subclasses were back in Destiny 1. Unfortunately, stasis weapons weren't really a thing. There was only one stasis exotic weapon and no legendaries, and it was a bit sad to see a new element added to the game, but only for subclasses really, and not our weapons or armor affinity. This would be addressed in later seasons, but for now, it felt like we got an incomplete version of this new element. But in PvP, stasis was a nightmare. Getting frozen constantly got old after the first day, and I don't think I'm alone in saying that Crucible was nearly unplayable because of it, but probably the biggest highlight of the expansion would be the new raid, Deepstone Crypt, taking place in an area that has been teased about in the lore for so long and had some really interesting implications for certain parts of the narrative, and from the gameplay side of things, the raid did not disappoint. It had some really unique encounters that stretched beyond the more formulaic ones from the previous raids, the boss fights were mostly well done, though a tracks could be a little bit boring, but the final boss Tanix was a really fun fight. However, I do want to make the point that Tanix being the raid boss is probably one of the most disappointing and hilariously awful things about this raid. Inside the crypt could have been anything, a giant exo of Clovis or something, but 
Nope, it's just Tanix. A dude we've killed three times already. I will never get over how stupid that is. But again, from the gameplay side of things, this fight is actually pretty fun. The loot from the raid also wasn't half bad at all, and Deepstone Crypt had a great atmosphere as well, having one of the best jumping puzzles in franchise history. And not really because it's difficult or anything, but of course because of this. Deepstone Lullaby is one of the best soundtracks in Destiny history. Now let's kind of shift back to some of the core game stuff again. Not only was content vaulting introduced into Destiny 2, but gear sunsetting was introduced as well, making all the gear earned prior to Season 9 no longer infusible. This means Shadowkeep stuff was also completely sunset. This was a pretty divisive issue that players debated over the course of many months prior to Beyond Light's launch, and while to some extent sunsetting made sense and did have a good enough reason to exist on paper, Bungie absolutely overdid it, which they would later admit and try to solve with a band-aid fix the next season by reissuing Dreaming City and Moon Weapons, again also too much backlash considering they didn't just unset our current ones, meaning we'd have to go regrind for those exact same weapons. It was just a bad situation all around. But for now, at least during this launch period season 12, there was no solution, and the loot in the game did not feel good, especially when there was not nearly enough weapons to counteract the pain of losing so much. Again, like vaulting, players didn't expect a one-to-one -one trade off in content. And two, nobody expected one-to-one -one weapons and armor, but players definitely expected a bit more than what we got especially when even the Beyond Light campaign rewards included things like Forsaken's Long Shadow Sniper just reissued. It was pretty bad, and loot for the core game was just incredibly lacking. Ritual weapons had been removed over the last few seasons, which a lot of people didn't really like, so with Beyond Light, Bungie would try to solve this a little bit by just giving us one ritual weapon, a Dord, and this could be earned by any of the three core activity vendors just with a different skin applied. And this was... Pretty disappointing for a number of reasons. For one thing, Adored was just beloved. Sure, it had some decent perks that made it kind of an all-purpose sniper rifle, but it looked and felt just like our beloved, which had just been sunset. So really, it just felt like we had to regrind for a new beloved. The armor for the core vendors was also the exact same across all three of them. Beyond Light did not bring any new weapons or armor for Iron Banner either, which also was just another disappointing thing to add to the list for the depressing state of loot and even Trials of Osiris wouldn't receive new weapons or armor, but it did finally see Adept weapons added, which was nice to see. However, Adept mods wouldn't be received too well due to them also giving you drawbacks on your weapons, like minus 10 to one stat to increase another by 10. An Adept loot in this current form still just didn't feel like it was worth going flawless for a lot of players. Beyond Light and its season did bring some new exotics though. Seven exotic weapons, two of which were Destiny 1 weapons, and six exotic armor pieces. The exotics were mostly a mixed bag. Some of them were a bit forgettable, but some of them actually became very popular and were super badass like Lament and Cloud Strike. One of the more positive side effects of sunsetting and vaulting was the reduced load times and general performance boost in most cases. The lighting and graphical changes were nice as well and things seemed to be running a bit smoother. However, I do remember specifically trying to run Vanguard strikes and having various amounts of glitches that prevented us from progressing through the strike, and that was something that only happened from Beyond Light onward. At least for me, that's what happened to me. So not all cases did the game run smoother. But now we get to Season of the Hunt, which launched seven days after Beyond Light. Zivu Arath was building an army of corrupted enemies around the various destinations, and we need to put a stop to it. Wrathborn hunts are the new activity where you fight some of Zivu's champions, and it wasn't all that challenging or exciting, pretty much just stomping bosses in 10 seconds or so. The thing is though, in order to do these Wrathborn hunts, you need a charged Cryptolith lure, and how can you charge it? Well running core activities. Really not a good look when the core activities just did not get hardly anything new for Beyond Light. And so for half of the seasonal activity gameplay loop being centered around grinding old content, it was not good. The loop was essentially run a few core playlist activities, then go kill a few Wrathborn bosses in under a minute. It was 
really not good. I think this may be the worst seasonal gameplay activity we've ever seen, even now. At least you could use the lure to grant you specific loot drops, similar to the chalice back during Season of Opulence, but it had some layers of RNG added to it that were just frustrating to deal with if you were chasing specific loot. Now it wasn't all bad, there were a few bright spots within Season of the Hunt. The Hawkmoon exotic quest wasn't half bad, and contained some pretty cool story and lore, and it was a fun mission. And the Harbinger secret mission that would give you the catalyst for Hawkmoon and served as a place to farm for random rolls was actually a really good mission. It wasn't nearly as good as Outbreak or the Whisper mission, but Harbinger was pretty decent, all things considered. Season of the Hunt's story wasn't completely terrible either by any means. It gave us some good moments with Crow and we learned a bit more about Zebu Arath and Savathun, but even with these few brighter moments in the season, Hunt was still one of the weakest we'd seen overall. An extremely lacking gameplay loop, pretty bad loot, and was hurt by the lack of core activity content in the game. The last real thing to happen in Season of the Hunt was the dawning, and this year was pretty much no different than any other year. It brought along a new fusion rifle, which was fine, and a unique exotic ship with some customizable elements to it, but this year's dawning also gave us another community event. This one tied to baking cookies and generating dawning spirit, and similar to the Season of the Worthies community event, Bungie overestimated how many players would be grinding out the event, again, where players were set to fail the event before the dawning was supposed to end. But Bungie did what they did during Season of the Worthy. They increased our spirit gain by three times in order to help us achieve the goal. Either Bungie should have recalculated how many players they think will engage with events like these, or they just need to let us fail them, not just coddle us and give it to us in the 11th hour, because then it's not even like we earned anything as a community. Community events like these could be really cool, but first of all, they need to be rewarding, like very rewarding, and secondly, we need to know what that reward is so we can truly generate enough buzz amongst ourselves as a player base to actually rally behind them. But community events like this are truly terrible, where failure is impossible and the reward is just not worth it. Okay, so wrapping up as a whole, Beyond Light and Season of the Hunt was a bit rough. There were some pretty cool things added in Beyond Light, the raids, stasis, at least for PvE, and some of the story-related content was above average. Season of the Hunt had the Harbinger mission, which was neat, but that's its only real highlight. But when we take a look at what Beyond Light and Season of the Hunt brought and compare it to Shadowkeep and Season of Undying, Shadowkeep did outdo it in a lot of areas, especially when it comes to core activity content. Shadowkeep had a dungeon, where Beyond Light did not. Shadowkeep had two strikes, where Beyond Light had one. Shadowkeep had three PvP maps, where Beyond Light had none. The Moon Destination had a wave-based horde mode event, and Europa didn't have anything similar. Shadowkeep brought new armor sets for Iron Banner, three ritual weapons, and had a much larger loot pool overall, which is surprising, but true. And Season of Undying's activity was far better than Season of the Hunt in terms of gameplay and loot. And again, it's very surprising, because people didn't like Undying's activity, and thought it was a pretty weak season. And in a lot of ways it was, but when you compare it directly to Season of the Hunt, it makes Season of Undying look like a masterpiece. Beyond Light did bring Stasis, a new subclass and element type, and Europa was brand new rather than Shadowkeep's Moon being a reprisal from D1, but were the trade-offs here worth it? It really depends on who you ask. Considering Beyond Light and Season of the Hunt was $50, and Shadowkeep and Season of Undying cost $35, I think it's fair to make comparisons where Beyond Light really falls short in terms of the amount of content that it came with. And when you pair that with vaulting and sunsetting, Beyond Light really felt pretty bad for these three months. And again, that's not to say that what did come with Beyond Light was all bad because it wasn't, but it was much smaller than many of us expected, and in some ways even smaller than Shadowkeep, which was pretty bad, especially when you consider Beyond Light was the most expensive fall expansion purchase we'd ever seen. The Beyond Light launch months were an interesting time in Destiny 2's history. It felt like it was a time where Bungie just wanted to hit the reset button on a lot of things and give us at least something to satiate our thirst, because Beyond Light really feels more like a season as a whole, like a large season rather than an expansion. And with sunsetting and vaulting impacting the game in a pretty harsh way, it was pretty tough to remain optimistic about the future of the game. Many players shared their frustrations once again. Would the Beyond Light seasons be able to redeem this supposed MMO that has drastically shrunk over the last few months?
So Beyond Light wasn't a terrible expansion, but it certainly underdelivered in terms of the amount of content, and it really didn't shake things up enough like we might have hoped for with it being a new era of Destiny and all. But like the previous year, we had three more seasons to look forward to, and hopefully they could bring a bit more to the table than Season of the Hunt. First up was Season of the Chosen, another season focused on the Cabal. However, actually a lot more interesting this time than previous Cabal-themed releases. Empress Keitel, daughter of Emperor Kallus, proposed an alliance with the Vanguard to defeat the Hive. Keitel wanted us to kneel to her and treat her as our new leader though, and we just weren't having any of that. So we would need to fight various Cabal champions in a trial by combat kind of scenario, and it was a pretty great story setup that was much more involved than a lot of seasons previous, and would kick off this era of seasons having a bit more compelling stories. This would also be the beginning of the seasonal content being available in a new social space. The Helm. It was separate from the tower and you were in first person view, but it was a pretty cool addition to the game. Instead of just jamming more NPCs in the tower, we finally get to go somewhere else to interact with the new content, which is pretty similar to what Destiny 1 did with the Iron Temple and Reef social spaces. The new gameplay loop for Chosen was much better than Hunt, and actually better than most seasons that had come before. Things like the Umbral Engrams were back, mixed with improved versions of things like the lure from Hunt. And the new activity Battlegrounds was a great addition. There were two of these strike-esque missions at launch, and two more added in the next few weeks. And Battlegrounds were highly replayable for the loot, and it of course helped that they were actually pretty fun. Three strikes were added for the season on top of the Battlegrounds missions. One brand new one called Proving Grounds, and two strikes from Destiny 1. The Devil's Lair and the Fallen Saber strikes, which were fan favorites of course. While they weren't new strikes for some of us, it really didn't hurt to see them return. Anything at this point to help the strike playlist out is a positive, and three strikes added during the season felt so good. Trials of Osiris and Iron Banner even got some new items. Iron Banner saw a few year one weapons return but with updated perk sets, and a new perk called Iron Reach, and we saw the return of the Iron Truage set. Trials of Osiris saw brand new armor sets and a few new weapons, and finally some vanity items to chase inside the playlist, including a ghost shell, sparrow, and ship. Two exotic weapons were added during Chosen. Tiku's Divination, the Battle Pass weapon, and Dead Man's Tail which had an incredible exotic quest mission called Presage. It was a very puzzle focused, secret mission style quest line that was even better than Harbinger from Season of the Hunt. It was unique the whole way through, with a good final boss, and a pretty interesting reveal at the end. Three exotic armor pieces were added, Mantle of Battle Harmony for the Warlock, Omni Oculus for the Hunter, and Curus of the Falling Star for the Titan. Salvager's Salvo was this season's ritual weapon, and it was really good. Basically the loaded question of grenade launchers. Chain reaction paired with ambitious assassin just makes it tons of fun to use, and viable in almost any activity, especially Grandmaster Nightfalls. Guardian Games made a return towards the end of the season of The Chosen, with some changes made to encourage more camaraderie between players within your same class, Heir Apparent got a catalyst, there was a celebration ceremony at the end, but for the most part, it was mostly the same as last year. Chosen was a pretty good content-rich season. The story was interesting, Battlegrounds were fun and rewarding, Presage was fantastic, the additions to existing content, whether that be Trials or the Strike playlist, helped the game feel like it received a real update, and like the game was growing again. It was by no means a perfect season, but it felt pretty good, especially coming off of Beyond Light and Season of the Hunt and one of the most important quality of life improvements would also be made during this season. Sunsetting was now going away. The long debated and divisive issue finally saw its removal just three months after it was implemented. I think Bungie probably figured it was for the best at this point because they'd already gotten what they wanted out of it. Sunsetting things like the mountaintop, recluse, and various other ritual weapons was likely the main goal, and now that they were gone, there wasn't much of a reason to keep it around, after ridding the game of the more problematic weapons. Shortly after Guardian Games came to an end, we'd be gearing up for the next season, Season of the Splicer. Before we get to the actual content of the season, we do need to first talk about a pretty unfortunate bug that prevented players from even playing the new season. Upon launch, there were tons of honeydew errors for the first few hours Splicer was live, those were then fixed, but some players were constantly still crashing when trying to load up the game. And the reason for this was surprising. Too many friends on your friends list. If you had over 40 people playing Destiny on your friends list at the same time, then your game would crash. 
and this wouldn't be fixed for a few days, preventing quite a lot of players from playing the new season. It was a very odd bug that took far too long to get resolved. The story setup this time around was, again, pretty strong. Mithrax and the Vanguard make an alliance and work together to stop a Vex simulation from taking over the last city. So far, the simulation has enacted an endless night where the sun vanished from the sky over the last city. It was a pretty awesome premise with lots of important characters interacting together, including faction characters. As for the gameplay loop and seasonal content, it plays a lot like Season of Arrivals in both the activity itself and how you upgrade the new mechanism. Override was a bit more fleshed out and frankly better than Season of Arrivals activity. It had you doing a bit more, with things like entering the Vex portals and a real final boss fight that happens, and the prophecy dungeon style theme and art style of the season was just a nice touch. The expunged seasonal missions were pretty cool, even if just for the exploration aspect rather than the gameplay. The missions looked great, there were some fun jumping puzzles and unique mechanics to work through, and the occasional good boss fight that made Tuesday resets exciting. And with a pretty great finale in terms of the bosses and story, the seasonal mission content was once again pretty high up there. Two exotic weapons were added in Splicer, the first being Cryostesia which was a stasis sidearm that just didn't hit the mark, it had an interesting exotic perk but the weapon itself just kinda sucked, and the second was the Vex Mythoclass which was obtained in Vault of Glass. Yes, the Vault of Glass made a return which we'll talk about in a minute. Again, another three exotic armor pieces were added, all boots this time. Star Eater Scales for the Hunters, Path of the Burning Steps for the Titans, and Boots of the Assembler for Warlocks. This season's ritual weapon was Null Composure, basically a void version of the Loaded Question from Season 5, but this one was a high rate of fire archetype. Now fusions weren't in a great place in the sandbox during Season of the Splicer, so it wasn't hyped up all that much, but it would soon become a pretty dominant weapon. There was a lot more loot to chase in the world with Bungie bringing back some more Year 1 weapons from factions and some more stuff from Iron Banner, as well as a few new ones. The Season of the Splicer weapons were alright, not the best, but they were still fun to chase good rolls for. The Dreaming City and Moon weapons were reissued as well, and this was likely done in response to the lack of weapons to chase after Sunsetting was introduced with Beyond Light, and so far the loot chase was getting there again, but there was still a long way to go. So the Vault of Glass returned from Destiny 1 with some updated mechanics and changes made that fit the nature of D2 a bit more, and it was nice to have it back. Even though it was a returning raid, Having another raid to run just 6 months after Deepstone Crypt definitely helped satiate the player base's thirst for raid content because one raid per year is pretty rough like we had during Shadowkeep, especially when Forsaken's year gave us 3 raids. One change that was made when Vault of Glass returned wasn't received too well though, and that was that the Deepstone Crypt lost its pinnacle status for loot drops. And it's a bit confusing why this was done, there really isn't much harm in having at least 2 raids provide pinnacle drops especially when all other pinnacle drops just come from core activities which still lacked new content, so this change really just shouldn't have been made. And for as much good as Season of the Splicer had, there was quite a few more controversial things that came along with it. Transmog was added to the game, finally. The long-awaited feature found in so many other MMO games, allowing players to change their appearance to match whichever armor piece they wanted, but the problem here in Destiny 2 was with how unbelievably grindy it was. The currency you had to grind out just to be able to purchase a bounty from Ada took far too many hours. Then you had to grind that bounty out, and once completed would give you the currency to use on armor pieces to unlock for transmog. And not only that, but you were capped on how many you could earn per season. Bungie finally brought us transmog, but they did it in the most tedious, grindy, and convoluted way just to encourage players to skip the grind and purchase the materials directly from Eververse. It was pretty bad, and it was unfortunate. Things like this really further the narrative that Bungie only brings highly requested features if they can monetize it to death and milk the player base. And Bungie proved that theory right here with Transmog. It was pretty disgusting. And due to the backlash received around Transmog, Bungie announced that with an update in the next season, the grind would be significantly reduced by no longer requiring this extra currency to purchase the bounties from Ada, which would definitely tone down the grind by quite a few hours. But at release, this was pretty scummy from Bungie. The core activities being neglected continued to sour the experience for the season though. The content Splicer brought was good, but it really only made Tuesday resets the exciting days for the season, because the core game still suffered. Chosen at least helped the strike playlist a bit by bringing a fair amount of strike content, 
but Crucible and Gambit were still in shambles. And it didn't help when leveling still required you to interact with the core activities so often. However, some of the power level grind was reduced thankfully this season by only increasing 10 levels instead of 50. And as good of a change as that was, all it really did was highlight the fact that Tuesdays were all that mattered, and the rest of the game just wasn't worth playing much. The final event to take place during Splicer was Solstice of Heroes, which, besides a new shotgun and some minor changes to progression, was the same as it's always been. Shortly after Solstice would come the final season of the year, Season of the Lost. Now there were essentially two seasonal content drops that took place during Lost, but first we're going to speak strictly about Lost, then discuss the other content. The story of Lost would be what ushers in the story of the Witch Queen expansion, but it still was connected to what's been happening over the last few seasons, which was nice. We were tasked with saving the Lost Techians from an Ascendant Realm as Marasov prepares for an exorcism of a worm from Savathun. Astral Alignment was the 6 player match made activity, and it was fine, nothing terribly unique, but as for seasonal content, it was serviceable, but the formula was getting to be pretty tiresome at this point. These seasonal activities were fun little distractions momentarily, but they aren't designed to last. They go away at the end of the year, and when content isn't built to last, they usually aren't going to be top tier or have much depth to them, and players hoped that Witch Queen seasons would shake up this seasonal formula a bit more. Shattered Realm missions were the weekly story drops that gave us some interesting exploration moments and various collectibles. And the area grew each week in size, the more we unlocked perks that allowed us to venture deeper into those areas. It was definitely interesting, but not too exciting gameplay wise. What was nice was to see a more streamlined way of obtaining weapons and armor for the season. We still had the upgrade grid system mechanic to work with, but not for the weapons. We no longer needed different items or materials to get loot drops, you just got them after activity completion, which was pretty cool. Unfortunately the loot itself for this season was pretty forgettable, especially the weapons, not too many of them actually stood out at all, except for some of the exotics. Two exotic weapons were added this season, the now infamous Lorentz driver was the battle pass weapon and initially was a breath of fresh air to the class of weaponry that didn't see a whole lot of use for most of the year, linear fusions. Paired with some artifact mods, it made this weapon pretty popular during Season of the Lost. The second exotic weapon was Aegir's Scepter, which had its own quest to obtain. The quest was also fine, a lot of collect things and kill things, but the final mission was alright, if just a little bit easy, and the weapon was pretty decent and brought the total number of stasis exotics up to 3. The 3 exotic armor pieces were all from Destiny 1 this time around, radiant dance machines for the hunter, no backup plans for the titans and nothing manacles for Warlock. The Ritual Weapon Ascendancy was pretty good after the buff to Explosive Light. Both the Hothead Nightfall Weapon and the Ascendancy reigned supreme for most of the season as far as legendary heavies go, but Season of the Lost mostly benefited from numerous quality of life improvements made to the game. For one thing, crossplay was finally here, a fantastic addition that allowed more friends to group up and play, LFGing felt better because everyone was a potential option to invite regardless of the system they played on. PvP however may have gotten a bit tougher thanks to PC players having a bit of an edge. However aim assist is so strong on controller that it probably wasn't as noticeable as some other games that have crossplay. Primary ammo was now infinite. Just a great change all around. Running out of primary always felt dumb in the first place so this was a great change. Changes made to cooldowns in both ability and super energy depending on the option you pick. It helped the balance out just enough while not feeling too impactful. Trials of Osiris got quite the revamp that rewarded players for their time spent in the mode a bit more, making it still worth playing even if you didn't get the flawless. Changes made to special ammo so it didn't transfer round to round. Matchmaking was added alongside solo freelance. Changes were made to prevent emoting and sword peeking. Trials was no longer free to play and would require players to own the most current annual expansion in order to access and this helped prevent cheaters from just creating new accounts endlessly. And on top of all that, Bungie would come down pretty hard on cheaters, account recoveries, and win traders, and all of these things made Trials a better place overall. But the Witch Queen expansion received a delay, meaning Season of the Lost would go on for 6 months rather than the originally planned 3. And likely this delay was planned to accommodate the next release that would happen inside Season of the Lost, the 30th Anniversary Pack. This content drop brought along some free content as well as some paid content, so let's first talk about the free stuff. Dares of Eternity, possibly the best 6 player matchmade activity in Destiny that changed every time you played through it. 
whether it was the next enemy type you needed to fight or the next area you would be fighting in, and which boss you'd be facing. It was pretty rewarding too, filled with great weapons themed around some of Bungie's old games like Halo and Marathon. Xur's Treasure Hoard also had some pretty cool additions in the way of armor and ornaments. The paid content included a new dungeon set in a loot cave that is definitely one of the best dungeons in the game. Great boss fights, the loot was also good, being mostly old Destiny 1 weapons and the new Thorn inspired armor set. Ias Luna, Thousand Yard Stare, and most notably the Galahorn, which was something we never thought would return from Destiny 1. Other paid content mostly consisted of emotes, ships, sparrows, just vanity items really. And the content that came with the 30th anniversary pack was some of the best we'd seen in a while. Dares of Eternity was much better than any of the seasonal horde mode content, and the Grasp of Avarice was a great dungeon. And with Dares of Eternity being free, was it worth $25 to get access to the dungeon, Galahorn, and a couple legendaries? That is completely subjective to who you are and what you value as a player, but I think it's safe to say that it's a little bit overpriced considering an expansion costs $40, and this anniversary pack had far less content than half an expansion. I honestly think it could have been just another $10 like a season, or maybe even $15, but $25? It's a bit steep to be honest, especially when players had already spent $70 or more on Beyond Light's year of content, which this wasn't included in. But I digress. Two holiday events took place during Season of the Lost, both Festival of the Lost and The Dawning, and this year's festival brought along the replacement to the Haunted Forest of previous years. Haunted Sectors. Not nearly as fun or replayable as the Haunted Forest, but it did its job fine enough for the event, and The Dawning was about what we all expected. Just business as usual, really. Beyond Light's seasons after the initial launch were pretty good. The storytelling was more of a focus and was done well. The seasonal content, while not amazing, felt much more consistently good than previous years and was also more rewarding. Some of the exotics that came this year were pretty great as well. The quality of life improvements were much needed and welcome changes. And overall, these three seasons, as well as the 30th anniversary pack, made up for the lackluster Beyond Light and Season of the Hunt launch. But while these seasons were improvements over last year, there still was a gaping hole inside the core game. It was getting harder to ignore the lack of focus on core activities after multiple years of asking for new content for them. But players turned their focus to the upcoming Witch Queen expansion that would hopefully deliver in all the right ways at launch and be followed up with seasons that were even better than Beyond Lights. So Beyond Light's year started off pretty rough, but by the end of its following three seasons, Destiny 2 was headed in at least an interesting direction in both the narrative and quality of life changes. The Witch Queen would be arriving soon, and it was one of the most highly anticipated expansions with hopes of its quality reaching Taken King and Forsaken levels. Could it live up to those expectations players had? Well, let's first rewind back to the reveal. Like most expansion reveals, they coincide alongside the release of a new season and this one happened to be the day Season of the Lost launched. And the dev team had a lot to say before we even got a look at the Witch Queen. The team we have today is committed to relentlessly upgrading this game that we all love. We aren't happy with just another mission. Instead, we want to push the limit of quality you can expect in an action MMO with uniquely Destiny experiences like Expunge and Presage. We are committed to delivering the best mission content that you can play in any game with a friend and having the best feeling action game Period. The Witch Queen reveal cinematic was very intriguing. The hive wielding supers like our own, a new swampy throne world, and of course Savathun, the Witch Queen herself, looking badass as hell. The cinematic gave us a lot of questions right away, in a good way. Seven years ago we learned of Savathun during the Taken King, and finally we'd get to see her story front and center of a new expansion and it appeared to be as mysterious and lore-filled as some of Destiny's best content like Taken King or Forsaken. The first look at gameplay focused on the Hive using the light against us and the potential challenges that faced us. A new weapon type, the glaive was shown off, and ending with us crushing a Hive ghost. Again, more interesting questions would arise surrounding the Hive obtaining the light, but the reveal wasn't expanding on those questions. Instead, we learned more about the glaive and how it would be obtained. It would actually be built because weapon crafting would be coming to Destiny 2, a highly requested but somewhat divisive feature that had seen iterations in the past with Destiny 1 and House of Wolves, 
but it looked like crafting in the Witch Queen would have a bit more depth to it, or at least a bit more grindy. And it was still up in the air at this point whether weapon crafting would be good for the loot game, or be to its detriment. Bungie quickly shifted to what would likely be the biggest highlight of the entire expansion, the campaign. There would be a much larger focus on the campaign for the Witch Queen, which was nice to see. There hasn't been too many campaigns in the Destiny franchise that really stood out as great. Most of them were either mediocre or serviceable at best, but campaigns like the Taken King and Forsaken delivered in all the right ways, and Witch Queen was looking to be even more epic than those. A new legendary difficulty option would be added to provide players a much more challenging experience that scaled up in difficulty the more players you had in a fire team. Every mission and boss fight in the campaign would actually be a challenge this time. There weren't a whole lot of major bullet points to cover with the Witch Queen reveal like there were with some of the previous expansions. Instead, Bungie just focused on showing us all the reasons they believe players would be excited. A new large-scale campaign, a villain we've heard so much about, and a new throne world with secrets and light-wielding hive. Even in the Vidoc that was released just a few weeks before Witch Queen, the campaign was still what Bungie wanted to focus on, giving us a bit more details about both the narrative and the missions themselves, which would have a bit more dungeon-like mechanics involved. We also learned a little bit about the season that would launch alongside the expansion, Season of the Risen. Keitel was going to be helping us push back Savathun's army, but that's all we knew so far. Bungie made a point of how many new items would be arriving in the Witch Queen, including 8 exotic weapons and 6 exotic armor pieces, along with around 50 new legendary weapons to chase. And lastly, the Vidoc ended with a look at the first of 3 subclasses getting an overhaul and update to them. With Witch Queen's launch season, that would be Void. Aspects and fragments would now be part of the subclasses, just like Stasis subclasses had during Beyond Light, and with each successive season, Solar and Arc subclasses would also receive a similar revamp. So after a 3 month delay, the Witch Queen would launch in late February, and we could finally play it for ourselves and be the judge. Just don't say, I didn't warn you. So first up, let's talk about the campaign. Did it live up to the expectations Bungie set for it? Was it as grand and as epic as they described? The short answer is yes. There were 8 story missions that were lengthier, more challenging, and more complex than any previous expansion that had come before it. Even the in-between busy work missions were better here. There were a lot of memorable moments throughout in both the gameplay and the narrative, big story reveals, fun boss fights, and the amount of places we ventured throughout the campaign made it feel even bigger. The legendary difficulty made it all the better. It is the definitive way to experience these moments. The challenge and difficulty helped make the whole campaign stick a bit more than previous ones. You had to play your best to defeat the difficult bosses, you had to optimize your playstyle, and utilize all the tools in your arsenal. And all of it just feels better when there's a threat of failure, and the Witch Queen campaign truly felt epic because of it. The new light bearing hive enemies really helped ramp up the challenge and could be very difficult to deal with and offered what I would consider real difficulty, rather than artificial difficulty like we see with something like Champions. And it's unfortunate we don't really see these enemies outside of the campaign, Patrol, and one of the strikes. The storytelling inside each mission and the various cutscenes were leagues better than what we saw with Beyond Light and Shadowkeep. Bungie definitely didn't oversell the campaign. It was even better than most of us thought it'd be. Now it wasn't perfect, we'd still end up defeating Savathun in the final mission, rather than fight her in a raid or something like we did with her brother Oryx, although this time it was a bit more forgivable because of the legendary difficulty and Savathun's boss fight actually being kind of tough and quite the spectacle in the campaign. But like most expansions, after the campaign we of course had a fair amount of quests and things to explore on the new destination. The new world vendor Finch had a few quests that were more of the basic go kill some enemies over here, there, and elsewhere style quest lines, but other post campaign quests were a bit better like the evidence boards ones that had us gathering more intel and lore relating to Savathun and would require a bit more effort to complete. A few more weapon crafting quests would also open up including the Osteostriga quest which had us building a new weapon of sorrow, but now it's on to the throne world itself, and as a destination, it's alright. Like any new destination, it brought the typical secrets to find and things to uncover, a new public event, you know the usual stuff, and this time new areas could be accessed when leveling up your rank with Finch by gaining more deep sight, which was pretty cool. 
but mostly the throne world was filled with a bunch of minor stuff for the sake of the new title to earn, Gumshoe. Savathun's throne world was certainly more fleshed out than Europa or the reprised moon from Shadowkeep, but for some reason it still felt kind of empty and lifeless when comparing to the Dreaming City or Dreadnought. Other activities were also available on the throne world including the Wellspring, a 6 player match made activity that changed a bit each week. Sometimes you'd be defending the zone from an onslaught of enemies and fight one type of boss, other times you'd be assaulting the zone and end up fighting a completely different boss. It was fun the first few times, but the loot wasn't really all that exciting and only served as a place to farm power level until you reached the soft cap. Altars of Reflection were mini puzzle-like missions that could be completed weekly for powerful drops, and acted the same way that these mini puzzles worked during the campaign. One mission would open up a bit later after the world's first raid was completed called Preservation, which was essentially just the opening of the raid itself, but could be done solo or in a group of three, and would grant a pinnacle drop on completion. Two strikes would also be added in the Witch Queen, both taking place on the new throne world, the birthplace of the Vile where we would need to fight off the Scorn from accessing the throne world, which they were able to do with the help from the Witness, and the Light Blade, which had us delving deep into the throne world to fight off an old enemy from the Taken King expansion, the Dark Blade, now revived as the Light Blade. These strikes are great both from a gameplay and narrative perspective. They were grand in scale, richly lore filled, and make for some great challenges on higher difficulties. More strikes like these are what the game needs more often. Continuing the trend from Beyond Light, the Witch Queen also did not bring a new dungeon, which was very unfortunate. The second expansion to launch without a dungeon, which would now be locked behind a separate paywall called the Dungeon Key for 20 extra dollars that would release two dungeons later in the year. And it does need to be pointed out how gross it is that Bungie really just keeps splitting up its expansion content more and more into bits and pieces, and then sells those pieces separately. Vow of the Disciple was the new raid that would take place deep inside the pyramid on the throne world. Finally we'd get to properly explore and navigate through one of these things and Vow did not disappoint there. It was filled with lots of hidden areas and chests, lore with certain puzzles to solve, it was very massive in its scale showing off areas you'd eventually end up in your journey along the way, Val looked badass and felt like another great expedition into an enemy's base. The pacing of the raid is almost perfect in Val, only being marred by the far too lengthy intro. The real first encounter was a well done introduction to the new symbols that would be used throughout the entire raid, and there were a lot of them. Val had almost double the symbols over Last Wish, which was admittedly maybe a bit too much. The Caretaker boss fight is one of the best paced fights in the entire raid, three teams of two all splitting up to tackle the challenges of this three story room, and the artifacts encounter is by far the most satisfying encounter in the entire raid that rewards you for being efficient and organized, setting pathways for your team, managing which players take which artifacts per room, and there's also an element of randomness that plays in each time that meant you always needed to be ready to adapt. Another well paced encounter that runs like a well oiled machine once you get it down. And finally, Rolk, which is one of the more unique boss fights in Destiny's history. A final boss that actually attacks you hand to hand rather than just shooting at you from afar. Rolk can kick you off, blind you, or just land the perfect blow to end your run. There's a lot of movement when fighting him, and that's just fun. Getting up to a DPS phase is a bit of a slog though, drawn out maybe just a minute or two too long. But otherwise it's a really good fight against a unique looking villain, and thanks to some incredible lore surrounding the Witness, it made Rolk a good character even narratively, which helped alleviate some of the disappointment that Savathun wasn't the raid boss. In fact, Rolk as the raid boss felt even more fitting for what Val was going for. Again like Beyond Light, the Witch Queen also did not bring any new PvP maps or modes to the game. Still a very puzzling decision that would continue to hurt the replayability of the Crucible. There were a fair amount of exotics added in the Witch Queen and its launch season, Season of the Risen. 8 exotic weapons and 6 exotic armor pieces. 3 of the 8 weapons were exotic glaives that were specific to each class that had some unique perks, but they really didn't make a big splash. Pretty underperforming weapons. Parasite, a heavy grenade launcher, had a pretty standard exotic quest to obtain, mostly the busywork stuff we're all used to by now, and the weapon itself could be a lot of fun for explosive enthusiasts. Collective Obligation is the new raid pulse rifle that also landed with a bit of a thud, and wasn't too strong save for a few very specific void focused builds, but even then it wasn't all that great. 
Osseo Striga was probably the biggest highlight of the Witch Queen weapons and quickly became a fan favorite thanks to its viability in endgame content. And as for the season of the Risen weapons, Dead Messenger, a secondary grenade launcher, could be obtained in an exotic quest that took place on the D1 Mars location. And the mission itself was fine enough. The weapon was also fine. And finally, Grand Overture. The battle pass weapon was incredibly fun to play around with, being a bit similar to Xenophage, but also having the ability to fire off tons of missiles. It was a fun exotic to use, and thankfully a pretty decent one rather than just being some gimmick weapon. The exotic armor had a few standouts amongst them, including Blight Ranger for Hunters and the Lorelei Helm for the Titans, and I'd say overall the exotics during the Witch Queen's launch were above average for most players. One of the biggest sandbox style changes that came at launch was the introduction of the first 3.0 subclass of the original 3 light subclasses, Void 3.0. Now Void 3.0 revamped the subclasses to act just like the stasis ones that granted aspects and fragments, and provided a lot of build crafting potential which, despite a few issues, was mostly great. Considering customizable subclasses had been something highly requested ever since Destiny 2 launched, and we lost that ability to customize like we had in D1, seeing these changes finally come, even if only for the Void classes so far, was very nice to see. But we'd have to wait a few more seasons before we'd see Ark and Solar receive a similar treatment. Before we move on to Season of the Risen, I do want to address the why Witch Queen is a distraction, not an expansion idea, and most of this criticism will also apply to both Beyond Light and Shadowkeep. Now on paper, it's pretty easy to see these as expansions to Destiny, but really they're more like large seasons, and there is a bit of a difference. Destiny expansions in the past have always expanded every area of the game, whether that's Crucible, Strikes, the inclusion of a brand new core playlist with Gambit, and in expansions like Taken King that introduce new enemies or events from the expansion that spread across and infect old destinations like the Taken World bosses. Bungie loves to tout that D2 is a living, breathing world that is ever-changing and events take place across the system, but the last time that was ever true was in Forsaken, when every part of the game received a touch-up and even evolved a little bit. But with these last three expansion releases, they only pile onto the game instead of evolving it. The game doesn't need a complete overhaul or rework every year, that's not what I'm saying, but how can they say the game is evolving when every single destination or piece of content from the past has stayed the exact same? For example, in Destiny 1 during Rise of Iron, we only got one new strike with that expansion. However, five more were updated and changed to fit the new expansion theme. Tanix had his spliced version, Sepix became perfected, the Nexus Mind became taken and gained some new abilities. The strikes actually evolved, whether they were replaced with new enemies or they were revived thanks to some sort of new tech. And the strikes had different versions even during the Taken King with which boss fight you would have at the end or which enemies and mechanics you faced along the way. Not to mention all the new strike specific loot that was themed around each of the enemies that was not only added to new strikes released in an expansion, but would also be added to old strikes from Vanilla Destiny, or the Dark Below or House of Wolves. Now for Destiny 2, how cool would it have been to see something like the Scarlet Keep get some of these new Hive Guardians added throughout? Or maybe even replace Hash Ladoon as a boss with a Giga Chad light bearing wizard? Or see the inverted spire see the addition of things like wyverns and some new mechanics thrown in for the final boss. Or see literally any change made to them to fit the new theme of a new expansion. Quests were even added during the Taken King post campaign that had us traveling all over the system with the Taken War and Wolves of Mars quests that were in their own ways actually mini campaigns that spanned all the destinations further evolving those areas and giving us a reason to return to them. Especially the Taken World bosses. They were all over every destination. Currently in Destiny 2, the reason I believe there's so much burnout is because each expansion only tacks on a new place to go to with a campaign and a raid, and then it's back to business as usual, and leaves everything else in the dust. There's only so much you can do on one new destination before it gets boring, especially when things to do on the new destination are basically the same thing you've been doing on all of them so far. Running bounties, finding collectibles, or running the same public events you've been playing for years now. Legendary Lost Sectors helped alleviate some of that problem and did give us a reason to visit old locations, and that was great, and we need more things like that for this evolving world description to actually ring true. And of course it doesn't help when not only does old content rarely see any updates, but there is also an unhealthy lack of new content for the actual core game. And I know I've made this point like a thousand times over the last few years, but I'll keep hammering it until something is actually done about it. 
the lack of core activity content, meaning Strikes, Crucible, and Gambit, in a $40 expansion has been causing this game to grow stagnant. There are only so many times your player base can run the arms dealer strike or play another crucible match on midtown because it becomes laughable eventually. One or two strikes in an expansion, zero crucible maps, and Gambit hasn't been touched in almost four years. And all previous destinations have absolutely no reason to exist. Expansions used to address these areas of the game and it's why a lot of older Destiny expansions reign above the newer ones. Despite the campaign's quality being improved here with the Witch Queen. Because the Witch Queen's campaign is really great and so is the raid. But that's really all it has going for it. But something like Taken King and Forsaken not only overhauled core systems, but expanded every single area of the game no matter what type of player you were. The Witch Queen does not do that. It is a campaign with a few bonuses tacked on. It's just a minor distraction, not an expansion. And the same could be said for Beyond Light and Shadowkeep. And I do want to make the point that I personally love the new campaign, the raid, and the two strikes we got. But the rest of this game just feels wildly neglected. I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. So, now we move on to Season of the Risen. Story-wise, again like the Witch Queen, pretty good. The story has not really been an issue in the last few seasons, and Risen was not an exception. It told a good story tied directly into the Witch Queen and the Lucent Hive, with some good character development between some of the NPCs, and there's not really too much to dislike narratively about this season at all. The seasonal activity this time was PsyOps Battlegrounds, a three-player matchmade activity that actually had a bit of challenge to it this time, thanks to the large number of enemies it had, especially during the final boss fights. And for the most part, these were actually pretty cool. After I just spent all that time saying Witch Queen didn't give a reason to explore old areas, PsyOps did. Sort of. Unfortunately, it was still instanced and were exclusive to this seasonal playlist option, but it was cool to see old areas being utilized for some new content and actually change the existing areas with some additional architecture. I just wish these PsyOps took place in the actual patrol spaces to make the game feel more like an MMO and not just kept to separate instances. The grind was also kept to quite a minimum for loot in PsyOps, reducing the upgrade path difficulty and kept that same kind of streamlined Umbral Engram acquisition for seasonal gear. It was fine all things considered, and the weapons themselves weren't too bad either with some good roll potential. The armor however did not look great. The seasonal ritual weapon was Reckless Endangerment, a pretty substandard shotgun that had a lot of perk variety and options but was truly just a jack-of-all-trades master of none because there were infinitely just better options you could swap between that do what you want for a shotgun a bit better. Strike scoring and medals did make a return to strikes from Destiny 1, but there still wasn't a whole lot to them. In Destiny 1, these medals and scoring generally granted you bonus rewards or work towards specific bounties from Zavala, but with strike scoring and medals added in Destiny 2, they were kind of just there. Guardian Games would also make a return this year with a new SMG to earn and at least some unique changes made. There were three separate strike playlists available, the recreational, training, and competitive playlists that had different modifiers and scoring systems and rewarded you a bit differently per playlist. It was an interesting idea and certainly was one of the better Guardian Games we've seen, but not much of an improvement really. Season of the Risen was not a bad season. It was certainly better than the other two seasons that launched alongside an expansion, meaning Season of Undying and Hunt. There was better loot here, a better activity, much better story. It was still a bit on the lighter side in terms of content, but that's about par for the course for every expansion launch season. But as a whole, the Witch Queen expansion would be a major improvement over Shadowkeep and Beyond Light in almost every regard. The campaign was incredibly fun and replayable thanks to the legendary option. The raid is also one of the game's best with some killer loot to chase, and some of the few quality of life improvements did make the game feel better. But for all the good content that the Witch Queen brought to the game, its shortcomings are defined by the glaring holes left to the core game. Another expansion has come without anything substantial for the three pillars of the core activities, leaving the game to feel extremely stale after the honeymoon phase wears off. Three expansions in a row this has been a problem, and Bungie seems reluctant to address those issues. Instead, the only thing to look forward to is again another three seasons that could hopefully surpass the formulaic and predictable gameplay loops that the community had been growing a distaste for. But only time would tell how these seasons would hold up. So the Witch Queen was a good expansion. Certainly not the best the Destiny franchise has seen, but its campaign and raid are among the best pieces of content in the game. And Season of the Risen didn't necessarily land with a big splash, 
but it was serviceable as far as seasons that launch alongside expansions go. And with the Witch Queen being Destiny 2's best expansion since Forsaken, anticipation for the seasons that would follow were definitely high. Especially after the consistently popular seasons during the Beyond Light year. Well up first would be Season of the Haunted. Now I feel it's worth mentioning that with Season of the Haunted, Bungie opted not to share any information about the season prior to its release meaning zero promotional material or trailers to hype it up ahead of time, and instead would do a bit of a blind launch. This would cause some bit of controversy, but also some level of hype, with it being sort of a mysterious season drop. But we'll touch more on this topic later in the video. As for Season of the Haunted itself, it was another Cabal-themed release, however this time intertwined with the overall Darkness storyline that would ultimately begin setting up the story for Lightfall. Kallus was trying to link himself with the Pyramid Ship on the moon, which prompted his leviathan ship to make a return above the moon destination. The first hints of the Witness and Callus teaming up would be the main story theme here. However, in terms of the story related to the gameplay, we'd be fighting nightmares like we did in the Shadowkeep expansion. Only this time, they aren't even our nightmares. They are the nightmares of characters involved in the story, Crow, Zavala, and Keitel. Each week we'd help these characters try and defeat the things that haunt them. And the final mission of the season was pretty strong. In between helping our allies, we would board the Leviathan ship once again, this time with a much different look to it. Now covered in egregore and filled with scorn, with a very different atmosphere. With its return, much of the area was explorable and relevant to completing seasonal quest lines and challenges, which was actually really cool, basically turning it into a new patrol zone. Nightmare containments were the primary activity taking place on the Leviathan, and was the typical six-man horde mode style event. However, this time was actually pretty fun, at least for the first few weeks. Enemy density was high, lots of bosses and mini bosses to slay, a new scythe weapon could be picked up similar to the Iron Axe from the Rise of Iron expansion, it was just chaotic fun. The fun did start to slow down though due to the incredible amount of grinding that this season required, between the quests and the grid upgrade, and if you're crazy like me and went for the seasonal title, then you know just how tiresome it became to spend so much time on the destination. And probably one of the biggest missed opportunities was to bring back the Leviathan Raid, where everything had this new nightmare tint to it. Essentially just bringing it back as a nightmare version of the Leviathan I think would have been really cool. Season of the Haunted featured the return of several popular weapons from the past, including Beloved, Drang, Callus Mini Tool, and Ostringer, which overshadowed the other new weapons added for the season. And thanks to the addition of a new perk called Incandescent that would drop on the Mini Tool and Drang, it made these weapons even more desirable. Solar 3.0 would drop this season as the second subclass to receive an overhaul. Initially the reception was fairly middling, and the community quickly declared it to be much worse than last season's revamp for Void subclasses. However, this sentiment would quickly change once players realized just how powerful certain builds could be. As a Hunter main, nothing felt better than having the addition of Dynamite to add on top of my Shards of Galanor Blade Barrage build to achieve ultimate destruction and Nightmare Containments were the best place to test out this new build. But all classes would achieve equal power, and with the Classy Restoration mod of the season that healed you when you used a class ability, it would be the cherry on top that trivialized most PvE content. Actually, the Resilience buff would be that cherry on top, as it received a massive buff that allowed for up to 40% damage reduction at Tier 10. Between some really strong builds, Classy Restoration, and this Resilience buff, this might have been the strongest our characters have ever been, and maybe ever will be. Two exotic weapons were added in Haunted, the first being Trespasser, the Battle Pass weapon, a returning exotic from Destiny 1 that is significantly stronger than it was back in D1, and Heart Shadow, a new exotic sword obtained as a random drop from the Duality Dungeon, and drop rates could be increased by completing various challenges inside the dungeon, which is a great way to handle random chance exotic drops and should be the standard for all raids and dungeons in the future. Three new exotic armor pieces were added as well. The Rain of Fire boots for the Warlocks, which reloaded your weapons while dodging airborne, second chance gauntlets for the Titan, which granted a second charge of the shield throw and made it stun barrier champions, and lastly, Caliban's Hand for the Hunter, which made proximity knives scorch enemy targets, as well as buff melee regen until the knife explodes. So two of the three exotic armors added, directly linked to the changes made with Solar 3.0. The ritual weapon for the season was Chain of Command, a high impact machine gun that was certainly a machine gun, and didn't really stand out as great, but wasn't a terrible option either. 
just a very middle-of-the-road ritual weapon. The new dungeon duality would release a few days after the season went live, but would not be included with the purchase of the season. Instead, only Witch Queen Deluxe Edition owners would have access to it, or players would need to purchase a separate dungeon key for $20. Obviously a very controversial and probably scummy business practice, especially with the dungeon story and theme directly tied to Season of the Haunted itself, but I digress. Duality itself was received to mixed reviews, nearly 50-50 for those that loved it or hated it. Duality is actually one of the more expansive dungeons in the game, with really beefy and difficult encounters, and thankfully had some of the strongest loot found inside, which made it worth running weekly. And I'm personally in the camp that loves this dungeon, mainly from a gameplay perspective, as I'm not really the biggest fan of the aesthetic and the art design. But purely from the gameplay side of things, it's probably my favorite dungeon. High enemy density, great boss fight mechanics, and was a real challenge. Unfortunately, this dungeon also is marred by one major bug that has still not been fixed eight months later, which is infuriating. It's a complete dice roll whether ringing the bell will kill you. I spent many hours going for a solo flawless run, only to have it ruined by this glitch a few times. However, I was able to finally get it after pushing through the pain. The Rift game mode from Destiny 1 essentially captured the flag, made its return for Iron Banner, along with a new PvP map, Disjunction which quickly became the most hated map amongst the community, and opinions on Rift weren't that far behind. Changes were made to the mode from Destiny 1, like making it round-based where after a team would score, players were reset, instead of just flowing as one continuous match. And maybe it's due to PvP just generally not being in a strong place at this time, but Rift was generally disliked amongst most players. Trials of Osiris would receive some new loot to chase, including a fusion rifle and a sidearm, as well as a new armor set, though the mode itself remained divisive amongst the player base, and was still deemed something to avoid. Solstice of Heroes would return towards the end of the season, now just titled Solstice, and despite some changes to the event, it was pretty much business as usual. However, this year would be one of the best ways to obtain high stat roll armor, where players would be able to select specific stats to focus, which certainly increased player interaction with the event. This would also be the first introduction of Event Passes, which is a separate $10 battle pass filled with Solstice themed items. Just one more way Bungie continued to push monetization even further in the game. Overall, Season of the Haunted started out pretty strong on paper, and probably should be revered as one of the better seasons in Destiny. However, by the end of it, many players felt a bit let down. With the quality of Witch Queen going above and beyond in multiple areas, players hoped to see the Witch Queen seasons evolve a bit more as well. And unfortunately, Season of the Haunted felt very much like just another season of Destiny. And this was likely due to the growing fatigue of the seasonal model and lack of content for the core activities like Strikes, Gambit, and Crucible. And Season of the Haunted didn't really give a strong first impression that the Witch Queen seasons would be a step up from last year's. But still, players had hope that the next season would impress. On August 23rd, Bungie would stream their Lightfall Showcase, announcing the new expansion, and towards the end of the stream, would highlight Season of the Plunder which was dropping after the stream ended. The story setup for Plunder surrounded Aramis, the villain from Beyond Light, who had now escaped her frozen stasis prison and would attempt to steal eight relics of Nezarek for the Witness, who promised to help Aramis regain power and strengthen her group of followers. Mithrax would be a returning character for this season, and we learn more about his troubled past, and are also introduced to his daughter, Ido. Each week we'd need to track down these relics and defeat some fallen pirates in what would be described as basically Lost Sectors. In fact, the missions themselves were actually made up of Lost Sector areas from previously vaulted content, which caused a bit of controversy, understandably. And by the end of the story, Mithrax and Aramis would have a sword fight, Mithrax wins, spares Aramis, and she escapes on her ship. Plunder's story really felt like filler from the get-go, and felt a bit disconnected from the overarching plot of Destiny 2, despite some of the story and lore tying in with some important events from the past. While there were some interesting tidbits of story related to the fallen race as a whole, there just wasn't that much that went beyond some very surface-level character development of just a few characters. As for the gameplay loop and seasonal content, two different activities would be available that played off one another. First, a six-player matchmate activity, Catch Crash, set aboard some fallen ships known as Catches. This played into the pirate theme pretty hard with the idea of it being like we are boarding their pirate ships and plundering loot, definitely not a bad premise at all, but was pretty standard as far as gameplay is concerned. 
moving between areas, clearing out mini bosses, then confronting a final boss. So basically, Menagerie number 12. It really wasn't that bad of an activity, but certainly wore out its welcome much faster than many of the previous six-man seasonal content drops. And that idea could be applied even more so to the second activity called Expedition, which could basically be described as a three-man public event, where you cleared out some enemies and pushed a payload. What probably would have been a somewhat tolerable activity quickly became one of the most hated due to the overly drawn out challenges and grinding required for the seasonal title. The grind this season was exponentially increased between these two activities, and that grind would be even further extended thanks to Bungie bringing back more currencies and upgrade paths with the treasure maps that would be required to obtain seasonal loot. And after many complaints surrounding the tedious grinds of the season, Bungie would address the situation, except with only a few weeks left in the season. They would significantly reduce the grind for challenges to both praise and disdain from the community. Those who were behind on the challenges were glad they could catch up easier, but those who already put in the work felt cheated, and players hoped that this level of grind would simply not return in future seasons. Now the real question is, was any of this grinding worth it? Well, the weapons released in this season did actually have some hype behind them, with a new perk called Volt Shot being available, as well as a few other perks. Unfortunately, the weapons themselves were a bit underwhelming and really needed those perks to even be considered viable. Arc 3.0 released in Plunder being the final subclass to receive a 3.0 update, and the result would be mixed. Warlocks in particular felt a bit neglected. However, Hunters and Titans would receive some very powerful build options, and Hunters would even receive a new super called Gathering Storm, which quickly became one of the strongest DPS supers in the game and Titans would reign supreme with probably the strongest build in the game's history, the Touch of Thunder Heart of Inmost Light build. The standard two exotic weapons, three exotic armor pieces released this season as well. Delicate Tomb, the season pass fusion rifle, was an interesting twist on a fusion rifle to act more like a blunderbuss of sorts, and had perks that played into arc builds pretty well. And the Touch of Malice would make a return from Destiny 1, and would be a random drop from the King's Fall raid, which we'll talk about in a moment and the weapon was as strong as it was in D1, and even received some interesting changes, so it became highly sought after for obvious reasons. Cry Mutiny was the ritual weapon, a grenade launcher that looked more like a cannon, and shot cannonballs instead of grenades. It had some unique perks that made it stand out, but really didn't see much use due to this season being dominated by linear fusion rifles in the heavy slot. The King's Fall raid made a return from Destiny 1, making it the second raid from D1 that has been reprised. The raid stayed mostly the same as it was in D1, although there were a few mechanic changes made. Most notably to the Golgoroth fight, which now required teams to fight the boss 100% as intended. Oryx also received some great changes that made his fight more focused on damaging Oryx himself, rather than damaging him by completing various steps of mechanics. And from the gameplay side of things, D2 King's Fall was a major improvement over D1 King's Fall, the same way that Vogue was with its reprisal last year. The raid weapons also saw improvements with more valuable roll potential, and the only downside in terms of loot was the choice not to bring back the Age of Triumph armor sets for the raid, but they didn't do that with the Vault of Glass either the previous year, so it wasn't expected. Still, a missed opportunity. Iron Banner this season also brought along a new game mode, Eruption. Eruption is essentially cranked from Call of Duty, if you remember that mode from Ghosts, where after you get a kill, you're on a timer, where you will explode unless you keep getting kills. In Destiny, getting kills saves you from dying, but also grants increased super energy and ability energy with successive kills. What this did was make a more fast-paced Crucible experience, which ended up being fairly popular. It's a high-risk, high-reward style game mode that made Iron Banner more tolerable during Season of the Plunder. Festival of the Lost came as expected in October, and did not change at all really from Beyond Light's year, bringing back Haunted Lost Sectors. It brought a new armor set that, despite being voted on by the community, ended up being disliked by many people, but the new sniper rifle became a favorite. Like Solstice, it also brought along an event pass for some extra cash, which is a bit hilarious considering this event already exists for the sole purpose of selling microtransactions. A new title could also be earned this time, one that required an immense amount of grinding of course. A month later, one of the more controversial things of the season would take place. A Telesto event, if you can call it that. On November 8th, upon reset, the exotic fusion rifle Telesto would begin acting weird, essentially like it was broken. Of course, playing into the meme surrounding the history of the weapon where this gun genuinely has broken the game several times. Now the controversy comes up when discussing what this all meant. 
players had been starving for a new secret quest or puzzle since Bungie had slowly moved away from those events over the last few years. So with how Telesta was acting, and Bungie posting cryptic tweets and emblems about the weapon, players started losing their minds trying to uncover this new potential puzzle or secret. And Bungie would post on Twitter saying there was no secret of any kind, and that this was just a fun little easter egg. But players weren't buying it, and continued to search for secrets for a few days, before finally just giving up. Now this was a letdown to a large number of players who have always loved the secret quests and missions from the past. And the event would turn out to be what players felt was like a slap in the face, and did not find it amusing. And to fuel the flames even further, a Bungie engineer would post on Reddit that Destiny 2 is not built in a way that supports building secret missions, even the ones in the past. Which, okay, fair enough, but even with that being the case, Bungie did make secret missions in the past for Destiny 2, so this just made fans even more confused and frustrated. Long story short, the Telesto event did more harm than it did good in the eyes of many players, and I'm sure it'll be the last time we see Bungie do something similar to this. And the final send-off to Plunder would be a community event where we as a community would need to upgrade the Elixni Quarters. And how would we do that? By collecting Captain Coins, which are obtained from Catch Crash, Expedition, Public Events, and pretty much everything else in the game. So essentially the event was, go play the game. This event would last about two weeks and the reward for collecting 400 million coins was simply underwhelming. Not just because of the cosmetic rewards, but the Elixni Quarters themselves barely saw any renovations worthy of 400 million coins. So the event was mostly memed on by the community and would be deemed another letdown. Now Season of the Plunder had some good ideas, with a few bright spots with things like the King's Fall Return, Arc 3.0 and the build potential that it brought, but again, it felt like a filler season in pretty much every way. From story, to gameplay, to loot, most of it just wasn't too memorable. And by the end of the season, Destiny 2 would have its lowest ever player count recorded on Steam, and burnout on the seasonal model would reach an all-time high amongst players. Could the next season bring them back? It's time. While Bungie would continue the trend of not announcing the next season prior to its launch day, which most players were getting a bit tired of. The player base wanted to get hyped, they want to get excited, so this trend really just continued to frustrate players, and requested that it not continue in the Lightfall seasons. But Season of the Plunder came to an end on December 6th, and so began Season of the Seraph. And first up is the story. Season of the Seraph would make a return to the Bray family Rasputin storyline after over a year that it's been absent. Anna Bray wants to remove Rasputin from the engram he's been trapped in, and install him inside an exo body, but can't figure out how to do it. So she reluctantly needs to ask for help from Clovis Bray. Hive and Fallen have been attacking old Rasputin bunkers, mainly just the Hive, who are going after the bunkers under the order of Zivu Arath, who is looking for some heavy firepower in the form of Rasputin satellites. Certainly a lot more in line with the overarching plot than Season of the Plunder, but not by much, as it still does feel sort of like a random deviation, like a random temporary threat. But most seasons really do follow that idea, so this isn't entirely a unique problem with Seraph. As for the story missions from a gameplay perspective, they are much more substantive than the ones in Plunder, or even Haunted, so that was good. Seasonal content this time is a three-player battleground style activity, known as Heiss, and these involve ridding the Hive and Scorn from Rasputin bunkers. A fairly straightforward activity that plays almost like a strike, and it added some unique mechanics like the Seraph Tower line of sight. But unfortunately we likely won't see this mechanic expanded to any other area of the game. The heists can be fun, and a bit more challenging than previous seasonal activities, but can also become quickly repetitive due to the missions themselves not deviating much from one another. Even though the location changes, the bunkers are essentially the exact same, especially when it comes to the final boss encounter. Now in these heist missions, Bungie added a modifier to the playlist that keeps enemies 5 power levels above you at any given time, which is what lends to the increase in challenge, which also makes the difficulty feel just about right for seasonal content. It shouldn't be super challenging like endgame content, but really shouldn't be as easy as they have been in the past, so this modifier is a near perfect middle ground. No exotic armor was added in Seraph, however three exotic weapons instead of the usual two would be added with the first one being the Manticore, the Season Pass exotic. A bit of a unique weapon that's more gimmicky than anything else, 
allowing you to build up energy that makes you hover in place while shooting. Hierarchy of Needs, an exotic bow that is a rare drop from the Spire of Watcher dungeon, and is a pretty decent addition to the list of exotic bows. And lastly, Revision Zero, which has its own exotic quest mission. Now this mission is much more puzzle-oriented than the combat-focused ones of the past, which makes it a bit more unique as far as these exotic missions are concerned. And essentially this mission is a mini Deepstone Crypt raid run where you utilize almost all the mechanics found in that raid throughout. Even the final boss is essentially just Tannix Phase 1. The feedback surrounding this mission is pretty split between those that loved it and those that found it to be one of the weaker ones. But one thing is for certain, it's worth running the mission to get the Revision Zero Pulse Rifle, as it's a very unique and powerful exotic. Velus X is the seasonal ritual weapon, which like previous seasons, wound up being fairly mid. However, under the right circumstances, does have some decent utility. The new dungeon Spire of the Watcher released a few days after the season did, and like Duality was exclusive to Deluxe Edition owners, or owners of the $20 dungeon key. Also like Duality, Spire of the Watcher was received to mixed reviews, again about 50-50 love or hate it. Spire is much shorter than Duality, and other dungeons of the past, and has much simpler mechanics. The first half of the dungeon is essentially just a game of shoot some power cores to reroute power, paired with the occasional platforming. And then the first boss is essentially just a reskin of the Consecrated Mind from the Garden of Salvation raid, which made it very underwhelming mechanically and fairly easy. After a bit more platforming, you're at the final boss, which thankfully is the dungeon's highlight, and utilizes the mechanics you learned from the previous encounters to the fullest, although it still is a very simple fight. But if you're looking for a quick and easy dungeon run, this is good for that, but most of the community felt it was just alright. As for the loot from the dungeon, some decent options for weapons like the Scout Rifle which is basically a legendary version of Dead Man's Tail, and of course the armor which is very cowboy outlaw themed, which is completely subjective to your own tastes, but something I actually quite like. And of course, the exotic bow Hierarchy of Needs, which is highly sought after. The Dawning would make its annual return with a few changes and some new loot to chase, but like Festival of the Lost, the event still mainly comes around for the sake of cosmetic sales and Eververse, and to sell you the new event card. But beyond that, the Dawning really just exists as a bright dust farm. Iron Banner returned this season with yet again a new game mode called Fortress, which works a bit like Control, with the occasional Cabal turrets dropping in during a match, which can kind of be used as a catch-up mechanic for the other team. This mode really highlights the strength of Bubble Titans, and was an interesting attempt at marrying PvP and PvE outside of Gambit. But like most of the content this season, the community's opinions are split between those that really enjoy the mode, and those that don't. But probably the biggest highlight was the return of the fan favorite Taken King armor sets from Destiny 1, which prompted many players to engage with Iron Banner for the sake of obtaining those armor sets. Competitive PvP received a bit of an overhaul at the beginning of Seraph, finally getting a more proper ranked ladder system akin to many other PvP games, but there was a bit of a controversy about how Bungie implemented this system, and it's still hotly debated about whether it was positive, or negative, or a bit of a mix of both, though I don't think it received the amount of praise Bungie was hoping for. Now Season of the Seraph is coming to a close very soon, just a couple weeks out from ending, and besides one more supposed finale event, we've pretty much seen all the content it has on offer. And initially the season was greeted with players noting the burnout of the seasonal content model, However, as time has progressed throughout the season, opinions have shifted to be a bit more positive overall. And with some recent sandbox tuning and gameplay changes being received positively like the fix to inner accuracy, the community is feeling good about heading into Lightfall. However, there are still concerns, especially in relation to the core game content and how seasons will be handled in Lightfall. The Witch Queen seasons were certainly a mixed bag, and while the content wasn't terrible itself, the burnout on the seasonal content model really did reach its peak this year. So the question is, will Lightfall live up to the hype? Will it address some of the major pain points the player base felt over the course of this year? Only time will tell.